Book Three, The Machine in the Ghost. Minds, an introduction by Rob Bensinger. You're a mind, and that puts you in a pretty strange predicament. Very few things get to be minds. You're that odd bit of stuff in the universe that can form predictions and make plans, weigh and revise beliefs, suffer, dream, notice ladybugs, or feel a sudden craving for mango. You can even form, inside your mind, a picture of your whole mind. You can reason about your own reasoning process and work to bring its operations more in line with your goals. You are a mind implemented on a human brain, and it turns out that a human brain, for all its marvelous flexibility, is a lawful thing, a thing of pattern and routine. Your mind can follow a routine for a lifetime without ever once noticing that it is doing so. And these routines can have great consequences. When a mental pattern serves you well, we call that rationality. You exist as you are, hardwired to exhibit certain species of rationality and certain species of irrationality because of your ancestry. You, and all life on Earth, are descended from ancient self-replicating molecules. This replication process was initially clumsy and haphazard, and soon yielded replicable differences between the replicators. Evolution is our name for the change in these differences over time. Now, since some of these reproducible differences impact reproducibility itself, a phenomenon we call selection, evolution has resulted in organisms suited to reproduction in environments like the ones their ancestors had. Everything about you is built on the echoes of your ancestors' struggles and victories. And so here you are, a mind carved from weaker minds, seeking to understand your own inner workings, a thing to be improved upon. And that's improved upon relative to your goals, not those of your designer, evolution. What useful policies and insights can we take away from knowing that this is our basic situation? Ghosts and Machines Our brains, in their small-scale structure and dynamics, look like many other mechanical systems. Yet we rarely think of our minds in the same terms we think of objects in our environments or organs in our bodies. Our basic mental categories, belief, decision, word, idea, feeling, and so on, bear little resemblance to our physical categories. Past philosophers have taken this observation and run with it, arguing that minds and brains are fundamentally distinct and separate phenomena. This is the view the philosopher Gilbert Ryle called the dogma of the ghost in the machine. But modern scientists and philosophers who have rejected dualism haven't necessarily replaced it with a better predictive model of how the mind works. Practically speaking, our purposes and desires still function like free-floating ghosts, like a magisterium cut off from the rest of our scientific knowledge. We can talk about rationality and bias and how to change our minds, but if those ideas are still imprecise and unconstrained by any overarching theory, our scientific-sounding language won't protect us from making the same kinds of mistakes as those whose theoretical posits include spirits and essences. Interestingly, the mystery and mystification surrounding minds doesn't just obscure our view of humans. It also accrues to systems that seem mind-like or purposeful in evolutionary biology and artificial intelligence. Perhaps, if we cannot readily glean what we are from looking at ourselves, we can learn more by using an obviously inhuman process as a mirror. There are many ghosts to learn from here, ghosts past and present and yet to come. And these illusions are real cognitive events, real phenomena that we can study and explain. If there appears to be a ghost in the machine, that appearance is itself the hidden work of some machine. The first sequence of The Machine and the Ghost, called The Simple Math of Evolution, aims to communicate the dissonance and divergence between our hereditary history, our present-day biology, and our ultimate aspirations. This will require digging deeper than is common in introductions to evolution for non-biologists, which often restrict their attention to surface-level features of natural selection. The third sequence, A Human's Guide to Words, discusses the basic relationship between cognition and concept formation. This is followed by a longer essay introducing Bayesian inference. And bridging the gap between these two topics, fragile purposes, abstracts from human cognition and evolution, to the idea of minds and goal-directed systems at their most general. These essays serve the secondary purpose of explaining the author's general approach to philosophy, and the science of rationality, which is strongly informed by his work in AI. Rebuilding Intelligence Yudkowsky is a decision theorist and mathematician who works on foundational issues in artificial general intelligence, the theoretical study of domain general problem-solving systems. Yudkowsky's work in AI has been a major driving force behind his exploration of the psychology of human rationality, as he noted in his very first blog post on overcoming bias called The Martial Art of Rationality. Quote, such understanding as I have of rationality, 
I acquired in the course of wrestling with the challenge of artificial general intelligence, an endeavor which, to actually succeed, would require sufficient mastery of rationality to build a complete working rationalist out of toothpicks and rubber bands. In most ways, the AI problem is enormously more demanding than the personal art of rationality, but in some ways it is actually easier. In the martial art of mind, we need to acquire the real-time procedural skill of pulling the right levers at the right time on a large pre-existing thinking machine whose innards are not end-user modifiable. Some of the machinery is optimized for evolutionary selection pressures that run directly counter to our declared goals in using it. Deliberately, we decide that we want to seek only the truth, but our brains have hardwired support for rationalizing falsehoods. Trying to synthesize the personal art of rationality using the science of rationality may prove awkward. One imagines trying to invent a martial art using an abstract theory of physics, game theory, and human anatomy. But humans are not reflectively blind. We do have a native instinct for introspection. The inner eye is not sightless, but it sees blurrily with systemic distortions. We need, then, to apply the science to our intuitions, to use the abstract knowledge to correct our mental movements and augment our metacognitive skills. We are not writing a computer program to make a string puppet execute martial arts forms. It is our own mental limbs that we must move. Therefore, we must connect theory to practice. We must come to see what the science means for ourselves, for our daily inner life. From Yudkowsky's perspective, I gather, talking about human rationality without saying something interesting about AI is about as difficult as talking about AI without saying anything interesting about rationality. In the long run, Yudkowsky predicts that AI will come to surpass humans in an intelligence explosion, a scenario in which self-modifying AI improves its own ability to productively redesign itself, kicking off a rapid succession of further self-improvements. The term technological singularity is sometimes used in place of intelligence explosion, and until January 2013, Miri was named the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence and hosted an annual Singularity Summit. Since then, Yudkowsky has come to favor I.J. Goode's older term, intelligence explosion, to help distinguish his views from other futurist predictions, such as Ray Kurzweil's exponential technological progress thesis. Technologies like smarter than human AI seem likely to result in large societal upheavals for the better or for the worse. Yudkowsky coined the term friendly AI theory to refer to research into techniques for aligning an AGI's preferences with the preferences of humans. At this point, very little is known about when generally intelligent software might be invented or what safety approaches would work well in such cases. Present-day autonomous AI can already be quite challenging to verify and validate with much confidence, and many current techniques are not likely to generalize to more intelligent and adaptive systems. Friendly AI is therefore closer to a menagerie of basic mathematical and philosophical questions than to a well-specified set of programming objectives. As of 2015, Yudkowsky's views on the future of AI continue to be debated by technology forecasters and AI researchers in industry and academia, who have yet to converge on a consensus position. Nick Bostrom's book, Superintelligence, provides a big-picture summary of the many moral and strategic questions raised by smarter-than-human AI. For a general introduction to the field of AI, the most widely used textbook is Russell and Norvig's Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach. In a chapter discussing the moral and philosophical questions raised by AI, Russell and Norvig note the technical difficulty of specifying good behavior in a strongly adaptive AI. Quote, Yudkowsky asserts that friendliness, a desire not to harm humans, should be designed in from the start, but that the designers should recognize both that their own designs may be flawed and that the robot will learn and evolve over time. Thus the challenge is one of mechanism design. To define a mechanism for evolving AI systems under a system of checks and balances, and to give the systems utility functions that will remain friendly in the face of such changes. We can't just give a program a static utility function because circumstances and our desired responses to circumstances change over time. Disturbed by the possibility that future progress in AI, nanotechnology, biotechnology, or other fields could endanger human civilization, Bostrom and Sirkovic compiled the first academic anthology on the topic, Global Catastrophic Risks. The most extreme of these are the existential risks, risks that could result in the permanent stagnation or extinction of humanity. People, experts included, tend to be extraordinarily bad at forecasting major future events, new technologies included. Part of Yudkowsky's goal in discussing rationality is to figure out which biases are interfering with our ability to predict and prepare for big upheavals well in advance. Yudkowsky's contributions to the Global Catastrophic Risks volume, Cognitive Biases Potentially Affecting Judgment of Global Risks, and Artificial Intelligence as a Positive and Negative Factor in Global Risk, tie together his research in cognitive science and AI. Yudkowsky and Bostrom summarize near-term concerns along with long-term ones in a chapter of the Cambridge Handbook of Artificial Intelligence, The Ethics of Artificial Intelligence. 
Though this is a book about human rationality, the topic of AI has relevance as a source of simple illustrations of aspects of human cognition. Long-term technology forecasting is also one of the more important applications of Bayesian rationality, which can model correct reasoning even in domains where the data is scarce or equivocal. Knowing the design can tell you much about the designer, and knowing the designer can tell you much about the design. We'll begin, then, by inquiring into what our own designer can teach us about ourselves. Interlude. The Power of Intelligence. In our skulls, we carry around three pounds of slimy, wet, grayish tissue, corrugated like crumpled toilet paper. You wouldn't think, to look at the unappetizing lump, that it was some of the most powerful stuff in the known universe. If you'd never seen an anatomy textbook and you saw a brain lying in the street, you'd say, yuck, and try not to get any of it on your shoes. Aristotle thought the brain was an organ that cooled the blood. It doesn't look dangerous. Five million years ago, the ancestors of lions ruled the day. The ancestors of wolves roamed the night. The ruling predators were armed with teeth and claws, sharp, hard-cutting edges, backed up by powerful muscles. Their prey, in self-defense, evolved armored shells, sharp horns, toxic venoms, camouflage. The war had gone on through hundreds of eons and countless arms races. Many a loser had been removed from the game, but there was no sign of a winner. Where one species had shells, another species would evolve to crack them. Where one species became poisonous, another would evolve to tolerate the poison. Each species had its private niche. For who could live in the seas and the skies and the land at once? There was no ultimate weapon and no ultimate defense and no reason to believe any such thing was possible. Then came the day of the squishy things. They had no armor. They had no claws. They had no venoms. If you saw a movie of a nuclear explosion going off and you were told an earthly life form had done it, you would never in your wildest dreams imagine that the squishy things could be responsible. After all, squishy things aren't radioactive. In the beginning, the squishy things had no fighter jets, no machine guns, no rifles, no swords, no bronze, no iron, no hammers, no anvils, no tongs, no smithies, no mines. All the squishy things had were squishy fingers. Too weak to break a tree, let alone a mountain. Clearly not dangerous. To cut stone, you would need steel, and the squishy things couldn't excrete steel. In the environment, there were no steel blades for squishy fingers to pick up. Their bodies could not generate temperatures anywhere near hot enough to melt metal. The whole scenario was obviously absurd. And as for the squishy things manipulating DNA, that would have been beyond ridiculous. Squishy fingers are not that small. There's no access to DNA from the squishy level. It would be like trying to pick up a hydrogen atom. Oh, technically, it's all one universe. Technically, the squishy things in DNA are part of the same world, the same unified laws of physics, the same great web of causality. But let's be realistic. You can't get there from here. Even if squishy things could someday evolve to do any of those feats, it would take thousands of millennia. We have watched the ebb and flow of life through the eons, and let us tell you, a year is not even a single clock tick of evolutionary time. Oh, sure, technically, a year is 600 trillion, 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 trillion plonk intervals, but nothing ever happens in less than 600 million, trillion, 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 trillion plonk intervals, so it's a moot point. The squishy things, as they run across the savanna now, will not fly across continents for at least another 10 million years. No one could have that much sex. Now, explain to me again why an artificial intelligence can't do anything interesting over the Internet unless a human programmer builds it a robot body. I have observed that someone's flinch reaction to intelligence, the thought that crosses their mind in the first half second after they hear the word intelligence, often determines their flinch reaction to the notion of an intelligence explosion. Often they look up the keyword intelligence and retrieve the concept book smarts, a mental image of the grand master chess player who can't get a date, or a college professor who can't survive outside academia, 
It takes more than intelligence to succeed professionally, people say, as if charisma resided in the kidneys rather than the brain. Intelligence is no match for a gun, they say, as if guns had grown on trees. Where will an artificial intelligence get money, they ask as if the first homo sapiens had found dollar bills fluttering down from the sky and used them at convenience stores already in the forest. The human species was not born into a market economy. Bees won't sell you honey if you offer them an electronic funds transfer. The human species imagined money into existence, and it exists for us, not mice or wasps, because we go on believing in it. I keep trying to explain to people that the archetype of intelligence is not Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man. It is a human being, period. It is squishy things that explode in a vacuum, leaving footprints on their moon. Within that gray, wet lump is the power to search paths through the great web of causality and find a road to the seemingly impossible, the power sometimes called creativity. People venture capitalists in particular, sometimes ask how, if the Machine Intelligence Research Institute successfully builds a true AI, the results will be commercialized. This is what we call a framing problem. Or maybe it's something deeper than a simple clash of assumptions. With a bit of creative thinking, people can imagine how they would go about traveling to the moon, or curing smallpox, or manufacturing computers. To imagine a trick that could accomplish all these things at once seems downright impossible, even though such a power resides only a few centimeters behind their own eyes. The gray wet thing still seems mysterious to the gray wet thing. And so, because people can't quite see how it would all work, the power of intelligence seems less real, harder to imagine than a tower of fire sending a ship to Mars. The prospect of visiting Mars captures the imagination, but if one should promise a Mars visit, and also a grand unified theory of physics, and a proof of the Ryman hypothesis, and a cure for obesity, and a cure for cancer, and a cure for aging, and a cure for stupidity. Well, it just sounds wrong, that's all. And well, it should. It's a serious failure of imagination to think that intelligence is good for so little. Who could have imagined ever so long ago what minds would someday do? We may not even know what our real problems are. But meanwhile, because it's hard to see how one process could have such diverse powers, it's hard to imagine that one fell swoop could solve even such prosaic problems as obesity and cancer and aging. Well, one trick cured smallpox and built airplanes and cultivated wheat and tamed fire. Our current science may not agree yet on how exactly the trick works, but it works anyway. If you are temporarily ignorant about a phenomenon, that is a fact about your current state of mind, not a fact about the phenomenon. A blank map does not correspond to a blank territory. If one does not quite understand that power which put footprints on the moon, nonetheless, the footprints are still there. Real footprints on a real moon, put there by a real power. If one were to understand deeply enough one could create and shape that power. Intelligence is as real as electricity. It's merely far more powerful, far more dangerous, has far deeper implications for the unfolding story of life in the universe, and it's a tiny little bit harder to figure out how to build a generator. Part L. The Simple Math of Evolution An Alien God A curious aspect of the theory of evolution, said Jacques Monod, is that everybody thinks he understands it. A human being looking at the natural world sees a thousand times purpose. A rabbit's legs built and articulated for running. A fox's jaws built and articulated for tearing. But what you see is not exactly what is there. In the days before Darwin, The cause of all this apparent purposefulness was a very great puzzle unto science. The goddesses said, God did it, because you get 50 bonus points each time you use the word God in a sentence. Yet, perhaps I'm being unfair. 
in the days before Darwin, it seemed like a much more reasonable hypothesis. Find a watch in the desert, said William Paley, and you can infer the existence of a watchmaker. But when you look at all the apparent purposefulness in nature, rather than picking and choosing your examples, you start to notice things that don't fit the Judeo-Christian concept of one benevolent God. Foxes seem well-designed to catch rabbits. Rabbits seem well-designed to evade foxes. Was the creator having trouble making up its mind? When I design a toaster oven, I don't design one part of it that tries to get electricity to the coils and a second part that tries to prevent electricity from getting to the coils. It would be a waste of effort. Who designed the ecosystem with its predators and prey, viruses and bacteria? Even the cactus plant, which you might think well-designed to provide water and fruit to desert animals, is covered with inconvenient spines. The ecosystem would make much more sense if it wasn't designed by a unitary who, but rather created by a horde of deities, say from the Hindu or Shinto religions. This handily explains both the ubiquitous purposefulness and the ubiquitous conflicts. More than one deity acted, often at cross-purposes. The fox and rabbit were both designed, but by distinct competing deities. I wonder if anyone ever remarked on the seemingly excellent evidence thus provided for Hinduism over Christianity. Probably not. Similarly, the Judeo-Christian God is alleged to be benevolent. Well, sort of. And yet, much of nature's purposefulness seems downright cruel. Darwin suspected a non-standard creator for studying ichneumon wasps, whose paralyzing stings preserve its prey to be eaten alive by its larva. I cannot persuade myself, wrote Darwin, that a beneficent and omnipotent god would have designedly created the ichneumonidae with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars, or that a cat should play with mice. I wonder if any earlier thinker remarked on the excellent evidence thus provided for Manichaean religions over monotheistic ones. By now we all know the punchline. You just say, evolution. I worry that's how some people are absorbing the scientific explanation as a magical purposefulness factory in nature. I've previously discussed the case of Storm from the movie X-Men, who in one mutation gets the ability to throw lightning bolts. Why? Well, there's this thing called evolution that somehow pumps a lot of purposefulness into nature, and the changes happen through mutations. So if Storm gets a really large mutation, she can be redesigned to throw lightning bolts. Radioactivity is a popular super-origin. Radiation causes mutations. So more powerful radiation causes more powerful mutations. That's logic. But evolution doesn't allow just any kind of purposefulness to leak into nature. That's what makes evolution a success as an empirical hypothesis. If evolutionary biology would explain a toaster oven, not just a tree, it would be worthless. There's a lot more to evolutionary theory than pointing at nature and saying, now purpose is allowed, or evolution did it. The strength of a theory is not what it allows, but what it prohibits. If you can invent an equally persuasive explanation for any outcome, you have zero knowledge. Many non-biologists, observed George Williams, think that it is for their benefit that rattles grow on rattlesnake tails. Bzzzt. This kind of purposefulness is not allowed. Evolution doesn't work by letting flashes of purposefulness creep in at random, reshaping one species for the benefit of a random recipient. Evolution is powered by a systematic correlation between the different ways that different genes construct organisms and how many copies of those genes make it into the next generation. For rattles to grow on rattlesnake tails, rattle-growing genes must become more and more frequent in each successive generation. Actually, genes for incrementally more complex rattles. But if I start describing all the Phillips and caveats to evolutionary biology, we really will be here all day. There isn't an evolution fairy that looks over the current state of nature, 
decides what would be a good idea and chooses to increase the frequency of rattle constructing genes. I suspect this is where a lot of people get stuck in evolutionary biology. They understand that helpful genes become more common, but helpful lets any sort of purpose leak in. They don't think there's an evolutionary fairy, yet they ask which genes will be helpful, as if a rattlesnake gene could help non-rattlesnakes. The key realization is that there is no evolution fairy. There's no outside force deciding which genes ought to be promoted. Whatever happens, happens because of the genes themselves. Genes for constructing, incrementally better, rattles must have somehow ended up more frequent in the rattlesnake gene pool because of the rattle. In this case, it's probably because rattlesnakes with better rattles survive more often, rather than mating more successfully or having brothers that reproduce more successfully, etc. Maybe predators are wary of rattles and don't step on the snake, or maybe the rattle diverts attention from the snake's head. As George Williams suggests, the outcome of a fight between a dog and a viper would depend very much on whether the dog initially seized the reptile by the head or by the tail. But that's just a snake's rattle. There are much more complicated ways that a gene can cause copies of itself to become more frequent in the next generation. Your brother or sister shares half your genes a gene that sacrifices one unit of resources to bestow three units of resource on a brother may promote some copies of itself by sacrificing one of its constructed organisms. If you really want to know all the details and caveats, buy a book on evolutionary biology. There is no royal road. The main point is that genes affect must cause copies of that gene to become more frequent in the next generation. There's no evolution fairy that reaches in from the outside. There's nothing which decides that some genes are helpful and should, therefore, increase in frequency. It's just cause and effect, starting from the genes themselves. This explains the strange, conflicting purposefulness of nature and its frequent cruelty. It explains even better than a horde of Shinto deities. Why is so much of nature at war with other parts of nature? Because there isn't one evolution directing the whole process. There's as many different evolutions as reproducing populations. Rabbit genes are becoming more or less frequent in rabbit populations. Fox genes are becoming more or less frequent in fox populations. Fox genes, which construct foxes that catch rabbits, insert more copies of themselves in the next generation. Rabbit genes, which construct rabbits that evade foxes, are naturally more common in the next generation of rabbits. Hence the phrase, natural selection. Why is nature cruel? You, a human, can look at an human wasp and decide that it's cruel to eat your prey alive. You can decide that if you're going to eat your prey alive, you can at least have the decency to stop it from hurting. It would scarcely cost the wasp anything to anesthetize its prey as well as paralyze it, or what about old elephants who die of starvation when their last set of teeth fall out? These elephants aren't going to reproduce anyway. What would it cost evolution, the evolution of elephants rather, to ensure that the elephant dies right away instead of slowly and in agony? What would it cost evolution to anesthetize the elephant or give it pleasant dreams before it dies? Nothing. That elephant won't reproduce more or less either way. If you were talking to a fellow human trying to resolve a conflict of interest, you would be in a good negotiating position, would have an easy job of persuasion. It would cost so little to anesthetize the prey, to let the elephant die without agony. Oh, please, won't you do it? Kindly? Um, well, there's no one to argue with. Human beings fake their justifications, figure out what they want using one method, and then justify it using another method. There's no evolution of elephants fairy that's trying to A, figure out what's best for elephants, and then B, figure out how to justify it to the evolutionary overseer who C, doesn't want to see reproductive fitness decreased, but is D, willing to go along with the painless death idea so long as it doesn't actually harm any genes. 
there's no advocate for the elephants anywhere in the system. Humans, who are often deeply concerned for the well-being of animals, can be very persuasive in arguing how various kindnesses wouldn't harm reproductive fitness at all. Sadly, the evolution of elephants doesn't use a similar algorithm. It doesn't select nice genes that can plausibly be argued to help reproductive fitness. Simply, genes that replicate more often become more frequent in the next generation, like water flowing downhill and equally benevolent. A human looking over nature starts thinking of all the ways we would design organisms, and then we tend to start rationalizing reasons why our design improvements would increase reproductive fitness, a political instinct, trying to sell your own preferred option as matching the boss's favored justification. And so, amateur evolutionary biologists end up making all sorts of wonderful and completely mistaken predictions, because the amateur biologists are drawing their bottom line, and more importantly, locating their prediction in hypothesis space, using a different algorithm than evolutions use to draw their bottom lines. A human engineer would have designed human taste buds to measure how much of each nutrient we had, and how much we needed. When fat was scarce, almonds or cheeseburgers would taste delicious. But if you started to become obese, or if vitamins were lacking, lettuce would taste delicious. But there is no evolution of humans' fairy, which intelligently planned ahead and designed a general system for every contingency. It was a reliable invariant of humans' ancestral environment. The calories were scarce, so genes whose organisms loved calories became more frequent like water flowing downhill. We are simply the embodied history of which organisms did in fact survive and reproduce, not which organisms ought prudentially to have survived and reproduced. The human retina is constructed backward, the light-sensitive cells are at the back, and the nerves emerge from the front and go back through the retina into the brain, hence the blind spot. To a human engineer, this looks simply stupid, and other organisms have independently evolved retinas the right way around. Why not redesign the retina? The problem is that no single mutation will reroute the whole retina simultaneously. A human engineer can redesign multiple parts simultaneously, or plan ahead for future changes. If a single mutation breaks some vital part of the organism, it doesn't matter what wonderful things a fairy could build on top of it, the organism dies and the gene decreases in frequency. If you turn around the retina's cells without also reprogramming the nerves and optic cable, the system as a whole won't work. It doesn't matter that, to a fairy or a human engineer, this is one step forward in redesigning the retina. The organism is blind. Evolution has no foresight. It is simply the frozen history of which organisms did in fact reproduce. Evolution is as blind as a halfway redesigned retina. Find a watch in a desert, said William Paley, and you can infer the watchmaker. There were once those who denied this, who thought that life just happened. Without need of an optimization process, mice being spontaneously generated from straw and dirty shirts. If we ask who was more correct, the theologians who argued for a creator god or the intellectually unfulfilled atheists who argued that mice spontaneously generated, then the theologians must be declared the victors. Evolution is not God, but it is closer to God than it is to pure random entropy. Mutation is random, but selection is non-random. This doesn't mean an intelligent fairy is reaching in and selecting. It means there's a non-zero statistical correlation between the gene and how often the organism reproduces. Over a few million years, that non-zero statistical correlation adds up to something very powerful. It's not a god, but it's more closely akin to a god than it is to snow on a television screen. In a lot of ways, evolution is like unto theology. Gods are ontologically distinct from creatures, said Damien Broderick, or they're not worth the paper they're written on. And indeed, the shaper of life is not itself a creature. Evolution is bodiless, like the Judeo-Christian deity, omnipresent in nature, 
imminent in the fall of every leaf, vast as a planet's surface, billions of years old, itself unmade, arising naturally from the structure of physics. Doesn't that all sound like something that might have been said about God? And yet, the Maker has no mind as well as no body. In some ways, its handiwork is incredibly poor design by human standards. It is internally divided. Most of all, it isn't nice. In a way, Darwin discovered God, a God that failed to match the preconceptions of theology and so passed unheralded. If Darwin had discovered that life was created by an intelligent agent, a bodiless mind that loves us and will smite us with lightning if we dare say otherwise, people would have said, my gosh, that's God. But instead, Darwin discovered a strange alien God, not comfortably ineffable, but really genuinely different from us. Evolution is not a God, but if it were, it wouldn't be Jehovah. It would be H.P. Lovecraft's Azatoth, the blind idiot God burbling chaotically at the center of everything, surrounded by the thin, monotonous piping of flutes, which you might have predicted if you had really looked at nature. So much for the claim some religionists make, that they believe in a vague deity with a correspondingly high probability. Anyone who really believed in a vague deity would have recognized their strange inhuman creator when Darwin said, Aha! So much for the claim some religionists make, that they are waiting innocently curious for science to discover God. Science has already discovered the sort of godlike maker of humans, but it wasn't what the religionists wanted to hear. They were waiting for the discovery of their God, the highly specific God they want to be there. They shall wait forever, for the great discovery has already taken place, and the winner is Azatoth. Well, more power to us humans. I like having a creator I can outwit. Beats having a pet. I'm glad it was Azatoth, and not Odin. The Wonder of Evolution The wonder of evolution is that it works at all. I mean that literally. If you want to marvel at evolution, that's what's marvel-worthy. How does optimization first arise in the universe? If an intelligent agent designed nature, who designed the intelligent agent? Where's the first design that has no designer? The puzzle is not how the first stage of the bootstrap can be super clever and super efficient. The puzzle is how it can happen at all. Evolution resolves the infinite regression, not by being super clever and super efficient, but by being stupid and inefficient and working anyway. This is the marvel. For professional reasons, I often have to discuss the slowness, randomness, and blindness of evolution. Afterwards, someone says, you just said that evolution can't plan simultaneous changes and that evolution is very inefficient because mutations are random. Isn't that what the creationists say? That you couldn't assemble a watch by randomly shaking the parts in a box? But the reply to creationists is not that you can assemble a watch by shaking the parts in a box. The reply is that this is not how evolution works. If you think that evolution does work by whirlwinds assembling 747s, then the creationists have successfully misrepresented biology to you. They've sold the straw man. The real answer is that complex machinery evolves either incrementally or by adapting previous complex machinery used for a new purpose. Squirrels jump from treetop to treetop using just their muscles, but the length they can jump depends, to some extent, on the aerodynamics of their bodies. So now, there are flying squirrels, so aerodynamic they can glide short distances. If birds were wiped out, the descendants of flying squirrels might reoccupy that ecological niche in 10 million years, gliding membranes transformed into wings. And the creationists would say, what good is half a wing? You just fall down and splat. How could squirrel birds possibly have evolved incrementally? That's how one complex adaptation can jumpstart a new complex adaptation. Complexity can also accrete incrementally, starting from a single mutation. First, comes some gene A, which is simple, but at least a little useful in its own. 
so that A increases to universality in the gene pool. Now along comes gene B, which is only useful in the presence of A, but A is reliably present in the gene pool, so there's a reliable selection pressure in favor of B. Now, a modified version of A arises, which depends on B, but doesn't break B's dependency on A over modified A. Then along comes C, which depends on A modified and B, and B modified, which depends on A modified and C. Soon you've got irreducibly complex machinery that breaks if you take out any single piece. And yet, you can still visualize the trail backward to that single piece. You can, without breaking the whole machine, make one piece less dependent on another piece, and do this a few times, until you can take out one whole piece without breaking the machine, and so on, until you've turned a ticking watch back into a crude sundial. Here's an example. DNA stores information very nicely in a durable format that allows for exact duplication. A ribosome turns that stored information into a sequence of amino acids, a protein, which folds up into a variety of chemically active shapes. The combined system, DNA and ribosome, can build all sorts of protein machinery, but what good is DNA without a ribosome that turns DNA information into proteins? What good is a ribosome without DNA to tell it which proteins to make? Organisms don't always leave fossils, and evolutionary biology can't always figure out the incremental pathway. But in this case, we do know how it happened. RNA shares with DNA the property of being able to carry information and replicate itself, although RNA is less durable and copies less accurately. And RNA also shares the ability of proteins to fold up into chemically active shapes, though it's not as versatile as the amino acid chains of proteins. Almost certainly, RNA is the single A, which predates the mutually dependent A modified and B. It's just as important to note that RNA does the combined job of DNA and proteins poorly, as that it does the combined job at all. It's amazing enough that a single molecule can both store information and manipulate chemistry. For it to do the job well would be a wholly unnecessary miracle. What was the very first replicator ever to exist? It may well have been an RNA strand, because, by some strange coincidence, the chemical ingredients of RNA are chemicals that would have arisen naturally on the prebiotic Earth of 4 billion years ago. Please note, evolution does not explain the origin of life. Evolutionary biology is not supposed to explain the first replicator, because the first replicator does not come from another replicator. Evolution describes statistical trends in replication. The first replicator wasn't a statistical trend. It was a pure accident. The notion that evolution should explain the origin of life is a pure straw man more creationist misrepresentation. If you'd been watching the primordial soup on the day of the first replicator, the day that reshaped the earth, you would not have been impressed by how well the first replicator replicated. The first replicator probably copied itself like a drunken monkey on LSD. It would have exhibited none of the signs of careful fine-tuning embodied in modern replicators because the first replicator was an accident. It was not needful for that single strand of RNA, or chemical hypercycle, or pattern in clay to replicate gracefully. It just had to happen at all. Even so, it was probably very improbable, considered in an isolated event. But it only had to happen once, and there were a lot of tide pools. A few billions of years later, the replicators are walking on the moon. The first accidental replicator was the most important molecule in the history of time. But if you praised it too highly, attributing to it all sorts of wonderful replication-aiding capabilities, you would be missing the whole point. Don't think that in the political battle between evolutionists and creationists, whoever praises evolution must be on the side of science. Science has a very exact idea of the capabilities of evolution, if you praise evolution one millimeter higher than this, you're not fighting on evolution's side, 
against creationism. You're being scientifically inaccurate, full stop. You're falling into a creationist trap by insisting that, yes, a whirlwind does have the power to assemble a 747. Isn't that amazing? How wonderfully intelligent is evolution? How praiseworthy? Look at me, I'm pledging my allegiance to science. The more nice things I say about evolution, the more I must be on evolution's side against the creationists. But to praise evolution too highly destroys the real wonder, which is not how well evolution designs things, but that a naturally occurring process manages to design anything at all. So let us dispose of the idea that evolution is a wonderful designer or a wonderful conductor of species destinies, which we human beings ought to imitate. For human intelligence to imitate evolution as a designer would be like a sophisticated modern bacterium trying to imitate the first replicator as a biochemist. As T.H. Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, put it, Let us understand, once and for all, that the ethical progress of society depends not on imitating the cosmic process, still less in running away from it, but in combating it. Huxley didn't say that because he disbelieved in evolution, but because he understood it all too well. Evolutions are stupid, but work anyway. In the previous essay, I wrote, Science has a very exact idea of the capabilities of evolution. If you praise evolution one millimeter higher than it is, you're not fighting on evolution's side against creationism. You're being scientifically inaccurate, full stop. In this essay, I describe some well-known inefficiencies and limitations of evolutions. I say evolutions, plural, because fox evolution works at cross-purposes to rabbit evolution, and neither can talk to snake evolution to learn how to build venomous fangs. So I am talking about limitations of evolution here, but this does not mean I am trying to sneak in creationism. This is Standard Evolutionary Biology 201. 583 if you must derive the equations. Evolutions, thus limited, can still explain observed biology. In fact, the limitations are necessary to make sense of it. Remember that the wonder of evolutions is not how well they work, but that they work at all. Human intelligence is so complicated that no one has any good way to calculate how efficient it is. Natural selection, though not simple, is simpler than a human brain, and correspondingly slower and less efficient, as befits the first optimization process ever to exist. In fact, evolutions are simple enough that we can calculate exactly how stupid they are. Evolutions are slow. How slow? Suppose there's a beneficial mutation that conveys a fitness advantage of 3%. On average, bearers of this gene have 1.03 times as many children as non-bearers. Assuming that the mutation spreads at all, how long will it take to spread through the whole population? That depends on the population size. A gene conveying a 3% fitness advantage spreading through a population of 100,000 would require an average of 768 generations to reach universality in the gene pool. A population of 500,000 would require 875 generations. The general formula is generations to fixations equals 2 times the natural log of n divided by s, where n is the population size and 1 plus s is the fitness. If each bearer of the gene has 1.03 times as many children as a non-bearer, s equals 0.03. Thus, if the population size were 1 million, the estimated population in hunter-gatherer times, then it would require 2,763 generations for a gene conveying a 1% advantage to spread through the gene pool. This should not be surprising. Genes have to do all their own work of spreading. There's no evolution fairy who can watch the gene pool and say, Hmm, that gene seems to be spreading rapidly. I should distribute it to everyone. 
In a human market economy, someone who is legitimately getting 20% returns on investment, especially if there's an obvious, clear mechanism behind it, can rapidly acquire more capital from other investors, and others will start duplicate enterprises. Genes have to spread without stock markets or banks or imitators, as if Henry Ford had to make one car, sell it, buy the parts for 1.01 more cars, on average, sell those cars and keep doing this until he was up to a million cars. All this assumes that the gene spreads in the first place. Here the equation is simpler and ends up not depending at all on population size. Probability of fixation equals 2 times s. A mutation conveying a 3% advantage, which is pretty darn large as mutations go, has a 6% chance of spreading, at least on that occasion. Mutations can happen more than once, but in a population of a million with a copying fidelity of 10 to the 8th power, errors per base per generation, you may have to wait a hundred generations for another chance, and then it still has only a 6% chance of fixating. Still, in the long run, an evolution has a good shot at getting there eventually. This is going to be a running theme. Complex adaptations take a very long time to evolve. First comes allele A, which is advantageous of itself and requires a thousand generations to fixate in the gene pool. Only then can another allele B, which depends on A, begin rising to fixation. A fur coat is not a strong advantage unless the environment has a statistically reliable tendency to throw cold weather at you. Well, genes form part of the environment of other genes. And if B depends on A, then B will not have a strong advantage unless A is reliably present in the genetic environment. Let's say that B confers a 5% advantage in the presence of A. No advantage otherwise. Then while A is still at 1% frequency in the population, B only confers its advantage 1 out of 100 times, so the average fitness advantage of B is 0.05% and B's probability of fixation is 0.1%. With a complex adaptation, first A has to evolve over a thousand generations, then B has to evolve over another thousand generations, then A modified evolves over another thousand generations, and several million years later, you've got a new complex adaptation. Then other evolutions don't imitate it, if snake evolution develops an amazing new venom, it doesn't help fox evolution or lion evolution. Contrast all this to a human programmer who can design a new complex mechanism with a hundred interdependent parts over the course of a single afternoon. How is this even possible? I don't know all the answer, and my guess is that neither does science. Human brains are much more complicated than evolutions. I could wave my hands and say something like, Goal-directed backward chaining used combinatorial modular representations, but you would not thereby be enabled to design your own human. Still, humans can foresightfully design new parts in anticipation of later designing other new parts, produce coordinated simultaneous changes in interdependent machinery, learn by observing single test cases, zero in on problem spots and think abstractly about how to solve them, and prioritize which tweaks are worth trying, rather than waiting for a cosmic ray strike to produce a good one. By the standards of natural selection, this is simply magic. Humans can do things that evolutions probably can't do, period, over the expected lifetime of the universe. As the eminent biologist Cynthia Kenyon once put it at a dinner I had the honor of attending, one grad student can do things in an hour that evolution could not do in a billion years. According to biologists' best current knowledge, evolutions have invented a fully rotating wheel on a grand total of three occasions. And don't forget the part where the programmer posts the code snippet to the internet. Yes, some evolutionary handiwork is impressive, even by comparison to the best technology of Homo sapiens. But our Cambrian explosion only started, we only really began accumulating knowledge around, what, 400 years ago? In some ways, biology still excels over the best human technology.
We can't build a self-replicating system the size of a butterfly. In other ways, human technology leaves biology in the dust. We got wheels, we got steel, we got guns, we got knives, we got pointy sticks, we got rockets, we got transistors, we got nuclear power plants. With every passing decade, that balance tips further. So once again, for a human to look to natural selection as inspiration on the art of design is like a sophisticated modern bacterium trying to imitate the first awkward replicator's biochemistry. The first replicator would be eaten instantly if it popped up in today's competitive ecology. The same fate would accrue to any human planner who tried making random point mutations to their strategies and waiting 768 iterations of testing to adopt a 3% improvement. Don't praise evolutions one millimeter more than they deserve. Coming up next, more exciting mathematical bounds on evolution. No evolutions for corporations or nano devices. The laws of physics and the rules of math don't cease to apply. That leads me to believe that evolution doesn't stop. That further leads me to believe that nature, bloody in tooth and claw, as some have termed it, will simply be taken to the next level. Getting rid of Darwinian evolution is like trying to get rid of gravitation so long as there are limited resources and multiple competing actors capable of passing on characteristics, you have selection pressure. Perry Metzger, predicting that the reign of natural selection would continue into the indefinite future. In evolutionary biology, as in many other fields, it is important to think quantitatively rather than qualitatively. Does a beneficial mutation sometimes spread but not always? Well, a psychic power would be a beneficial mutation, so you would expect it to spread, right? Yet this is qualitative reasoning, not quantitative. If X is true, then Y is true. If psychic powers are beneficial, they may spread. In Evolutions Are Stupid, I described the equations for a beneficial mutation's probability of fixation, roughly twice the fitness advantage, 6% for a 3% advantage. Only this kind of numerical thinking is likely to make us realize that mutations which are only rarely useful are extremely unlikely to spread, and that it is practically impossible for complex adaptations to arise without constant use. If psychic powers really existed, we should expect to see everyone using them all the time, not just because they would be so amazingly useful, but because otherwise they couldn't have evolved in the first place. So long as there are limited resources and multiple competing actors capable of passing on characteristics, you have selection pressure. This is qualitative reasoning. How much selection pressure? While there are several candidates for the most important equation in evolutionary biology, I would pick Price's equation, which in its simplest formulation reads, change in average characteristic equals covariance, relative fitness, and characteristic. This is a very powerful and general formula. For example, a particular gene for height can be the Z, the characteristic that changes, in which case Price's equation says that the change in the probability of possessing this gene equals the covariance of the gene with reproductive fitness. Or you can consider height in general as the characteristic Z, apart from any particular genes, and Price's equation says that the change in height in the next generation will equal the covariance of height with relative reproductive fitness. At least this is true so long as height is straightforwardly heritable. If nutrition improves so that a fixed genotype becomes taller, you have to add correction term to Price's equation. If there are complex nonlinear interactions between many genes, you have to either add a correction term or calculate the equation in such a complicated way that it ceases to enlighten. Many enlightenments may be attained by studying the different forms and derivations of Price's equation. For example, the final equation says that the average characteristic changes according to its covariance with relative fitness, rather than its absolute fitness. This means that if a Frodo gene saves its whole species from extinction, the average Frodo characteristic does not increase. 
since Frodo's act benefited all genotypes equally and did not co-vary with relative fitness. It is said that Price became so disturbed with the implications of his equation for altruism that he committed suicide, though he may have had other issues. Overcoming bias does not advocate committing suicide after studying Price's equation. One of the enlightenments which may be gained by meditating upon Price's equation is that limited resources and multiple competing actors capable of passing on characteristics are not sufficient to give rise to an evolution. Things that replicate themselves is not a sufficient condition. Even competition between replicating things is not sufficient. Do corporations evolve? They certainly compete. They occasionally spin off children. Their resources are limited. They sometimes die. But how much does the child of a corporation resemble its parents? Much of the personality of a corporation derives from key officers, and CEOs cannot divide themselves by fission. Price's equation only operates to the extent that characteristics are heritable across generations. If great-great-grandchildren don't much resemble their great-great-grandparents, you won't get more than four generations' worth of cumulative selection pressure. Anything that happened more than four generations ago will blur itself out. Yes, the personality of a corporation can influence its spinoff, but that's nothing like the heritability of DNA, which is digital rather than analog, and can transmit itself with 10 to the 8th power errors per base per generation. With DNA, you have heritability lasting for millions of generations. That's how complex adaptations can arise by pure evolution. The digital DNA lasts long enough for a gene conveying 3% advantage to spread itself over 768 generations, and then another gene dependent on it can arise. Even if corporations replicated with digital fidelity, they would currently be at most 10 generations into the RNA world. Now, corporations are certainly selected in the sense that incompetent corporations go bust. This should logically make you more likely to observe corporations with features contributing to competence. And in the same sense, any star that goes nova shortly after it forms is less likely to be visible when you look up at the night sky. But if an accident of stellar dynamics makes one star burn longer than another star, that doesn't make it more likely that future stars will also burn longer. The feature will not be copied onto other stars. We should not expect future astrophysicists to discover complex internal features of stars which seem designed to help them burn longer. That kind of mechanical adaptation requires much larger cumulative selection pressures than a once-off winnowing. Think of the principle introduced in Einstein's arrogance, that the vast majority of the evidence required to think of general relativity had to go into raising that one particular equation to the level of Einstein's personal attention. The amount of evidence required to raise it from a deliberately considered possibility to 99.9% .9 certainty was trivial by comparison. In the same sense, complex features of corporations that require hundreds of bits to specify are produced primarily by human intelligence, not a handful of generations of low-fidelity evolution. In biology, the mutations are purely random, and evolution supplies thousands of bits of cumulative selection pressure. In corporations, humans offer up thousand-bit, intelligently designed, complex mutations, and then the further selection pressure of, did it go bankrupt or not, accounts for a handful of additional bits in explaining what you see. Advanced molecular nanotechnology the artificial sort, not biology, should be able to copy itself with digital fidelity through thousands of generations. Would Price's equation thereby gain a foothold? Correlation is covariance divided by variance. So if A is highly predictive of B, there can be a strong correlation between them, even if A is ranging from 0 to 9, and B is only ranging from 50.0001 and 50.0009. Price's equation runs on covariance of characteristics with reproduction, not correlation.
If you can compress variants and characteristics into a tiny band, the covariance goes way down, and so does the cumulative change in the characteristic. The Foresight Institute suggests, among other sensible proposals, that the replication instructions for any nano device should be encrypted. Moreover, encrypted such that flipping a single bit of the encoded instructions will entirely scramble the decrypted output. If all nano devices produced are precise molecular copies, and moreover, any mistakes on the assembly line are not heritable because the offspring got a digital copy of the original encrypted instructions for use in making grandchildren, then your nano devices ain't gonna be doing much evolving. You'd still have to worry about prions. Self-replicating assembly errors apart from the encrypted instructions where a robot arm fails to grab a carbon atom that is used in assembling a homolog of itself and this causes the offspring's robot arm to likewise fail to grab a carbon atom, etc., even with all the encrypted instructions remaining constant. But how much correlation is there likely to be between this sort of transmissible error and a higher reproductive rate? Let's say that one nano device produces a copy of itself every 1,000 seconds, and the new nano device is magically more efficient. It not only has a prion, it has a beneficial prion, and copies itself every 999.99999 seconds. It needs one less carbon atom attached, you see. That's not a whole lot of variance in reproduction, so it's not a whole lot of covariance either. And how often will these nano devices need to replicate? Unless they've got more atoms available than exist in the solar system, or for that matter the visible universe, only a small number of generations will pass before they hit the resource wall. Limited resources are not a sufficient condition for evolution. You need the frequently iterated death of a substantial fraction of the population to free up resources. Indeed, generations is not so much an integer as an integral over the fraction of the population that consists of newly created individuals. This is, to me, the most frightening thing about gray goo, or nanotechnological weapons, that they could eat the whole earth, and then that would be it. Nothing interesting would happen afterward. Diamond is stabler than proteins held together by van der Waals forces, so the goo would only need to reassemble some pieces of itself when an asteroid hit. Even if prions were a powerful enough idiom to support evolution at all, evolution is slow enough without digital DNA. Fewer than 1.0 generations might pass between when the goo ate the earth and when the sun died. To sum up, if you have all of the following properties, entities that replicate, substantial variation in their characteristics, substantial variation in their reproduction, persistent correlation between the characteristics and reproduction, high fidelity long-range heritability in characteristics, frequent birth of a significant fraction of the breeding population, and all this remains true through many iterations, then you will have significant cumulative selection pressures, enough to produce complex adaptations by the force of evolution. Evolving to Extinction It is a very common misconception that an evolution works for the good of its species. Can you remember hearing someone talk about two rabbits breeding eight rabbits and thereby contributing to the survival of their species? A modern evolutionary biologist would never say such a thing. They'd sooner breed with a rabbit. It's yet another case where you've got to simultaneously consider multiple abstract concepts and keep them distinct. Evolution doesn't operate on particular individuals. Individuals keep whatever genes they're born with. Evolution operates on a reproducing population, a species, over time. There's a natural tendency to think that if an evolution fairy is operating on the species, she must be optimizing for the species. But what really changes are the gene frequencies, and frequencies don't increase or decrease according to how much the gene helps the species as a whole. 
As we shall later see, it's quite possible for a species to evolve to extinction. Why are boys and girls born in roughly equal numbers? Leaving aside crazy countries that use artificial gender selection technologies, to see why this is surprising, consider that one male can impregnate two, ten, or one hundred females. It wouldn't seem that you need the same number of males as females to ensure the survival of the species. This is even more surprising in the vast majority of animal species where the male contributes very little to raising the children. Humans are extraordinary, even among primates, for their level of paternal investment. Balanced gender ratios are found even in species where the male impregnates the female and vanishes into the mist. Consider two groups on different sides of a mountain. In group A, each mother gives birth to two males and two females. In group B, each mother gives birth to three females and one male. Group A and group B will have the same number of children, but group B will have 50% more grandchildren and 125% more great-grandchildren. You might think this would be a significant evolutionary advantage, but consider... The rarer males become, the more reproductively valuable they become, not to the group, but to the individual parent. Every child has one male and one female parent. Then in every generation, the total genetic contribution from all males equals the total genetic contribution from all females. The fewer males, the greater the individual genetic contribution per male. If all the females around you are doing what's good for the group, what's good for the species, and birthing one male per ten females, you can make a genetic killing by birthing all males, each of whom will have, on average, ten times as many grandchildren as their female cousins. So while group selection ought to favor more girls, individual selection favors equal investment in male and female offspring. Looking at the statistics of a maternity ward, you can see at a glance that the quantitative balance between group selection forces and individual selection forces is overwhelmingly tilted in favor of individual selection in Homo sapiens. Technically, this isn't quite a glance. Individual selection favors equal parental investments in male and female offspring. If males cost half as much to birth and or raise, twice as many males as females will be born at the evolutionarily stable equilibrium. If the same number of males and females were born in the population at large, but males were twice as cheap to birth, then you could again make a genetic killing by birthing more males. So the maternity ward should reflect the balance of parental opportunity costs in a hunter-gatherer society between raising boys and raising girls, and you'd have to assess that somehow. But you know, it doesn't seem all that much more reproductive opportunity costly for a hunter-gatherer family to raise a girl, so it's kind of suspicious that around the same number of boys are born as girls. Natural selection isn't about groups or species or even individuals. In a sexual species, an individual organism doesn't evolve. It keeps whatever genes it's born with. An individual is a once-off collection of genes that will never reappear. How can you select on that? When you consider that nearly all of your ancestors are dead, it's clear that survival of the fittest is a tremendous misnomer. Replication of the fitter would be more accurate. Although, technically, fitness is defined only in terms of replication. Natural selection is really about gene frequencies. To get a complex adaptation, a machine with multiple dependent parts, each new gene as it evolves depends on the other genes being reliably present in its genetic environment. They must have high frequencies. The more complex the machine, the higher the frequencies must be. The signature of natural selection occurring is a gene rising from 0.00001% of the gene pool to 99% of the gene pool. This is the information in an information theoretic sense, and this is what must happen for large complex adaptations to evolve. The real struggle in natural selection is not the competition of organisms for resources. This is an ephemeral thing when all the participants will vanish in another generation. The real struggle is the competition of alleles for frequency in the gene pool. This is the lasting consequence that creates lasting information. 
The two rams bellowing and locking horns are only passing shadows. It's perfectly possible for an allele to spread to fixation by outcompeting an alternative allele, which was better for the species. If the flying spaghetti monster magically created a species whose gender mix was perfectly optimized to ensure the survival of the species, the optimal gender mix to bounce back reliably from near extinction events, adapt to new niches, etc., then the evolution would rapidly degrade this species optimum back into the individual selection optimum of equal parental investment in males and females. Imagine a Frodo gene that sacrifices its vehicle to save its entire species from an extinction event. What happens to the allele frequency as a result? It goes down. Okay, thanks, bye. If species-level extinction threats occur regularly, this is a Buffy environment, then the Frodo gene will systematically decrease in frequency and vanish. And soon thereafter, so will the species. A hypothetical example? Maybe. If the human species was going to stay biological for another century, it would be a good idea to start cloning Gandhi. In viruses, there's the tension between individual viruses replicating as fast as possible versus the benefit of leaving the host alive long enough to transmit the illness. This is a good real-world example of group selection. And if the virus evolves to a point on the fitness landscape where the group selection pressure fails to overcome individual pressures, the virus could vanish shortly thereafter. I don't know if a disease has ever been caught in the act of evolving to extinction, but it's probably happened any number of times. Segregation disorders subvert the mechanisms that usually guarantee fairness of sexual reproduction. For example, there is a segregation distorter on the male sex chromosome of some mice, which causes only male children to be born, all carrying the segregation distorter. Then these males impregnate females who give birth to only male children, and so on. You might cry, this is cheating! But that's a human perspective. The reproductive fitness of this allele is extremely high, since it produces twice as many copies of itself in the succeeding generation as its non-mutant alternative. Even as females become rarer and rarer, males carrying this gene are no less likely to mate than any other male, and so the segregation distorter remains twice as fit as its alternative allele. It's speculated that real-world group selection may have played a role in keeping the frequency of this gene as low as it seems to be, in which case, if mice were to evolve the ability to fly and migrate for the winter, they would probably form a single reproductive population and would evolve to extinction as the segregation distorter evolved to fixation. Around 50% of the total genome of maize consists of transposons, DNA elements whose primary function is to copy themselves into other locations of DNA. A class of transposons called P-elements seem to have first appeared in Drosophila only in the middle of the 20th century and spread to every population of the species within 50 years. The ALU sequence in humans, a 300-base transposon, is repeated between 300,000 and a million times in the human genome. This may not extinguish a species, but it doesn't help it. Transposons cause more mutations, which are, as always, mostly harmful, decrease the effective copying fidelity of DNA. Yet such cheaters are extremely fit. Suppose that in some sexually reproducing species, a perfect DNA copying mechanism is invented. Since most mutations are detrimental, this gene complex is an advantage to its holders. Now you might wonder about beneficial mutations. They do happen occasionally, so wouldn't the unmutable be at a disadvantage? But in a sexual species, a beneficial mutation that began in a mutable can spread to the descendants of unmutables as well. The mutables suffer from degenerate mutations in each generation, and the unmutables can sexually acquire, and thereby benefit from, any beneficial mutations that occur in the mutables. Thus, the mutables have a pure disadvantage. The perfect DNA copying mechanism rises in frequency to fixation. 
10,000 years later, there's an ice age and the species goes out of business. It evolved to extinction. The bystander effect is that when someone is in trouble, solitary individuals are more likely to intervene than groups. A college student apparently having an epileptic seizure was helped 85% of the time by a single bystander and 31% of the time by five bystanders. I speculate that even if the kinship relation in a hunter-gatherer tribe was strong enough to create a selection pressure for helping individuals not directly related, when several potential helpers were present, a genetic arms race might occur to be the last one to step forward. Everyone delays, hoping that someone else will do it. Humanity is facing multiple species-level extinction threats right now, and I gotta tell you, there ain't a lot of people stepping forward. If we lose this fight because virtually no one showed up on the battlefield, then, like a probably large number of species which we don't see around today, we will have evolved to extinction. Cancerous cells do pretty well in the body, prospering and amassing more resources, far outcompeting their more obedient counterparts. For a while. Multicellular organisms can only exist because they've evolved powerful internal mechanisms to outlaw evolution. If the cells start evolving, they rapidly evolve to extinction. The organism dies. So praise not evolution for the solicitous concern it shows for the individual. Nearly all of your ancestors are dead. Praise not evolution for the solicitous concern it shows for a species. No one has ever found a complex adaptation which can only be interpreted as operating to preserve a species, and the mathematics would seem to indicate that this is virtually impossible. Indeed, it's perfectly possible for a species to evolve to extinction. Humanity may be finishing up the process right now. You can't even praise evolution for the solicitous concern it shows for genes. The battle between two alternative alleles at the same location is a zero-sum game for frequency. Fitness is not always your friend. The Tragedy of Group Selectionism Before 1966, it was not unusual to see serious biologists advocating evolutionary hypotheses that we would now regard as magical thinking. These muddled notions played an important historical role in the development of later evolutionary theory, error calling forth correction, like the folly of English kings provoking into existence the Magna Carta and constitutional democracy. As an example of romance, Vero Wynne Edwards, Warder Alley, and J. L. Brereton, among others, believed that predators would voluntarily restrain their breeding to avoid overpopulating their habitat and exhausting the prey population. But evolution does not open the floodgates to arbitrary purposes. You cannot explain a rattlesnake's rattle by saying that it exists to benefit other animals who would otherwise be bitten. No outside evolutionary fairy decides when a gene ought to be promoted. The gene's effect must somehow directly cause the gene to be more prevalent in the next generation. It's clear why our human sense of aesthetics, witnessing a population crash of foxes who've eaten all the rabbits, cries, something should have been done. But how would a gene complex for restraining reproduction, of all things, cause itself to become more frequent in the next generation? A human being designing a neat little toy ecology for entertainment purposes like a model railroad, might be annoyed if their painstakingly constructed fox and rabbit populations self-destructed by the foxes eating all the rabbits and then dying of starvation themselves. So the human would tinker with the toy ecology. A fox breeding restrainer is the obvious solution that leaps to our human minds until the ecology looked nice and neat. Nature has no human, of course, but that needn't stop us. Now that we know what we want on aesthetic grounds, we just have to come up with a plausible argument that persuades nature to want the same thing on evolutionary grounds. Obviously, selection on the level of the individual won't produce individual restraint in breeding. Individuals who reproduce unrestrainedly will, naturally, produce more offspring than individuals who restrain themselves. 
Individual selection will not produce individual sacrifice of breeding opportunities. Individual selection can certainly produce individuals who, after acquiring all available resources, use those resources to produce four big eggs instead of eight small eggs. Not to conserve social resources, but because that is the individual sweet spot for number of eggs times egg survival probability. This does not get rid of the commons problem. But suppose that the species population was broken up into subpopulations, which were mostly isolated and only occasionally interbred. Then, surely, subpopulations that restrained their breeding would be less likely to go extinct and would send out more messengers and create new colonies to re inhabit the territories of crashed populations. The problem with this scenario wasn't that it was mathematically impossible. The problem was that it was possible, but very difficult. The fundamental problem is that it's not only restrained breeders who reap the benefits of restrained breeding. If some foxes refrain from spawning cubs who eat rabbits, then the uneaten rabbits don't go to only cubs who carry the restrained breeding adaptation. The unrestrained foxes and their many more cubs will happily eat any rabbits left unhunted. The only way the restraining gene can survive against this pressure is if the benefits of restraint preferentially go to restrainers. Specifically, the requirement is C over B is less than F subscript ST, where C is the cost of altruism to the donor, B is the benefit of altruism to the recipient, and F subscript ST is the spatial structure of the population, the average relatedness between a randomly selected organism and its randomly selected neighbor, where a neighbor is any other fox who benefits from an altruistic fox's restraint. So is the cost of restrained breeding sufficiently small and the empirical benefit of less famine sufficiently large compared to the empirical spatial structure of fox populations and rabbit populations that the group selection argument can work? The math suggests this is pretty unlikely. In this simulation, for example, the cost to altruists is 3% of fitness. Pure altruist groups have a fitness twice as great as pure selfish groups. The subpopulation size is 25, and 20% 20 of all deaths are replaced with messengers from another group. The result is polymorphic for selfishness and altruism. If the subpopulation size is doubled to 50, Selfishness is fixed. If the cost to altruists is increased to 6%, selfishness is fixed. If the altruistic benefit is decreased by half, selfishness is fixed, or in large majority. Neighborhood groups must be very small, with only around five members, for group selection to operate when the cost of altruism exceeds 10%. This doesn't seem plausibly true of foxes restraining their breeding. You can guess by now, I think, that the group selectionists ultimately lost to scientific argument. The kicker was not the mathematical argument, but empirical observation. Foxes didn't restrain their breeding. I forget the exact species of dispute. It wasn't foxes and rabbits. And indeed, predator-prey systems crash all the time. Group selectionism would later revive, somewhat in drastically different form. Mathematically speaking, there is neighborhood structure, which implies non-zero group selection pressure not necessarily capable of overcoming countervailing individual selection pressure. And if you don't take it into account, your math will be wrong, full stop. And evolved enforcement mechanisms, not originally postulated, change the game entirely. So why is this now historical scientific dispute worthy material for overcoming bias? A decade after the controversy, a biologist had a fascinating idea. The mathematical conditions for group selection overcoming individual selection were too extreme to be found in nature. Why not create them artificially in the laboratory? Michael J. Wade proceeded to do just that repeatedly selecting populations of insects for low numbers of adults per subpopulation. And what was the result? Did the insects restrain their breeding and live in quiet peace with enough food for all? No. The adults adapted to cannibalize eggs and larvae, 
especially female larvae. Of course, selecting for small subpopulation sizes would not select for individuals who restrained their own breeding. It would select for individuals who ate other individuals' children, especially the girls. Once you have that experimental result in hand, and it's massively obvious in retrospect, then it suddenly becomes clear how the original group selectionists allowed romanticism, a human sense of aesthetics, to cloud their predictions of nature. This is an archetypal example of a missed third alternative, resulting from a rationalization of a predetermined bottom line that produced a fake justification and then motivatedly stopped. The group selectionists didn't start with clear, fresh minds, happen upon the idea of group selection, and neutrally extrapolate forward the probable outcome. They started out with the beautiful idea of fox populations voluntarily restraining their reproduction to what the rabbit population would bear. Nature in perfect harmony. Then they searched for a reason why this would happen and came up with the idea of group selection. Then, since they knew what they wanted the outcome of group selection to be, they didn't look for any less beautiful and aesthetic adaptations that group selection would be more likely to promote instead. If they'd really been trying to calmly and neutrally predict the result of selecting for small subpopulation sizes resistant to famine, they would have thought of cannibalizing other organisms' children or some similarly ugly outcome. Long before they imagined anything so evolutionarily outré as individual restraint in breeding. This also illustrates the point I was trying to make in Einstein's Arrogance. With large answer spaces, nearly all of the real work goes into promoting one possible answer to the point of being singled out for attention. If a hypothesis is improperly promoted to your attention, your sense of aesthetics suggests a beautiful way for nature to be, and yet natural selection doesn't involve an evolution fairy who shares your appreciation— then this alone may seal your doom unless you can manage to clear your mind entirely and start over. In principle, the world's stupidest person may say the sun is shining, but that doesn't make it dark out. Even if an answer is suggested by a lunatic on LSD, you should be able to neutrally calculate the evidence for and against, and if necessary, unbelieve. In practice, the group selectionists were doomed because their bottom line was originally suggested by their sense of aesthetics, and nature's bottom line was produced by natural selection. These two processes had no principled reason for their outputs to correlate, and indeed they didn't. All the furious argument afterward didn't change that. If you start with your own desires for what nature should do, Consider nature's own observed reasons for doing things, and then rationalize an extremely persuasive argument for why nature should produce your preferred outcome for nature's own reasons, then nature, alas, still won't listen. The universe has no mind and is not subject to clever political persuasion. You can argue all day why gravity should really make water flow uphill, and the water just ends up in the same place regardless. It's like the universe plane isn't listening. J.R. Malloy said, Nature is the ultimate bigot because it is obstinately and intolerantly devoted to its own prejudices and absolutely refuses to yield to the most persuasive rationalizations of humans. I often recommend evolutionary biology to friends. Just because the modern field tries to train its students against rationalization, error calling forth correction, physicists and electrical engineers don't have to be carefully trained to avoid anthropomorphizing electrons because electrons don't exhibit mindish behaviors. Natural selection creates purposefulnesses which are alien to humans, and students of evolutionary theory are warned accordingly. It's good training for any thinker, but it is especially important if you want to think clearly about other weird mindish processes that do not work like you do. Fake Optimization Criteria I've previously dwelt 
in considerable length upon forms of rationalization whereby our beliefs appear to match the evidence much more strongly than they actually do, and I'm not overemphasizing the point either. If we could beat this fundamental meta-bias and see what every hypothesis really predicted, we would be able to recover from almost any other error of fact. The mirror challenge for decision theory is seeing which option a choice criterion really endorses. If your stated moral principles call for you to provide laptops to everyone, does that really endorse buying a $1 million gym studded laptop for yourself or spending the same money on shipping 5,000 OLPCs? We seem to have evolved a knack for arguing that practically any goal implies practically any action. A phlogiston theorist explaining why magnesium gains weight when burned has nothing on an inquisitor explaining why God's infinite love for all his children requires burning some of them at the stake. There's no mystery about this. Politics was a feature of the ancestral environment. We are descended from those who argued most persuasively that the good of the tribe meant executing their hated rival, Ooglock. We sure ain't descended from Ooglock. And yet, is it possible to prove that if Robert Mugabe cared only for the good of Zimbabwe, he would resign from its presidency? You can argue that the policy follows from the goal, but haven't we just seen that humans can match up any goal to any policy? How do you know that you're right and Mugabe is wrong? There are a number of reasons this is a good idea, but bear with me here. Human motives are manifold and obscure. Our decision processes as vastly complicated as our brains. And the world itself is vastly complicated on every choice of real-world policy. Can we even prove that human beings are rationalizing? That we're systematically distorting the link from principles to policy when we lack a single firm place on which to stand? when there's no way to find out exactly what even a single optimization criterion implies? Actually, you can just observe that people disagree about office politics in ways that strangely correlate to their own interests while simultaneously denying that any such interests are at work, but again, bear with me here. Where is the standardized, open-source, generally intelligent, consequentialist optimization process into which we can feed a complete morality as an XML file to find out what that morality really recommends when applied to our world? Is there even a single real-world case where we can know exactly what a choice criterion recommends? Where is the pure moral reasoner of known utility function, purged of all other stray desires that might distort its optimization, whose trustworthy output we can contrast to human rationalizations of the same utility function. Why, it's our old friend, the alien god, of course. Natural selection is guaranteed free of all mercy, all love, all compassion, all aesthetic sensibilities, all political factionalism, all ideological allegiances, all academic ambitions, all libertarianism, all socialism, all blue, and all green. Natural selection doesn't maximize its criterion of inclusive genetic fitness. It's not that smart. But... When you look at the output of natural selection, you are guaranteed to be looking at an output that was optimized only for inclusive genetic fitness and not the interests of the U.S. agricultural industry. In the case histories of evolutionary science, in, for example, the tragedy of group selectionism, we can directly compare human rationalizations to the result of pure optimization for a known criterion. What did Winnie Edwards think would be the result of group selection for a small subpopulation size? Voluntary individual restraint in breeding and enough food for everyone. What was the actual laboratory result? Cannibalism. Now, you might ask, are these case histories of evolutionary science really relevant to human morality, which doesn't give two figs for inclusive genetic fitness when it gets in the way of love, compassion, aesthetics, healing, freedom, fairness, etc., etc. Human societies didn't even have a concept of inclusive genetic fitness until the 20th century. But I ask in return, 
If we can't see clearly the result of a single monotone optimization criterion, if we can't even train ourselves to hear a single pure note, then how will we listen to an orchestra? How will we see that always be selfish or always obey the government are poor guiding principles for human beings to adopt if we think that even optimizing genes for inclusive fitness will yield organisms which sacrifice reproductive opportunities in the name of social resource conservation. To train ourselves to see clearly, we need simple practice cases. Adaptation Executors not fitness maximizers. Individual organisms are best thought of as adaptation executors rather than as fitness maximizers. John Tooby and Lita Kosmides, The Psychological Foundations of Culture. 50,000 years ago, the taste buds of Homo sapiens directed their bearers to the scarcest, most critical food resources, sugar and fat, calories in a word, Today, the context of a taste bud's function has changed, but the taste buds themselves have not. Calories, far from being scarce in first world countries, are actively harmful. Micronutrients that were reliably abundant in leaves and nuts are absent from bread, but our taste buds don't complain. A scoop of ice cream is a super stimulus containing more sugar, fat, and salt than anything in the ancestral environment. No human being with the deliberate goal of maximizing their allele's inclusive genetic fitness would ever eat a cookie unless they were starving. But individual organisms are best thought of as adaptation executors, not fitness maximizers. A Phillips head screwdriver, though its designer intended it to turn screws, won't reconform itself to a flathead screw to fulfill its function. We created these tools, but they exist independently of us, and they continue independently of us. The atoms of a screwdriver don't have tiny little XML tags inside describing their objective purpose. The designer had something in mind, yes, but that's not the same as what happens in the real world. If you forgot that the designer is a separate entity from the designed thing, you might think the purpose of the screwdriver is to drive screws as though this were an explicit property of the screwdriver itself, rather than a property of the designer's state of mind. You might be surprised that the screwdriver didn't reconfigure itself to the flathead screw, since, after all, the screwdriver's purpose is to turn screws. The cause of the screwdriver's existence is the designer's mind, which imagined an imaginary screw and imagined an imaginary handle turning. The actual operation of the screwdriver, its actual fit to an actual screw head, cannot be the objective cause of the screwdriver's existence. The future cannot cause the past, but the designer's brain, as an actually existent thing within the past, can indeed be the cause of the screwdriver. The consequence of the screwdriver's existence may not correspond to the imaginary consequences in the designer's mind. The screwdriver blade could slip and cut the user's hand. And the meaning of the screwdriver, why, that's something that exists in the mind of a user, not in tiny little labels on screwdriver atoms. The designer may intend it to turn screws. A murderer may buy it to use as a weapon, and then accidentally drop it to be picked up by a child who uses it as a chisel. So the screwdriver's cause and its shape and its consequence and its various meanings are all different things, and only one of these things is found within the screwdriver itself. Where do taste buds come from? Not from an intelligent designer visualizing their consequences, but from a frozen history of ancestry. Adam liked sugar and ate an apple and reproduced. Barbara liked sugar and ate an apple and reproduced. Charlie liked sugar and ate an apple and reproduced, and... 2,763 generations later, the allele became fixed in the population. For convenience of thought, we sometimes compress this giant history and say, evolution did it. But it's not a quick local event like a human designer visualizing a screwdriver. This is the objective cause of a taste bud. What is the objective shape of a taste bud? Technically, it's a molecular sensor connected to reinforcement circuitry. 
This adds another level of indirection because the taste bud isn't directly acquiring food. It's influencing the organism's mind, making the organism want to eat foods that are similar to the food just eaten. What is the objective consequence of a taste bud? In a modern first world human, it plays out in multiple chains of causality, from the desire to eat more chocolate, to the plan to eat more chocolate, to eating chocolate, to getting fat, to getting fewer dates, to reproducing less successfully. This consequence is directly opposite the key regularity in the long chain of ancestral successes that caused the taste bud's shape. But since overeating has only recently become a problem, no significant evolution, compressed regularity of ancestry, has further influenced the taste bud's shape. What is the meaning of eating chocolate? That's between you and your moral philosophy. Personally, I think chocolate tastes good, but I wish it were less harmful. Acceptable solutions would include redesigning the chocolate or redesigning my biochemistry. Smushing several of the concepts together, you could sort of say modern humans do today what would have propagated our genes in a hunter-gatherer society, whether or not it helps our genes in a modern society. But this still isn't quite right because we're not actually asking ourselves which behaviors would maximize our ancestors' inclusive fitness. But many of our activities today have no ancestral analog. In the hunter-gatherer society, there wasn't any such thing as chocolate. So it's better to view our taste buds as an adaptation fitted to ancestral conditions that included near starvation and apples and roast rabbit, which modern humans execute in a new context that includes cheap chocolate and constant bombardment by advertisements. Therefore, it is said, individual organisms are best thought of as adaptation executors not fitness maximizers. Evolutionary Psychology Like IRC chat or TCP forward slash IP protocol, the phrase reproductive organ is redundant. All organs are reproductive organs. Where do a bird's wings come from? An evolution of bird's fairy who thinks that flying is really neat? The bird's wings are there because they contributed to the bird's ancestors' reproduction. Likewise, the bird's heart, lungs, and genitals. At most, we might find it worthwhile to distinguish between directly reproductive organs and indirectly reproductive organs. This observation holds true also of the brain, the most complex organ system known to biology. Some brain organs are directly reproductive, like lust. Others are indirectly reproductive, like anger. Where does the human emotion of anger come from? An evolution of humans fairy who thought that anger was a worthwhile feature? The neural circuitry of anger is a reproductive organ as surely as your liver. Anger exists in Homo sapiens because angry ancestors had more kids. There's no other way it could have gotten there. This historical fact about the origin of anger confuses all too many people. They say, wait, are you saying that when I'm angry, I'm subconsciously trying to have children? That's not what I'm thinking after someone punches me in the nose. No. 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 Individual organisms are best thought of as adaptation executors, not fitness maximizers. The cause of an adaptation, the shape of an adaptation, the consequence of an adaptation are all separate things. If you built a toaster, you wouldn't expect the toaster to reshape itself when you tried to cram in a whole loaf of bread. Yes, you intended it to make toast, but that intention is a fact about you, not a fact about the toaster. The toaster has no sense of its own purpose. But a toaster is not an intention-bearing object. It is not a mind at all, so we are not tempted to attribute goals to it. If we see the toaster as purposed, we don't think the toaster knows it because we don't think the toaster knows anything. It's like the old test of being asked to say the color of the letters in blue, which is written in red. It takes longer for subjects to name this color because of the need to untangle the meaning of the letters and the color of the letters you wouldn't have similar trouble naming the color of the letters in wind, which is written in green. 
But a human brain, in addition to being an artifact historically produced by evolution, is also a mind capable of bearing its own intentions, purposes, desires, goals, and plans. Both a bee and a human are designs, but only a human is a designer. The bee is wind, written in green. The human is blue, written in red. Cognitive causes are ontologically distinct from evolutionary causes. They're made out of a different kind of stuff. Cognitive causes are made of neurons. Evolutionary causes are made of ancestors. The most obvious kind of cognitive cause is deliberate, like an intention to go to the supermarket, or a plan for toasting toast. But an emotion also exists physically in the brain, as a train of neural impulses or a cloud of spreading hormones, Likewise, an instinct, or a flash of visualization, or a fleetingly suppressed thought, if you could scan the brain in three dimensions, and you understood the code, you would be able to see them. Even subconscious cognitions exist physically in the brain. Power tends to corrupt, observed Lord Acton. Stalin may or may not have believed himself an altruist, working toward the greatest good for the greatest number. But it seems likely that, somewhere in Stalin's brain, there were neural circuits that reinforced pleasurably the exercise of power, and neural circuits that detected anticipations of increases and decreases in power. If there were nothing in Stalin's brain that correlated to power, no little light that went on for political command and off for political weakness, then how could Stalin's brain have known to be corrupted by power? Evolutionary selection pressures are ontologically distinct from the biological artifacts they create. The evolutionary cause of a bird's wings is millions of ancestor birds who reproduced more often than other ancestor birds, with statistical regularity owing to their possession of incrementally improved wings compared to their competitors. We compress this gargantuan historical statistical macro fact by saying, evolution did it. Natural selection is ontologically distinct from creatures. Evolution is not a little furry thing lurking in an undiscovered forest. Evolution is a causal, statistical regularity in the reproductive history of ancestors. And this logic applies also to the brain. Evolution has made wings that flap, but do not understand flappiness. It has made legs that walk, but do not understand walkiness. Evolution has carved bones of calcium ions, but the bones themselves have no explicit concept of strength, let alone inclusive genetic fitness. And evolution designed brains themselves capable of designing. Yet these brains had no more concept of evolution than a bird has of aerodynamics until the 20th century. Not a single human brain explicitly represented the complex, abstract concept of inclusive genetic fitness. When we're told that the evolutionary purpose of anger is to increase inclusive genetic fitness, there's a tendency to slide to the purpose of anger is reproduction, to the cognitive purpose of anger is reproduction. No, the statistical regularity of ancestral history isn't in the brain even subconsciously, any more than the designer's intentions of toast are in a toaster. Thinking that your built-in anger circuitry embodies an explicit desire to reproduce is like thinking your hand is an embodied mental desire to pick things up. Your hand is not wholly cut off from your mental desires. In particular circumstances, you can control the flexing of your fingers by an act of will. If you bend down and pick up a penny, then this may represent an act of will. But it is not an act of will that made your hand grow in the first place. One must distinguish a one-time event of particular anger, anger 1, anger 2, anger 3, from the underlying neural circuitry for anger. An anger event is a cognitive cause, and an anger event may have cognitive causes, but you didn't will the anger circuitry to be wired into the brain. So you have to distinguish the event of anger from the circuitry of anger, from the gene complex that laid down the neural template, from the ancestral macrofact that explains the gene complex's presence. If there were ever a discipline that genuinely demanded extreme nitpicking, it is evolutionary psychology. 
Consider, O oh my readers, this sordid and joyful tale. A man and a woman meet in a bar. The man is attracted to her clear complexion and firm breasts, which would have been fertility cues in the ancestral environment, but which in this case result from makeup and a bra. This does not bother the man. He just likes the way she looks. His clear complexion detecting neural circuitry does not know that its purpose is to detect fertility any more than the atoms in his hand contain tiny little XML tags reading purpose, pick things up, close purpose. The woman is attracted to his confident smile and firm manner, cues to high status, which in the ancestral environment would have signified the ability to provide resources for children. She plans to use birth control, but her confident smile detectors don't know this any more than a toaster knows its designer intended to make toast. She's not concerned philosophically with the meaning of this rebellion because her brain is a creationist and denies vehemently that evolution exists. He's not concerned philosophically with the meaning of this rebellion because he just wants to get laid. They go to a hotel and undress. He puts on a condom because he doesn't want kids, just the dopamine nor adrenaline rush of sex, which reliably produced offspring 50,000 years ago when it was an invariant feature of the ancestral environment that condoms did not exist. They have sex and shower and go their separate ways. The main objective consequence is to keep the bar and the hotel and the condom manufacturer in business, which was not the cognitive purpose in their minds and has virtually nothing to do with the key statistical regularities of reproduction 50,000 years ago, which explain how they got the genes that built their brains that executed all this behavior. To reason correctly about evolutionary psychology, you must simultaneously consider many complicated abstract facts that are strongly related yet importantly distinct without a single mix-up or conflation. An Especially Elegant Evolutionary Psychology Experiment In a 1989 Canadian study, Adults were asked to imagine the death of children of various ages and estimate which deaths would create the greatest sense of loss in a parent. The results, plotted on a graph, show grief growing until just before adolescence and then beginning to drop. When this curve was compared with a curve showing changes in reproductive potential over the life cycle, a pattern calculated from Canadian demographic data, the correlation was fairly strong, but much stronger nearly perfect, in fact, was the correlation between the grief curves of these modern Canadians and the reproductive potential curve of a hunter-gatherer people, the Kung of Africa. In other words, the pattern of changing grief was almost exactly what a Darwinian would predict, given demographic realities in the ancestral environment. Robert Wright, The Moral Animal, summarizing Crawford et al., the first correlation was 0.64, the second, an extremely high 0.92, n equal 221. The most obvious inelegance of this study, as described, is that it was conducted by asking human adults to imagine parental grief, rather than asking real parents with children of particular ages. Presumably, that would have cost more, or allowed fewer subjects. However, my understanding is that the results here squared well with the data from closer studies of a parental grief that were looking for other correlations, i.e. a raw correlation between parental grief and child age. That said, consider some of this experiment's elegant aspects. 1. A correlation of 0 0.92. This may sound suspiciously high. Could evolution really do such exact fine-tuning? until you realize that this selection pressure was not only great enough to fine-tune parental grief, but, in fact, carve it out of existence from scratch in the first place. 2. People who say that evolutionary psychology hasn't made any advanced predictions are, ironically, mere victims of no-one-knows-what-science-doesn't-know syndrome. You wouldn't even think of this as an experiment to be performed, if not for evolutionary psychology. 3. The experiment illustrates, as beautifully and as cleanly as any I have ever seen, the distinction between a conscious or subconscious ulterior motive and an executing adaptation with no real-time sensitivity to the original selection pressure that created it. 
The parental grief is not even subconsciously about reproductive value. Otherwise, it would update for Canadian reproductive value instead of Kung reproductive value. Grief is an adaptation that now simply exists, real in the mind and continuing under its own inertia. Parents do not care about children for the sake of their reproductive contribution. Parents care about children for their own sake and the non-cognitive, evolutionary, historical reason why such minds exist in the universe in the first place is that children carry their parents' genes. Indeed, evolution is the reason why there are any minds in the universe at all. So you can see why I'd want to draw a sharp line through my cynicism about ulterior motives at the evolutionary cognitive boundary. Otherwise, I might as well stand up in a supermarket checkout line and say, Hey, you're only correctly processing visual information while bagging my groceries in order to maximize your inclusive genetic fitness. 1. I think 0.92 is the highest correlation I've ever seen in any evolutionary psychology experiment, and indeed one of the highest correlations I've seen in any psychology experiment. Although I've seen, for example, a correlation of 0.98 reported for asking one group of subjects, how similar is A to B? And another group, what is the probability of A given B? On questions like, how likely are you to draw 60 red balls and 40 white balls from the barrel of 800 red balls and 200 white balls? In other words, these are simply processed as the same question. Since we're all Bayesians here, we may take our priors into account and ask if at least some of this unexpectedly high correlation is due to luck. The evolutionary fine-tuning we can probably take for granted. This is a huge selection pressure we're talking about. The remaining sources of suspiciously low variance are a. whether a large group of adults could correctly envision, on average, relative degrees of parental grief, apparently they can, and b. whether the surviving Kung are typical ancestral hunter-gatherers in this dimension or whether variance between hunter-gatherer tribal types should have been too high to allow a correlation of 0.92. But even after taking into account any skeptical priors, correlation 0.92 and n equal 221 is pretty strong evidence, and our posteriors should be less skeptical on all these counts. 2. You might think it an inelegance of the experiment that it was performed prospectively on imagined grief rather than retrospectively on real grief. But it is prospectively imagined grief that will actually operate to steer parental behavior away from losing the child. From an evolutionary standpoint, an actual dead child is a sunk cost. Evolution wants the parent to learn from the pain, not do it again. Adjust back to their hedonic set point and go on raising other children. Three, similarly, the graph that correlates to parental grief is for the future reproductive potential of a child that has survived to a given age, and not the sunk cost of raising the child which has survived to that age. Might we get an even higher correlation if we tried to take into account the reproductive opportunity cost of raising a child of age X to independent maturity, while discarding all sunk costs to raise a child to age X? Humans usually do notice sunk costs. This is presumably either an adaptation to prevent us from switching strategies too often, compensating for an overeager opportunity noticer, or an unfortunate spandrel of pain felt on wasting resources. Evolution, on the other hand, it's not that evolution doesn't care about sunk costs, but that evolution doesn't even remotely think that way. Evolution is just a macro fact about the real historical reproductive consequences. So, of course, the parental grief adaptation is fine-tuned in a way that has nothing to do with past investment in a child and everything to do with the future reproductive consequences of losing that child. Natural selection isn't crazy about sunk costs the way we are. But, of course, the parental grief adaptation goes on functioning as if the parent were living in a Kung tribe rather than Canada. Most humans would notice the difference. Human and natural selection are insane in different, stable, complicated ways. Superstimuli and the Collapse of Western Civilization 
At least three people have died playing online games for days without rest. People have lost their spouses, jobs, and children to World of Warcraft. If people have the right to play video games, and it's hard to imagine a more fundamental right, then the market is going to respond by supplying the most engaging video games that can be sold, to the point that exceptionally engaged consumers are removed from the gene pool. So how does a consumer product become so involving that after 57 hours of using the product, the consumer would rather use the product for one more hour than eat or sleep? I suppose one could argue that the consumer makes a rational decision that they'd rather play StarCraft for the next hour than live out the rest of their life, but let's just not go there, please. A candy bar is a super stimulus. It contains more concentrated sugar, salt, and fat than anything that exists in our ancestral environment. A candy bar matches taste buds that evolved in a hunter-gatherer environment. The signal that once reliably correlated to healthy food has been hijacked, blotted out with a point in taste space that wasn't in the training data set, an impossibly distant outlier on the old ancestral graphs. Tastiness formerly representing the evolutionarily identified correlates of healthiness, has been reverse-engineered and perfectly matched with an artificial substance. Unfortunately, there is no equally powerful market incentive to make the resulting food item as healthy as it is tasty. We can't taste healthfulness, after all. The now-famous Dove Evolution video shows the painstaking construction of another super-stimulus, an ordinary woman transformed by makeup careful photography, and finally extensive photoshopping into a billboard model. A beauty impossible, unmatchable by human women in the unretouched real world. Actual women are killing themselves, for example supermodels using cocaine to keep their weight down, to keep up with competitors that literally don't exist. And likewise, a video game can be so much more engaging than mere reality even through a simple computer monitor, that someone will play it without food or sleep until they literally die. I don't know all the tricks used in video games, but I can guess some of them. Challenge is poised at the critical point between ease and impossibility. Intermittent reinforcement, feedback showing an ever-increasing score, social involvement in massively multiplayer games. Is there a limit to the market incentive to make video games more engaging? You might hope there'd be no incentive past the point where the players lose their jobs. After all, they must be able to pay their subscription fee. This would imply a sweet spot for the addictiveness of games, where the mode of the bell curve is having fun, and only a few unfortunate souls on the tail become addicted to the point of losing their jobs. As of 2007, playing World of Warcraft for 58 hours straight until you literally die is still the exception rather than the rule. But video game manufacturers compete against each other, and if you can make your game 5% more addictive, you may be able to steal 50% of your competitors' customers. You can see how this problem could get a lot worse. If people have the right to be tempted, and that's what free will is all about, the market is going to respond by supplying as much temptation as can be sold. The incentive is to make your stimuli 5% more tempting than those of your current leading competitors. This continues well beyond the point where the stimuli become ancestrally anomalous superstimuli. Consider how our standards of product selling feminine beauty have changed since the advertisements of the 1950s. And as candy bars demonstrate, the market incentive also continues well beyond the point where the superstimulus begins wreaking collateral damage on the consumer. So why don't we just say no? A key assumption of free market economics is that, in the absence of force and fraud, people can always refuse to engage in a harmful transaction. To the extent this is true, a free market would be not merely the best policy on the whole, but a policy with few or no downsides. An organism that regularly passes up food will die, as some video game players found out the hard way. But on some occasions in the ancestral environment, a typically beneficial, and therefore tempting, act may in fact be harmful. Humans as organisms have an unusually strong ability to perceive these special cases using abstract thought. On the other hand, we also tend to imagine lots of special case consequences that don't exist, 
like ancestor spirits commanding us not to eat perfectly good rabbits. Evolution seems to have struck a compromise, or perhaps just aggregated new systems on top of old. Homo sapiens are still tempted by food, but our oversized prefrontal cortices give us a limited ability to resist temptation. Not unlimited ability. Our ancestors with too much willpower probably starved themselves to sacrifice to the gods or failed to commit adultery one too many times. The video game players who died must have exercised willpower, in some sense, to keep playing for so long without food or sleep. The evolutionary hazard of self-control. Resisting any temptation takes conscious expenditure of an exhaustible supply of mental energy. It is not, in fact, true that we can just say no. Not just say no without cost to ourselves. Even humans who won the birth lottery for willpower or foresightfulness still pay a price to resist temptation. The price is just more easily paid. Our limited willpower evolved to deal with ancestral temptations. It may not operate well against enticements beyond anything known to hunter-gatherers. Even where we successfully resist a superstimulus, it seems plausible that the effort required would deplete willpower much faster than resisting ancestral temptations. Is public display of superstimuli a negative externality even to the people who say no? Should we ban chocolate cookie ads? or storefronts that openly say, ice cream? Just because a problem exists doesn't show, without further justification and a substantial burden of proof, that the government can fix it. The regulator's career incentive does not focus on products that combine low-grade consumer harm with addictive superstimuli. It focuses on products with failure modes spectacular enough to get into the newspaper. Conversely, just because the government may not be able to fix something doesn't mean it isn't going wrong. I leave you with a final argument from fictional evidence. Simon Funk's online novel, Afterlife, depicts, among other plot points, the planned extermination of biological Homo sapiens, not by marching robot armies, but by artificial children that are much cuter and sweeter and more fun to raise than real children. Perhaps the demographic collapse of advanced societies happens because the market supplies ever more tempting alternatives to having children, while the attractiveness of changing diapers remains constant over time. Where are the advertising billboards that say, Breed! Who will pay professional image consultants to make arguing with sullen teenagers seem more alluring than a vacation in Tahiti? In the end, Simon Funk wrote, the human species was simply marketed out of existence. Thou art God Shatter Before the 20th century, not a single human being had an explicit concept of inclusive genetic fitness, the sole and absolute obsession of the blind idiot God. We have no instinctive revulsion of condoms or oral sex. Our brains, those supreme reproductive organs, don't perform a check for reproductive efficacy before granting us sexual pleasure. Why not? Why aren't we consciously obsessed with inclusive genetic fitness? Why did the evolution of humans fairy create brains that would invent condoms? It would have been so easy, thinks the human who can design new complex systems in an afternoon. The evolution fairy, as we all know, is obsessed with inclusive genetic fitness. When she decides which genes to promote to universality, she doesn't seem to take into account anything except the number of copies a gene produces. How strange. But since the maker of intelligence is thus obsessed, why not create intelligent agents, you can't call them humans, who would likewise care purely about inclusive genetic fitness? Such agents would have sex only as a means of reproduction and wouldn't bother with sex that involved birth control. They could eat food out of an explicitly reasoned belief that food was necessary to reproduce, not because they liked the taste, and so they wouldn't eat candy if it became detrimental to survival or reproduction. Postmenopausal women would babysit grandchildren until they became sick enough to be a net drain on resources and would then commit suicide. It seems like such an obvious design improvement, from the evolution fairy's perspective. 
Now it's clear that it's hard to build a powerful enough consequentialist, natural selection sort of reasons consequentially, but only by depending on the actual consequences. Human evolutionary theorists have to do really high highfalutin abstract reasoning in order to imagine the links between adaptations and reproductive success. But human brains clearly can imagine these links in protein. So when the evolution fairy made humans, why did it bother with any motivation except inclusive genetic fitness? It's been less than two centuries since a protein brain first represented the concept of natural selection. The modern notion of inclusive genetic fitness is even more subtle, a highly abstract concept. What matters is not the number of shared genes. Chimpanzees share 95% of your genes. What matters is shared genetic variants within a reproducing population. Your sister is one half related to you because any variations in your genome within the human species are 50% likely to be shared by your sister. Only in the last century, arguably only in the last 50 years, have evolutionary biologists really begun to understand the full range of causes of reproductive success, things like reciprocal altruism and costly signaling. Without all this highly detailed knowledge, an intelligent agent that set out to maximize inclusive fitness would fall flat on its face. So why not pre-program protein brains with the knowledge? Why wasn't a concept of inclusive genetic fitness programmed into us along with a library of explicit strategies? Then you could dispense with all the reinforcers. The organism would be born knowing that, with high probability, fatty foods would lead to fitness. If the organism later learned that this was no longer the case, it would stop eating fatty foods. You could refactor the whole system, and it wouldn't invent condoms or cookies. This looks like it should be quite possibly in principle. I occasionally run into people who don't quite understand consequentialism, who say, but if the organism doesn't have a separate drive to eat, it will starve and so fail to reproduce. So long as the organism knows this very fact and has a utility function that values reproduction, it will automatically eat. In fact, this is exactly the consequentialist reasoning that natural selection itself used to build automatic eaters. What about curiosity? Wouldn't a consequentialist only be curious when it saw some specific reason to be curious? And wouldn't this cause it to miss out on lots of important knowledge that came with no specific reason for investigation attached? Again, a consequentialist will investigate given only the knowledge of this very same fact. If you consider the curiosity drive of a human which is not undiscriminating, but responds to particular features of problems, then this complex adaptation is purely the result of consequentialist reasoning by DNA, an implicit representation of knowledge. Ancestors who engaged in this kind of inquiry left more descendants. So in principle, the pure reproductive consequentialist is possible. In principle, all the ancestral history implicitly represented in cognitive adaptations can be converted to explicitly represented knowledge, running on a core consequentialist. But the blind idiot god isn't that smart. Evolution is not a human programmer who can simultaneously refactor whole code architectures. Evolution is not a human programmer who can sit down and type out instructions at 60 words per minute. For millions of years before hominid consequentialism, there was reinforcement learning. The reward signals were events that correlated reliably to reproduction. You can't ask a non-hominid brain to foresee that a child eating fatty foods now will live through the winter. So the DNA builds a protein brain that generates a reward signal for eating fatty food. Then it's up to the organism to learn which prey animals are tastiest. DNA constructs protein brains with reward signals that have a long-distance correlation to reproductive fitness, but a short-distance correlation to organism behavior. You don't have to figure out that eating sugary food in the fall will lead to digesting calories that can be stored fat to help you survive the winter so that you mate in spring to produce offspring in summer. An apple simply tastes good, and your brain just has to plot out how to get more apples off the tree. 
And so, organisms evolve rewards for eating, in the building nests, and scaring off competitors, and helping siblings, and discovering important truths, and forming strong alliances, and arguing persuasively, and of course, having sex. When hominid brains capable of cross-domain consequential reasoning began to show up, they reasoned consequentially about how to get the existing reinforcers. It was a relatively simple hack, vastly simpler than rebuilding an inclusive fitness maximizer from scratch. The protein brains plotted how to acquire calories and sex without any explicit cognitive representation of inclusive fitness. A human engineer would have said, Whoa, I've just invented a consequentialist. Now I can take all my previous hard-won knowledge about which behaviors improve fitness and declare it explicitly. I can convert all this complicated reinforcement learning machinery into a simple declarative knowledge statement that fatty foods and sex usually improve your inclusive fitness. Consequential reasoning will automatically take care of the rest. Plus, it won't have the obvious failure mode where it invents condoms. But then a human engineer wouldn't have built the retina backwards either. The blind idiot god is not a unitary purpose, but a mini-splintered attention. Foxes evolve to catch rabbits. Rabbits evolve to evade foxes. There are as many evolutions as species. But within each species, the blind idiot god is purely obsessed with inclusive genetic fitness. No quality is valued, not even survival, except insofar as it increases reproductive fitness. There's no point in an organism with steel skin if it ends up having 1% less reproductive capacity. Yet when the blind idiot god created protein computers, its monomaniacal focus on inclusive genetic fitness was not faithfully transmitted. Its optimization criterion did not successfully quine. We, the handiwork of evolution, are as alien to evolution as our maker is alien to us. One pure utility function splintered into a thousand shards of desire. Why? Above all, because evolution is stupid in an absolute sense. But also because the first protein computers weren't anywhere near as general as the blind idiot god and could only utilize short-term desires. In the final analysis, asking why evolution didn't build humans to maximize inclusive genetic fitness is like asking why evolution didn't hand humans a ribosome and tell them to design their own biochemistry. Because evolution can't refactor code that fast, that's why. But maybe in a billion years of continued natural selection, that's exactly what would happen if intelligence were foolish enough to allow the idiot god continued reign. The Moat in God's Eye by Niven and Purnell depicts an intelligent species that stayed biological a little too long, slowly becoming truly enslaved by evolution, gradually turning into true fitness maximizers obsessed with out-reproducing each other. But thankfully, that's not what happened. Not here on Earth. At least, not yet. So humans love the taste of sugar and fat, and we love our sons and daughters. We seek social status and sex. We sing and dance and play. We learn for the love of learning. A thousand delicious tastes match to ancient reinforcers that once correlated with reproductive fitness, now sought whether or not they enhance reproduction. Sex with birth control, chocolate, the music of long-dead Bach on a CD. And when we finally learn about evolution, we think to ourselves, Obsess all day about inclusive genetic fitness? Where's the fun in that? The blind idiot god's single monomaniacal goal splintered into a thousand shards of desire. And this is, well, I think, though I'm a human who says so. Or else, what would we do with the future? What would we do with the billion galaxies in the night sky? Fill them with maximally efficient replicators? Should our descendants deliberately obsess about maximizing their inclusive genetic fitness regarding all else only as a means to that end? Being a thousand shards of desire isn't always fun, but at least it's not boring. Somewhere along the line, we evolved tastes for novelty, complexity, elegance, and challenge. Tastes that judge the blind idiot god's monomaniacal focus and find it aesthetically unsatisfying. 
And yes, we got those very same tastes from the blind idiot's god shatter. So what? Part M. Fragile Purposes Belief in Intelligence I don't know what moves Garry Kasparov would make in a chess game. What then is the empirical content of my belief that Kasparov is a highly intelligent chess player? What real-world experience does my belief tell me to anticipate? Is it a cleverly masked form of total ignorance? To sharpen the dilemma, suppose Kasparov plays against some mere chess grandmaster, Mr. G, who's not in the running for world champion. My own ability is far too low to distinguish between these levels of chess skill. When I try to guess Kasparov's move, or Mr. G's next move, all I can do is try to guess the best chess move using my own meager knowledge of chess. Then I would produce exactly the same prediction for Kasparov's move, or Mr. G's move, in any particular chess position. So what is the empirical content of my belief that Kasparov is a better chess player than Mr. G? The empirical content of my belief is the testable, falsifiable prediction that the final chess position will occupy the class of chess positions that are wins for Kasparov, rather than drawn games or wins for Mr. G, counting resignation as a legal move that leads to a chess position classified as a loss. The degree to which I think Kasparov is a better player is reflected in the amount of probability mass I concentrate into the Kasparov wins class of outcomes versus the drawn game and Mr. G wins class of outcomes. These classes are extremely vague in the sense that they refer to vast spaces of possible chess positions, but Kasparov wins is more specific than maximum entropy because it can be definitely falsified by a vast set of chess positions. The outcome of Kasparov's game is predictable because I know and understand Kasparov's goals. Within the confines of the chessboard, I know Kasparov's motivations. I know his success criterion, his utility function, his target as an optimization process. I know where Kasparov is ultimately trying to steer the future, and I anticipate he is powerful enough to get there, although I don't anticipate much about how Kasparov is going to do it. Imagine that I'm visiting a distant city, and a local friend volunteers to drive me to the airport. I don't know the neighborhood. Each time my friend approaches a street intersection, I don't know whether my friend will turn left, turn right, or continue straight ahead. I can't predict my friend's move even as we approach each individual intersection, let alone predict the whole sequence of moves in advance. Yet, I can predict the result of my friend's unpredictable actions. We will arrive at the airport even if my friend's house were located elsewhere in the city, so that my friend made a completely different sequence of turns, I would just as confidently predict our arrival at the airport. I can predict this long in advance, before I even get into the car. My flight departs soon, and there's no time to waste. I wouldn't get into the car in the first place if I couldn't confidently predict that the car would travel to the airport along an unpredictable pathway. Isn't this a remarkable situation to be in, from a scientific perspective? I can predict the outcome of a process without being able to predict any of the intermediate steps of the process. How is this even possible? Ordinarily, one predicts by imagining the present and then running the visualization forward in time. If you want a precise model of the solar system, one that takes into account planetary perturbations, you must start with a model of all major objects and run that model forward in time, step by step. Sometimes simpler problems have a closed form solution, where calculating the future at a time, t, takes the same amount of work regardless of t. A coin rests on a table, and after each minute, the coin turns over. The coin starts out showing heads. What face will it show a hundred minutes later? Obviously, you did not answer this question by visualizing a hundred intervening steps. You used a closed form solution that worked to predict the outcome, and would also work to predict any of the intervening steps. But when my friend drives me to the airport, I can predict the outcome successfully using a strange model that won't work to predict any of the intermediate steps. 
My model doesn't even require me to input the initial conditions. I don't need to know where we start out in the city. I do need to know something about my friend. I must know that my friend wants me to make my flight. I must credit that my friend is a good enough planner to successfully drive me to the airport, if he wants to. These are properties of my friend's initial state, properties which let me predict the final destination, though not any intermediate turns. I must also credit that my friend knows enough about the city to drive successfully. This may be regarded as a relation between my friend and the city, hence a property of both but an extremely abstract property which does not require any specific knowledge about either the city or about my friend's knowledge about the city. This is one way of viewing the subject matter to which I've devoted my life. These remarkable situations which place us in such odd epistemic positions, and my work, in a sense, can be viewed as unraveling the exact form of that strange abstract knowledge we can possess, whereby, not knowing the actions, we can justifiably know the consequence. Intelligence is too narrow a term to describe these remarkable situations in full generality. I would say, rather, optimization process. A similar situation accompanies the study of biological natural selection, for example. We can't predict the exact form of the next organism observed. But my own specialty is the kind of optimization process called intelligence, and even narrower, a particular kind of intelligence called friendly artificial intelligence, of which, I hope, I will be able to obtain especially precise abstract knowledge. Humans in Funny Suits Many times the human species has traveled into space, only to find the stars inhabited by aliens who look remarkably like humans in funny suits, or even humans with a touch of makeup and latex, or just beige Caucasians in fee simple. It's remarkable how the human form is the natural baseline of the universe from which all other alien species are derived via a few modifications. What could possibly explain this fascinating phenomenon? Convergent evolution, of course. Even though these alien life forms evolved on a thousand alien planets completely independently from earthly life, they all turned out the same. Don't be fooled by the fact that a kangaroo, a mammal, resembles us rather less than does a chimp, a primate. Nor by the fact that a frog, amphibians like us are tetrapods, resembles us less than the kangaroo. Don't be fooled by the bewildering variety of the insects who split off from us even longer ago than the frogs. Don't be fooled that insects have six legs and their skeletons on the outside, and a different system of optics and rather different sexual practices. You might think that a truly alien species would be more different from us than we are from insects. As I said, don't be fooled. For an alien species to evolve intelligence, it must have two legs with one knee each attached to an upright torso and must walk in a way similar to us. You see, any intelligence needs hands, so you've got to repurpose a pair of legs for that, and if you don't start with a four-legged being, it can't develop a running gait and walk upright freeing the hands. Or perhaps we should consider as an alternative theory that it's the easy way out to use humans in funny suits. But the real problem is not shape, it is mind. Humans in funny suits is a well-known term in literary science fiction fandom, and it does not refer to something with four limbs that walks upright. An angular creature of pure crystal is a human in a funny suit if she thinks remarkably like a human especially a human of an English-speaking culture of the late 20th, early 21st century. I don't watch a lot of ancient movies. When I was watching the movie Psycho, 1960, a few years back, I was taken aback by the cultural gap between the Americans on the screen and my America. The button-shirted characters of Psycho are considerably more alien than the vast majority of so-called aliens I encounter on TV or the silver screen. To write a culture that isn't just like your own culture, you have to be able to see your own culture as a special case, not as a norm which all other cultures must take as their point of departure. 
Studying history may help, but then it is only little black letters on little white pages, not a living experience. I suspect that it would help more to live for a year in China or Dubai or among the Kung. This I've never done being busy. Occasionally I wonder what things I might not be seeing. Not there, but here. Seeing your humanity as a special case is very much harder than this. In every known culture, humans seem to experience joy, sadness, fear, disgust, anger, and surprise. In every known culture, these emotions are indicated by the same facial expressions. Next time you see an alien, or an AI for that matter, I bet that when it gets angry, and it will get angry, it will show the human universal facial expression for anger. We humans are very much alike under our skulls. That goes with being a sexually reproducing species. You can't have everyone using different complex adaptations. They wouldn't assemble. Do the aliens reproduce sexually, like humans and many insects? Do they share small bits of genetic material, like bacteria? Do they form colonies like fungi? Does the rule of psychological unity apply among them? The only intelligences your ancestors had to manipulate complexly so, and not just tame or catch in nets, the only minds your ancestors had to model in detail were minds that worked more or less like their own. And so we evolved to predict other minds by putting ourselves in their shoes, asking what we would do in their situations. For that which was to be predicted was similar to the predictor. What? you say? I don't assume other people are just like me. Maybe I'm sad and they happen to be angry. They believe other things than I do. Their personalities are different from mine. Look at it this way. A human brain is an extremely complicated physical system. You are not modeling it neuron by neuron or atom by atom. If you came across a physical system as complex as a human brain which was not like you, it would take scientific lifetimes to unravel it. You do not understand how human brains work in an abstract, general sense. You can't build one. And you can't even build a computer model that predicts other brains as well as you predict them. The only reason you can try at all to grasp anything as physically complex and poorly understood as the brain of another human being is that you configure your own brain to imitate it. You empathize, though perhaps not sympathize. You impose on your own brain the shadow of the other mind's anger and the shadow of its beliefs. You may never think the words, what would I do in this situation? But that little shadow of the other mind that you hold within yourself is something animated within your own brain, invoking the same complex machinery that exists in the other person, synchronizing gears you don't understand. You may not be angry yourself, but you know that if you were angry at you, and you believed that you were godless scum, you would try to hurt you. This empathic inference, as I shall call it, works for humans, more or less. But minds with different emotions, minds that feel emotions you've never felt yourself, or that fail to feel emotions you would feel, that's something you can't grasp by putting your brain into the other brain's shoes. I can tell you to imagine an alien that grew up in a universe with four spatial dimensions, instead of three spatial dimensions. But you won't be able to reconfigure your visual cortex to see like that alien would see. I can try to write a story about aliens with different emotions, but you won't be able to feel those emotions, and neither will I. Imagine an alien watching a video of the Marx Brothers and having absolutely no idea what was going on, or why you would actively seek out such a sensory experience because the alien has never conceived of anything remotely like a sense of humor. Don't pity them for missing out. You've never antlered. You might ask, maybe the aliens do have a sense of humor, but you're not telling funny enough jokes. This is roughly the equivalent of trying to speak English very loudly and very slowly in a foreign country on the theory that those foreigners must have an inner ghost that can hear the meaning dripping from your words, inherent in your words, if you can only speak them loud enough to overcome whatever strange barrier stands in the way of your perfectly sensible English. It is important to appreciate that laughter can be a beautiful and valuable thing. 
even if it is not universalizable, even if it is not possessed by all possible minds. It would be our own special part of the gift we give to tomorrow that we can count for something too. It had better, because universalizability is one meta-ethical notion that I can't salvage for you. Universalizability among humans, maybe, but not among all possible minds. And what about minds that don't run on emotional architectures like your own? That don't have things analogous to emotions? No, don't bother explaining why any intelligent mind powerful enough to build complex machines must inevitably have states analogous to emotions. Natural selection builds complex machines without itself having emotions. Now there is a real alien for you. An optimization process that really does not work like you do. Much of the progress in biology since the 1960s has consisted of trying to enforce a moratorium on anthropomorphizing evolution. That was a major academic slap fight, and I'm not sure that sanity would have won the day if not for the availability of crushing experimental evidence backed up by clear math. Getting people to stop putting themselves in alien shoes is a long, hard, uphill slog. I've been fighting that battle on AI for years. Our anthropomorphism runs very deep in us. It cannot be excised by a simple act of will, a determination to say, now I shall stop thinking like a human. Humanity is the air we breathe. It is our generic, the white paper on which we begin our sketches. And we do not think of ourselves as being human when we are being human. It is proverbial in literary science fiction that the true test of an author is their ability to write real aliens, and not just conveniently incomprehensible aliens who, for their own mysterious reasons, do whatever the plot happens to require. Jack Vance was one of the great masters of this art. Vance's humans, if they came from a different culture, are more alien than most aliens. Never read any Vance? I would recommend starting with City of the Shash. Niven and Pornell's The Moat in God's Eye also gets a standard mention here. And conversely, well, I once read a science fiction author, I think Orson Scott Card, say that the all-time low point of television science fiction was the Star Trek episode where parallel evolution has proceeded to the extent of producing aliens who not only look just like humans, who not only speak English, but have also independently rewritten word for word the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. This is the great failure of imagination. Don't think that it's just about science fiction or even just about AI. The inability to imagine the alien is the inability to see yourself, the inability to understand your own specialness. Who can see a human camouflaged against a human background? Optimization and the Intelligence Explosion Among the topics I haven't dealt with yet is the notion of an optimization process. Roughly, this is the idea that your power as a mind is your ability to hit small targets in a large search space. This can be either the space of possible futures, planning, or the space of possible designs, invention. Suppose you have a car, and suppose we already know that your preferences involve travel. Now suppose that you take all the parts in the car, or all the atoms, and jumble them up at random. It's very unlikely that you'll end up with a travel artifact at all, even so much as a wheeled cart, let alone a travel artifact that ranks as high in your preferences as the original car. So, relative to your preference ordering, the car is an extremely improbable artifact. The power of an optimization process is that it can produce this kind of improbability. You can view both intelligence and natural selection as special cases of optimization. Processes that hit, in a large search space, very small targets defined by implicit preferences. Natural selection prefers more efficient replicators. Human intelligences have more complex preferences. Neither evolution nor humans have consistent utility functions, so viewing them as optimization processes is understood to be an approximation. You're trying to get at the sort of work being done, not claim that humans or evolution do this work perfectly. 
This is how I see the story of life and intelligence, as a story of improbably good designs being produced by optimization processes. The improbability here is improbability relative to a random selection from the design space, not improbability in an absolute sense. If you have an optimization process around, then improbably good designs become probable. Looking over the history of optimization on Earth up until now, the first step is to conceptually separate the meta-level from the object level. Separate the structure of optimization from that which is optimized. If you consider biology in the absence of hominids, then on the object level we have things like dinosaurs and butterflies and cats. On the meta level, we have things like sexual recombination and natural selection of asexual populations. The object level, you will observe, is rather more complicated than the meta level. Natural selection is not an easy subject, and it involves math. But if you look at the anatomy of a whole cat, the cat has dynamics immensely more complicated than mutate, recombine, reproduce. This is not surprising. Natural selection is an accidental optimization process that basically just started happening one day in a tidal pool somewhere. A cat is the subject of millions of years and billions of years of evolution. Cats have brains, of course, which operate to learn over a lifetime. But at the end of a cat's lifetime, that information is thrown away, so it does not accumulate. The cumulative effects of cat brains upon the world as optimizers, therefore, are relatively small. Or consider a bee brain, or a beaver brain. A bee builds hives, and a beaver builds dams, but they didn't figure out how to build them from scratch. A beaver can't figure out how to build a hive. A bee can't figure out how to build a dam. So animal brains, up until recently, were not major players in the planetary game of optimization. They were pieces, but not players. Compared to evolution, brains lacked both generality of optimization power, they could not produce the amazing range of artifacts produced by evolution, and cumulative optimization power. Their products did not accumulate complexity over time. For more on this theme, see Protein Reinforcement and DNA Consequentialism. Very recently, Certain animal brains have begun to exhibit both generality of optimization power, producing an amazingly wide range of artifacts and timescales too short for natural selection to play any significant role, and cumulative optimization power, artifacts of increasing complexity as a result of skills passed on through language and writing. Natural selection takes hundreds of generations to do anything and millions of years for de novo complex designs. Human programmers can design a complex machine with a hundred interdependent elements in a single afternoon. This is not surprising since natural selection is an accidental optimization process that basically just started happening one day, whereas humans are optimized optimizer, handcrafted by natural selection over millions of years. The wonder of evolution is not how well it works, but that it works at all without being optimized. This is how optimization bootstrapped itself into the universe, starting, as one would expect, from an extremely inefficient accidental optimization process, which is not the accidental first replicator, mind you, but the accidental first process of natural selection. Distinguish the object level and the meta level. Since the dawn of optimization in the universe, a certain structural commonality has held across both natural selection and human intelligence. Natural selection selects on genes, but generally speaking, the genes do not turn around and optimize natural selection. The invention of sexual recombination is an exception to this rule, and so is the invention of cells and DNA. And you can see both the power and the rarity of such events by the fact that evolutionary biologists structure entire histories of life on Earth around them. But if you step back and take a human standpoint, if you think like a programmer, then you can see that natural selection is still not all that complicated. We'll try bundling different genes together. We'll try separating information storage from moving machinery. We'll try randomly recombining groups of genes. On an absolute scale, these are the sort of bright ideas that any smart hacker comes up with during the first 10 minutes of thinking about system architectures.
Because natural selection started out so inefficient as a completely accidental process, this tiny handful of meta-level improvements feeding back in from the replicators, nowhere near as complicated as the structure of a cat, structure the evolutionary epochs of life on Earth. And after all that, natural selection is still a blind idiot of a god. Gene pools can evolve to extinction, despite all cells and sex. Now, natural selection does feed on itself in the sense that each new adaptation opens up new avenues of further adaptation. But that takes place on the object level. The gene pool feeds on its own complexity, but only thanks to the protected interpreter of natural selection that runs in the background, and that is not itself rewritten or altered by the evolution of species. Likewise, human beings invent sciences and technologies but we have not yet begun to rewrite the protected structure of the human brain itself. We have a prefrontal cortex and a temporal cortex and a cerebellum, just like the first inventors of agriculture. We haven't started to genetically engineer ourselves. On the object level, science feeds on science, and each new discovery paves the way for new discoveries. But all that takes place with a protected interpreter the human brain, running untouched in the background. We have meta-level inventions like science that try to instruct humans in how to think. But the first person to invent Bayes' theorem did not become a Bayesian. They could not rewrite themselves, lacking both that knowledge and that power. Our significant innovations in the art of thinking, like writing and science, are so powerful that they structure the course of human history, but they do not rival the brain itself in complexity, and their effect upon the brain is comparatively shallow. The present state of the art in rationality training is not sufficient to turn an arbitrarily selected mortal into Albert Einstein which shows the power of a few minor genetic quirks of brain design compared to all the self-help books ever written in the 20th century. Because the brain hums away invisibly in the background, people tend to overlook its contribution and take it for granted, and talk as if the simple instruction to test ideas by experiment, or the P is less than 0.05 significance rule, were the same order of contribution as an entire human brain. Try telling chimpanzees to test their ideas by experiment and see how far you get. Now, some of us want to intelligently design an intelligence that would be capable of intelligently redesigning itself, right down to the level of machine code. The machine code at first, and the laws of physics later, would be a protected level of a sort. But that protected level would not contain the dynamic of optimization. The protected levels would not structure the work. The human brain does quite a bit of optimization on its own, and screws up on its own, no matter what you try to tell it in school. But this fully wraparound recursive optimizer would have no protected level that was optimizing. All the structure of optimization would be subject to optimization itself. And that is a sea change which breaks with the entire past since the first replicator, because it breaks the idiom of a protected meta-level. The history of Earth up until now has been a history of optimizers spinning their wheels at a constant rate, generating a constant optimization pressure, and creating optimized products, not at a constant rate, but at an accelerating rate, because of how object-level innovations open up the pathway to other object-level innovations. But that acceleration is taking place with a protected meta-level doing the actual optimizing, like a search that leaps from island to island in the search space, and good islands tend to be adjacent to even better islands. But the jumper doesn't change its legs. Occasionally, a few tiny little changes manage to hit back to the meta-level, like sex or science, and then the history of optimization enters a new epoch, and everything proceeds faster from there. Imagine an economy without investment, or a university without language, a technology without tools to make tools. Once in a hundred million years, or once in a few centuries, someone invents a hammer. That is what optimization has been like on Earth up until now. When I look at the history of Earth, I don't see a history of optimization over time. I see a history of optimization power in and optimized products out. 
Up until now, thanks to the existence of almost entirely protected metal levels, it's been possible to split up the history of optimization into epochs, and within each epoch, graph the cumulative object level optimization over time, because the protected level is running in the background and is not itself changing within an epoch. What happens when you build a fully wraparound, recursively self-improving AI? Then you take the graph of optimization in, optimized out, and fold the graph in on itself, metaphorically speaking. If the AI is weak, it does nothing, because it is not powerful enough to significantly improve itself, like telling a chimpanzee to rewrite its own brain. If the AI is powerful enough to rewrite itself in a way that increases its ability to make further improvements, and this reaches all the way down to the AI's full understanding of its own source code and its own design as an optimizer, then even if the graph of optimization power in and optimized product out looks essentially the same, the graph of optimization over time is going to look completely different from Earth's history so far. People often say something like, but what if it requires exponentially greater amounts of self-rewriting for only a linear improvement? To this, the obvious answer is, natural selection exerted roughly constant optimization power on the hominid line in the course of coughing up humans, and this doesn't seem to have required exponentially more time for each linear increment of improvement. All of this is still mere analogic reasoning. A full, artificial, general intelligence thinking about the nature of optimization and doing its own AI research and rewriting its own source code is not really like a graph of Earth's history folded in on itself. It is a different sort of beast. These analogies are, at best, good for qualitative predictions, and even then, I have a large amount of other beliefs I haven't yet explained, which are telling me which analogies to make, etc. But if you want to know why I might be reluctant to extend the graph of biological and economic growth over time into the future and over the horizon of an AI that thinks at transistor speeds and invents self-replicating molecular nanofactories and improves its own source code, then there's my reason. You are drawing the wrong graph, and it should be optimization power in versus optimized product out, not optimized product versus time. Ghosts in the machine. People hear about friendly AI and say, this is one of the top three initial reactions. Oh, you can try to tell the AI to be friendly, but if the AI can modify its own source code, it'll just remove any constraints you try to place on it. And where does that decision come from? Does it enter from outside causality rather than being an effect of a lawful chain of causes that started with the source code as originally written? Is the AI the ultimate source code of its own free will? A friendly AI is not a selfish AI constrained by a special extra conscience module that overrides the AI's natural impulses and tells it what to do. You just build the conscience, and that is the AI. If you have a program that computes which decision the AI should make, you're done. The buck stops immediately. At this point, I shall take a moment to quote some case studies from the Computer Stupidity site and programming subtopic. I am not linking to this because it is a fearsome time trap. You can Google if you dare. I tutored college students who were taking a computer programming course. A few of them didn't understand that computers are not sentient. More than one person used comments in their Pascal programs to put detailed explanations such as, Now I need you to put these letters on the screen. I asked one of them what the deal was with those comments. The reply, how else is the computer going to understand what I want it to do? Apparently, they would assume that since they couldn't make sense of Pascal, neither could the computer. While in college, I used to tutor in the school's math lab. A student came in because his basic program would not run. He was taking a beginner course, and his assignment was to write a program that would calculate the recipe for oatmeal cookies, depending upon the number of people you're baking for. I looked at his program, and it went something like this. 10. Preheat oven to 350. 20. 
Combine all ingredients in a large mixing bowl. 30. Mix until smooth. An introductory programming student once asked me to look at his program and figure out why it was always churning out zeros as a result of a simple computation. I looked at the program, and it was pretty obvious. Begin. Read. Number of apples. Apples. Read. Number of carrots. Carrots. Read. Price for one apple, A underscore price. Read, price for one carrot, C underscore price. Write, total for apples, A underscore total. Write, total for carrots, C underscore total. Write, total, total. Total equals A underscore total plus C underscore total. A underscore total equals apples, asterisk, A underscore price. C underscore total equals carrots asterisk C underscore price. End. Me. Well, your program can't print correct results before they're computed. Him. Huh? It's logical what the right solution is, and the computer should reorder the instructions the right way. There's an instinctive way of imagining the scenario of programming an AI. It maps onto a similar-seeming human endeavor, telling a human being what to do, like the program is giving instructions to a little ghost that sits inside the machine, which will look over your instructions and decide whether it likes them or not. There is no ghost who looks over the instructions and decides how to follow them. The program is the AI. That doesn't mean the ghost does anything you wish for, like a genie. It doesn't mean the ghost does everything you want the way you want it, like a slave of exceeding docility. It means your instruction is the only ghost that's there, at least at boot time. AI is much harder than people instinctively imagined, exactly because you can't just tell the ghost what to do. You have to build the ghost from scratch, and everything that seems obvious to you, the ghost will not see unless you know how to make the ghost see it. You can't just tell the ghost to see it. You have to create that which sees from scratch. If you don't know how to build something that seems to have some strange ineffable elements like, say, decision-making, then you can't just shrug your shoulders and let the ghost's free will do the job. You're left forlorn and ghostless. There's more to building a chess-playing program than building a really fast processor. So the AI will be really smart and then typing at the command prompt, make whatever chess moves you think are best. You might think that, since the programmers themselves are not very good chess players, any advice they tried to give the electronic superbrain would just slow the ghost down. But there is no ghost. You see the problem. And there isn't a simple spell you can perform to, poof, summon a complete ghost into the machine. You can't say, I summoned the ghost and it appeared. That's cause and effect for you. It doesn't work if you use the notion of emergence or complexity as a substitute for summon, either. You can't give an instruction to the CPU. Be a good chess player. You have to see inside the mystery of chess playing thoughts and structure the whole ghost from scratch. No matter how commonsensical, no matter how logical, no matter how obvious or right or self-evident or intelligent something seems to you, it will not happen inside the ghost, unless it happens at the end of a chain of cause and effect that began with the instructions that you had to decide on, plus any causal dependencies on sensory data that you built into the starting instructions. This doesn't mean you program in every decision explicitly. Deep Blue was a chess player far superior to its programmers. Deep Blue made better chess moves than anything its makers could have explicitly programmed, but not because the programmers shrugged and left it up to the ghost. Deep Blue moved better than its programmers at the end of a chain of cause and effect that began in the programmer's code and proceeded lawfully from there. Nothing happened just because it was so obviously a good move that Deep Blue's ghostly free will took over, without the code and its lawful consequences being involved. If you try to wash your hands of constraining AI, you aren't left with a free ghost like an emancipated slave. 
you are left with a heap of sand that no one has purified into silicon, shaped into a CPU, and programmed to think. Go ahead. Try telling a computer chip, do whatever you want. See what happens? Nothing. Because you haven't constrained it to understand freedom. All it takes is one single step that is so obvious, so logical, so self-evident, that your mind just skips right over it, and you've left the path of AI programmer. It takes an effort, like the one I illustrate in Grasping Slippery Things, to prevent your mind from doing this. Artificial Edition Suppose that human beings had absolutely no idea how they performed arithmetic. Imagine that human beings had evolved rather than having learned the ability to count sheep and add sheep. People using this built-in ability have no idea how it worked, the way Aristotle had no idea how his visual cortex supported his ability to see things. Peano arithmetic as we know it has not been invented. There are philosophers working to formalize numerical intuitions, but they employ notations such as plus hyphen of parentheses 7 comma 6 close parentheses equals 13 to formalize the intuitively obvious fact that when you add 7 plus 6, of course you get 13. In this world, pocket calculators work by storing a giant lookup table of arithmetical facts entered manually by a team of expert artificial arithmeticians for starting values that range between 0 and 100. While these calculators may be helpful in a pragmatic sense, many philosophers argue that they're only simulating additions rather than really adding. No machine can really count. That's why humans have to count 13 sheep before typing 13 into the calculator. Calculators can recite back stored facts, but they can never know what the statement means. If you type in 200 plus 200, the calculator says, error, outrange, when it's intuitively obvious, if you know what the words mean, that the answer is 400. Some philosophers, of course, are not so naive as to be taken in by these intuitions. Numbers are really a purely formal system. The label 37 is meaningful not because of any inherent property of the words themselves, but because the label refers to 37 sheep in the external world. A number is given this referential property by its semantic network of relations to other numbers. That's why in computer programs, the LISP token for 37 doesn't need any internal structure. It's only meaningful because of reference and relation, not some computational property of 37 itself. No one has ever developed an artificial general arithmetician, though of course there are plenty of domain-specific narrow artificial arithmeticians that work on numbers between 20 and 30 and so on. And if you look at how slow progress has been on numbers in the range of 200, then it becomes clear that we're not going to get artificial general arithmetic anytime soon. The best experts in the field estimate it will be at least a hundred years before calculators can add as well as a human 12-year-old. But not everyone agrees with this estimate, or with merely conventional beliefs about artificial arithmetic. It's common to hear statements such as the following. It's a framing problem. What 21 plus equals depends on whether it's plus 3 or plus 4. If we can just get enough arithmetical facts stored to cover the common sense truths that everyone knows, we'll start to see real addition in the network. But you'll never be able to program in that many arithmetical facts by hiring experts to enter them manually. What we need is an artificial arithmetician that can learn the vast network of relations between numbers that humans acquired during their childhood by observing sets of apples. No, what we really need is an Artificial arithmetician that can understand natural language, so that instead of having to be explicitly told that 21 plus 16 equals 37, it can get the knowledge by exploring the web. Frankly, seems to me that you're just trying to convince yourselves that you can solve the problem. None of you really know what arithmetic is, so you're floundering around with these generic sorts of arguments. We need an AA that can learn X. We need an AA that can extract X from the internet. I mean, it sounds good, 
sounds like you're making progress, and it's even good for public relations because everyone thinks they understand the proposed solution, but it doesn't really get you any closer to general edition as opposed to domain-specific edition. Probably we will never know the fundamental nature of arithmetic. The problem is just too hard for humans to solve. That's why we need to develop a general arithmetician the same way nature did, evolution. Top-down approaches have clearly failed to produce arithmetic. We need a bottom-up approach, some way to make arithmetic emerge. We have to acknowledge the basic unpredictability of complex systems. You're all wrong. Past efforts to create machine arithmetic were futile from the start because they just didn't have enough computing power. If you look at how many trillions of synapses there are in the human brain, it's clear that calculators don't have lookup tables anywhere near that large. We need calculators as powerful as a human brain. According to Moore's Law, this will occur in the year 2031 on April 27th between 4 and 4.30 in the morning. I believe that machine arithmetic will be developed when researchers scan each neuron of a complete human brain into a computer so that we can simulate the biological circuitry that performs addition in humans. I don't think we have to wait to scan a whole brain. Neural networks are just like the human brain, and you can train them to do things without knowing how they do them. We'll create programs that will do arithmetic without we, our creators, ever understanding how they do arithmetic. But Gödel's theorem shows that no formal system can ever capture the basic properties of arithmetic. Classical physics is formalizable, so to add two and two, the brain must take advantage of quantum physics. Hey, if human arithmetic were simple enough that we could reproduce it in a computer, we wouldn't be able to count high enough to build computers. Haven't you heard of John Searle's Chinese calculator experiment? Even if you did have a huge set of rules that would let you add 21 and 16, just imagine translating all the words into Chinese, and you can see that there's no genuine addition going on. There are no real numbers anywhere in the system, just labels that humans use for numbers. There's more than one moral to this parable, and I have told it with different morals in different contexts. It illustrates the idea of levels of organization. For example, a CPU can add two large numbers because the numbers aren't black box opaque objects. They're ordered structures of 32 bits. But for purposes of overcoming bias, let us draw two morals. First, the danger of believing assertions you can't regenerate from your own knowledge. Second, the danger of trying to dance around basic confusions. Lest anyone accuse me of generalizing from fictional evidence, both lessons may be drawn from the real history of artificial intelligence as well. The first danger is the object-level problem that the AA devices ran into. They functioned as tape recorders playing back knowledge generated from outside the system, using a process they couldn't capture internally. A human could tell the AA device that 21 plus 16 equals 37, and the AA devices could record this sentence and play it back, or even pattern match 21 plus 16 to output 37, but the AA devices couldn't generate such knowledge for themselves, which is strongly reminiscent of believing a physicist who tells you light is waves, recording the fascinating words and playing them back when someone asks, what is light made of? without being able to generate the knowledge for yourself. The second moral is the meta-level danger that consumed the artificial arithmetic researchers and opinionated bystanders. The danger of dancing around confusing gaps in your knowledge. The tendency to do just about anything except grit your teeth and buckle down and fill in the damn gap. Whether you say, it is emergent, or whether you say, it is unknowable, in neither case are you acknowledging that there is a basic insight required which is possessible, but unpossessed by you. How can you know when you'll have a new basic insight? And there's no way to get one except by banging your head against the problem, learning everything you can about it, studying it from as many angles as possible, perhaps for years. It's not a pursuit that academia is set up to permit, when you need to publish at least one paper per month. It's certainly not something that venture capitalists will fund. You want to either go ahead and build the system now, or give up and do something else instead. 
Look at the comments above. None are aimed at setting out on a quest for the missing insight which would make numbers no longer mysterious, make 27 more than a black box. None of the commenters realized that their difficulties arose from ignorance or confusion in their own minds, rather than an inherent property of arithmetic. They were not trying to achieve a state where the confusing thing ceased to be confusing. If you read Judea Pearl's Probabilistic Reasoning in Intelligent Systems, Networks of Plausible Inference, then you will see that the basic insight behind graphical models is indispensable to problems that require it. It's not something that fits on a t-shirt, I'm afraid, so you'll have to go and read the book yourself. I haven't seen any online popularizations of Bayesian networks that adequately convey the reasons behind the principles, or the importance of the math being exactly the way it is. But Pearl's book is wonderful. There were once dozens of non-monotonic logics awkwardly trying to capture intuitions such as, if my burglar alarm goes off, there was probably a burglar. But if I then learned that there was a small earthquake near my home, there was probably not a burglar. With the graphical model insight in hand, you can give a mathematical explanation of exactly why first-order logic has the wrong properties for the job and express the correct solution in a compact way that captures all the common sense details in one elegant swoop. Until you have that insight, you'll go on patching the logic here, patching it there, adding more and more hacks to force it into correspondence with everything that seems obviously true. You won't know the artificial arithmetic problem is unsolvable without its key. If you don't know the rules, you don't know the rule that says you need to know the rules to do anything. And so, there will be all sorts of clever ideas that seem like they might work, like building an artificial arithmetician that can read natural language and download millions of arithmetical assertions from the internet. And yet, somehow the clever ideas never work. Somehow it always turns out that you couldn't see any reason it wouldn't work because you were ignorant of the obstacles, not because no obstacles existed. Like shooting blindfolded at a distant target. You can fire blind shot after blind shot crying, you can't prove to me that I won't hit the center. But until you take off the blindfold, you're not even in the aiming game. When no one can prove to you that your precious idea isn't right, it means you don't have enough information to strike a small target in a vast answer space. Until you know your idea will work, it won't. From the history of previous key insights in artificial intelligence and the grand messes that were proposed prior to those insights, I derive an important real-life lesson. When the basic problem is your ignorance, Clever strategies for bypassing your ignorance lead to shooting yourself in the foot. Terminal Values and Instrumental Values On a purely instinctive level, any human planner behaves as if they distinguish between means and ends. Want chocolate? There's chocolate at the public supermarket. You can get to the supermarket if you drive one mile south on Washington Avenue, you can drive if you get into the car. You can get into the car if you open the door. You can open the door if you have your car keys. So you put your car keys into your pocket and get ready to leave the house. When suddenly, the word comes on the radio that an earthquake has destroyed all the chocolate at the local Publix. Well, there's no point in driving to the Publix if there's no chocolate there, and no point in getting into the car if you're not driving anywhere. And no point in having car keys in your pocket if you're not driving. So you take the car keys out of your pocket and call the local pizza service and have them deliver a chocolate pizza. Mmm, mmm, delicious. I rarely notice people losing track of plans they devise themselves. People usually don't drive to the supermarket if they know the chocolate is gone. But I've also noticed that when people begin explicitly talking about goal systems, instead of just wanting things, mentioning goals instead of using them, they oft become confused. Humans are experts at planning, not experts on planning. Or there'd be a lot more AI developers in the world. In particular, I've noticed people get confused when, in abstract philosophical discussions rather than everyday life, they consider the distinction between means and ends, more formally between instrumental values and terminal values.
Part of the problem, it seems to me, is that the human mind uses a rather ad hoc system to keep track of its goals. It works, but not cleanly. English doesn't embody a sharp distinction between means and ends. I want to save my sister's life, and I want to administer penicillin to my sister. Use the same word, want. Can we describe in mere English the distinction that is getting lost? As a first stab, instrumental values are desirable strictly conditional on their anticipated consequences. I want to administer penicillin to my sister. Not because a penicillin-filled sister is an intrinsic good, but in anticipation of penicillin curing her flesh-eating pneumonia. If instead you anticipated that injecting penicillin would melt your sister into a puddle like the Wicked Witch of the West, you'd fight just as hard to keep her penicillin free. Terminal values are desirable without conditioning on other consequences. I want to save my sister's life has nothing to do with your anticipating whether she'll get injected with penicillin after that. The first attempt suffers from obvious flaws. If saving my sister's life would cause the earth to be swallowed up by a black hole, then I would go off and cry for a while, but I wouldn't administer penicillin. Does this mean that saving my sister's life was not a terminal or intrinsic value, because it's theoretically conditional on its consequences? Am I only trying to save her life because of my belief that a black hole won't consume the earth afterward? Common sense should say, that's not what's happening. So forget English. We can set up a mathematical description of a decision system in which terminal values and instrumental values are separate and incompatible types, like integers and floating point numbers, in a programming language with no automatic conversion between them. An ideal Bayesian decision system can be set up using only four elements. Outcomes. Type outcome, square brackets. List of possible outcomes. Sister lives, sister dies. Actions. Type action, square brackets. List of possible actions. Administer penicillin. Don't administer penicillin. Utility underline function. Type outcome, arrow pointing right, utility. Utility function that maps each outcome onto a utility. A utility being representable as a real number between negative and positive infinity. Sister lives, arrow pointing to 1. Sister dies, arrow pointing to 0. Conditional, underline probability, underline function. Type action, arrow pointing right. Outcome, arrow pointing right, probability. Conditional probability function that maps each action into a probability distribution over outcomes. A probability being representable as a real number between 0 and 1. Large set. Administer penicillin, arrow pointing to, subset, sister lives, arrow pointing right, 0.9. Underneath that, sister dies, arrow pointing right, 0.1. Inside the same set, don't administer penicillin, arrow pointing toward subset, sister lives, arrow pointing right, 0.3, sister dies, arrow pointing right, 0.7. If you can't read the type system directly, don't worry. I'll always translate into English. For programmers, seeing it described in distinct statements helps to set up distinct mental objects. And the decision system itself? Expected underline utility, action A, arrow pointing right. Underneath, set, sum zero in outcomes. Utility, subset zero. Asterisk, probability, subset zero slash A. The expected utility of an action equals the sum over all outcomes of the utility of that outcome times the conditional probability of that outcome given that action. Set E U administer penicillin equals 0.9. Underneath E U don't administer penicillin equals 0.3. Choose arrow pointing right. Set arg max A in actions expected underline utility subset A. 
pick an action whose expected utility is maximal. Set, return, administer penicillin. For every action calculated the conditional probability of all the consequences that might follow, then add up the utilities of those consequences times their conditional probability, then pick the best action. This is a mathematically simple sketch of a decision system. It is not an efficient way to compute decisions in the real world. What if, for example, you need a sequence of acts to carry out a plan? The formalism can easily represent this by letting each action stand for a whole sequence. But this creates an exponentially large space, like the space of all sentences you can type in 100 letters. As a simple example, if one of the possible acts on the first turn is to shoot my own foot off, a human planner will decide this is a bad idea generally, eliminate all sequences beginning with this action. But we've flattened this structure out of our representation. We don't have sequences of acts, just flat actions. So, yes, there are a few minor complications. Obviously so, or we'd just run out and build a real AI this way. In that sense, it's much the same as Bayesian probability theory itself. But this is one of those times when it's a surprisingly good idea to consider the absurdly simple version before adding in any highfalutin complications. Consider the philosopher who asserts, All of us are ultimately selfish. We care only about our own states of mind. The mother who claims to care about her son's welfare really wants to believe that her son is doing well. This belief is what makes the mother happy. She helps him for the sake of her own happiness, not his. You say, well, suppose the mother sacrifices her life to push her son out of the path of an oncoming truck. That's not going to make her happy, just dead. The philosopher stammers for a few moments, then replies, but she still did it because she valued that choice above others, because of the feeling of importance she attached to that decision. So you say, type error, no constructor found for expected underline utility, arrow pointing right, utility. Allow me to explain that reply. Even our simple formalism illustrates a sharp distinction between expected utility, which is something that actions have, and utility, which is something that outcomes have. Sure, you can map both utilities and expected utilities onto real numbers, but that's like observing that you can map wind speed and temperature onto real numbers. It doesn't make them the same thing. The philosopher begins by arguing that all your utilities must be over outcomes consisting of your state of mind. If this were true, your intelligence would operate as an engine to steer the future into regions where you were happy. Future states would be distinguished by your state of mind. You would be indifferent between any two futures in which you had the same state of mind. And you would, indeed, be rather likely to sacrifice your own life to save another. When we object that people sometimes do sacrifice their lives, the philosopher's reply shifts to discussing expected utilities over actions the feeling of importance she attached to that decision. This is a drastic jump that should make us leap out of our chairs in indignation. Trying to convert an expected underlying utility into a utility would cause an outright error in our programming language. But in English, it all sounds the same. The choices of our simple decision system are those with highest expected underlying utility, but this doesn't say anything whatsoever about where it steers the future. It doesn't say anything about the utilities the decider assigns, or which real-world outcomes are likely to happen as a result. It doesn't say anything about the mind's function as an engine. The physical cause of a physical action is a cognitive state, in our ideal decider and expected underlying utility, and this expected utility is calculated by evaluating a utility function over imagined consequences. To save your son's life, you must imagine the event of your son's life being saved, and this imagination is not the event itself. It's a quotation, like the difference between snow, in quotation marks, and snow.
But that doesn't mean that what's inside the quote marks must itself be a cognitive state. If you choose the action that leads to the future, that you represent with, my son is still alive, then you have functioned as an engine to steer the future into a region where your son is still alive. Not an engine that steers the future into a region where you represent the sentence, my son is still alive. To steer the future there, your utility function would have to return a high utility when fed, my son is still alive. The quotation of the quotation, your imagination of yourself imagining. Recipes make poor cake when you grind them up and toss them in the batter. And that's why it's helpful to consider the simple decision systems first. Mix enough complications into the system, and formerly clear distinctions become harder to see. So now let's look at some complications. Clearly, the utility function, mapping outcomes onto utilities, is meant to formalize what I earlier referred to as terminal values values not contingent upon their consequences. What about the case where saving your sister's life leads to Earth's destruction by a black hole? In our formalism, we've flattened out this possibility. Outcomes don't lead to outcomes. Only actions lead to outcomes. Your sister recovering from pneumonia followed by the Earth being devoured by a black hole would be flattened into a single possible outcome. And where are the instrumental values in this simple formalism? Actually, they've vanished entirely. You see, in this formalism, actions lead directly to outcomes with no intervening events. There's no notion of throwing a rock that flies through the air and knocks an apple off a branch so that it falls to the ground. Throwing the rock is the action, and it leads straight to the outcome of the apple lying on the ground according to the conditional probability function that turns an action directly into a probability distribution over outcomes. In order to actually compute the conditional probability function, and in order to separately consider the utility of a sister's pneumonia and a black hole swallowing Earth, we would have to represent the network structure of causality, the way that events lead to other events, and then the instrumental values would start coming back. If the causal network was sufficiently regular, you could find a state B that tended to lead to C, regardless of how you achieved B. Then if you wanted to achieve C for some reason, you could plan efficiently by first working out a B that led to C, and then an A that led to B. This would be a phenomenon of instrumental value. B would have instrumental value because it led to C. The state C itself might be terminally valued, a term in the utility function over the total outcome. Or C might just be an instrumental value, a node that was not directly valued by the utility function. Instrumental value, in this formalism, is purely an aid to the efficient computation of plans. It can and should be discarded wherever this kind of regularity does not exist. Suppose, for example, that there's some particular value of B that doesn't lead to C. Would you choose an A which led to that B? Or never mind the abstract philosophy. If you wanted to go to the supermarket to get chocolate, and you wanted to drive to the supermarket, and you needed to get into your car, would you gain entry by ripping off the car door with a steam shovel? No. Instrumental value is a leaky abstraction. As we programmers say, you sometimes have to toss away the cached value and compute out the actual expected utility. Part of being efficient without being suicidal is noticing when convenient shortcuts break down. Though this formalism does give rise to instrumental values, it does so only where the requisite regularity exists and strictly as a convenient shortcut in computation. But if you complicate the formalism before you understand the simple version, then you may start thinking that instrumental values have some strange life of their own, even in a normative sense. That once you say B is usually good because it leads to C, you've committed yourself to always try for B even in the absence of C. People make this kind of mistake in abstract philosophy even though they would never, in real life, rip open their car door with a steam shovel. 
You may start thinking that there's no way to develop a consequentialist that maximizes only inclusive genetic fitness, because it will starve unless you include an explicit terminal value for eating food. People make this mistake even though they would never stand around opening car doors all day long for fear of being stuck outside their cars if they didn't have a terminal value for opening car doors. Instrumental values live in the network structure of the conditional probability function. This makes instrumental value strictly dependent on beliefs of fact given a fixed utility function. If I believe that penicillin causes pneumonia and that the absence of penicillin cures pneumonia, then my perceived instrumental value of penicillin will go from high to low. Change the beliefs of fact, change the conditional probability function that associates actions to believed consequences, and the instrumental values will change in unison. In moral arguments, some disputes are about instrumental consequences, and some disputes are about terminal values. If your debating opponent says that banning guns will lead to lower crime, and you say that banning guns will lead to higher crime, then you agree about a superior instrumental value. Crime is bad. But you disagree about which intermediate event lead to which consequences. But I do not think an argument about female circumcision is really a factual argument about how to best achieve a shared value of treating women fairly or making them happy. This important distinction often gets flushed down the toilet in angry arguments. People with factual disagreements and shared values each decide that their debating opponents must be sociopaths. As if your hated enemy, gun control, rights advocates, really wanted to kill people, which should be implausible as realistic psychology. I fear the human brain does not strongly type the distinction between terminal moral beliefs and instrumental moral beliefs. We should ban guns, and we should save lives, don't feel different as moral beliefs, the way that sight feels different from sound. Despite all the other ways that the human goal system complicates everything in sight, this one distinction it manages to collapse into a mishmash of things with conditional value. To extract out the terminal values, we have to inspect this mishmash of valuable things, trying to figure out which ones are getting their value from somewhere else. It's a difficult project. If you say that you want to ban guns in order to reduce crime, it may take a moment to realize that reducing crime isn't a terminal value. It's a superior instrumental value with links to terminal values for human lives and human happinesses. And then the one who advocates gun rights may have links to the superior instrumental value of reducing crime, plus a link to a value for freedom, which might be a terminal value unto them, or another instrumental value. We can't print out our complete network of values derived from other values. We probably don't even store the whole history of how values got there. By considering the right moral dilemmas, would you do X if Y, we can often figure out where our values came from. But even this project itself is full of pitfalls, misleading dilemmas, and gappy philosophical arguments. We don't know what our own values are, or where they came from, and can't find out except by undertaking error-prone projects of cognitive archaeology. Just forming a conscious distinction between terminal value and instrumental value, and keeping track of what it means and using it correctly is hard work. Only by inspecting the simple formalism can we see how easy it ought to be, in principle. And that's to say nothing of all the other complications of the human reward system, the whole use of reinforcement architecture, and the way that eating chocolate is pleasurable, and anticipating eating chocolate is pleasurable, but they're different kinds of pleasures. But I don't complain too much about the mess. Being ignorant of your own values may not always be fun, but at least it's not boring. Leaky generalizations. Are apples good to eat? Usually, but some apples are rotten. Do humans have ten fingers? Most of us do, but plenty of people have lost a finger and nonetheless qualify as human. 
unless you descend to a level of description far below any macroscopic object, below societies, below people, below fingers, below tendon and bone, below cells, all the way down to particles and fields where the laws are truly universal, practically every generalization you use in the real world will be leaky, though there may, of course, be some exceptions to the above rule. Mostly, the way you deal with leaky generalizations is that, well, you just have to deal. If the cookie market almost always closes at 10 p.m. except on Thanksgiving, it closes at 6 p.m., and today happens to be National Native American Genocide Day, you'd better show up before 6 p.m. or you won't get a cookie. Our ability to manipulate leaky generalizations is opposed by need for closure. The degree to which we want to say once and for all that humans have ten fingers and get frustrated when we have to tolerate continued ambiguity. Raising the value of the stakes can increase need for closure, which shuts down complexity tolerance when complexity tolerance is most needed. Life would be complicated even if the things we wanted were simple. They aren't. The leakiness of leaky generalizations about what to do next would leak in from the leaky structure of the real world. Or to put it another way, instrumental values often have no specification that is both compact and local. Suppose there's a box containing a million dollars. The box is locked, not with an ordinary combination lock, but with a dozen keys controlling a machine that can open the box. If you know how the machine works, you can deduce which sequences of key presses will open the box. There's more than one key sequence that can trigger the machine to open the box, but if you press a sufficiently wrong sequence, the machine incinerates the money. And if you don't know about the machine, there's no simple rules like pressing any key three times opens the box, or pressing five different keys with no repetitions incinerates the money. There's a compact, non-local specification of which keys you want to press. You want to press keys such that they open the box. You can write a compact computer program that computes which key sequences are good, bad, or neutral. But the computer program will need to describe the machine, not just the keys themselves. There's likewise a local, non-compact specification of which keys to press a giant lookup table of the results for each possible key sequence. It's a very large computer program, but it makes no mention of anything except the keys. But there's no way to describe which key sequences are good, bad, or neutral, which is both simple and phrased only in terms of the keys themselves. It may be even worse if there are tempting local generalizations which turn out to be leaky. Pressing most keys three times in a row will open the box, but there's a particular key that incinerates the money if you press it just once. You might think you had found a perfect generalization, a locally describable class of sequences that always open the box. When you had merely failed to visualize all the possible paths of the machine, or failed to value all the side effects. The machine represents the complexity of the real world, the openness of the box, which is good, and the incinerator, which is bad, represent the thousand shards of desire that make up our terminal values. The keys represent the actions and policies and strategies available to us. When you consider how many different ways we value outcomes and how complicated are the paths we take to get there, it's a wonder that there exists any such thing as helpful ethical advice of which the strangest of all advices, and yet still helpful, is that the end does not justify the means. But conversely, the complicatedness of action need not say anything about the complexity of goals. You often find people who smile wisely and say, well, morality is complicated. You know, female circumcision is right in one culture and wrong in another. It's not always a bad thing to torture people. How naive you are, how full of need for closure that you think there are any simple rules. You can say unconditionally and flatly that killing anyone is a huge dose of negative terminal utility. Yes, even Hitler. That doesn't mean you shouldn't shoot Hitler. It means that the net instrumental utility of shooting Hitler carries a giant dose of negative utility from Hitler's death and a hugely larger dose of positive utility from all the other lives that would be saved as a consequence. 
Many commit the type error that I warned against in terminal values and instrumental values, and think that if the net consequential expected utility of Hitler's death is conceded to be positive, then the immediate local terminal utility must also be positive, meaning that the moral principle, death is always a bad thing, is itself a leaky generalization. But this is double counting. With utilities instead of probabilities, you're setting up a resonance between the expected utility and the utility, instead of a one-way flow from utility to expected utility. Or maybe it's just the urge toward a one-sided policy debate. The best policy must have no drawbacks. In my moral philosophy, the local negative utility of Hitler's death is stable, no matter what happens to the external consequences and hence to the expected utility. Of course you can set up a moral argument that it's an inherently good thing to punish evil people, even with capital punishment for sufficiently evil people. But you can't carry this moral argument by pointing out that the consequence of shooting a man holding a leveled gun may be to save other lives. This is appealing to the value of life, not appealing to the value of death. If expected utilities are leaky and complicated, it doesn't mean that utilities must be leaky and complicated as well. They might be, but it would be a separate argument. The Hidden Complexity of Wishes I wish to live in the locations of my choice, in a physically healthy, uninjured, and apparently normal version of my current body containing my current mental state, a body which will heal from all injuries at a rate three sigmas faster than the average given the medical technology available to me, and which will be protected from any diseases, injuries, or illnesses causing disability, pain, or degraded functionality, or any sense, organ, or bodily function for more than ten days consecutively, or fifteen days in any year. The Open Source Wish Project, Wish for Immortality, 1.1 there are three kinds of genies. Genies to whom you can safely say, I wish for you to do what I should wish for. Genies for which no wish is safe. And genies that aren't very powerful or intelligent. Suppose your aged mother is trapped in a burning building and it so happens that you're in a wheelchair. You can't rush in yourself. You could cry, get my mother out of that building. But there would be no one to hear. Luckily, you have in your pocket an outcome pump. This handy device squeezes the flow of time, pouring probability into some outcomes, draining it from others. The outcome pump is not sentient. It contains a tiny time machine which resets time unless a specified outcome occurs. For example, if you hooked up the outcome pump's sensors to a coin and specified that the time machine should keep resetting until it sees the coin come up heads, and then you actually flipped the coin, you would see the coin come up heads. The physicists say that any future in which a reset occurs is inconsistent and therefore never happens in the first place, so you aren't actually killing any versions of yourself. Whatever proposition you can manage to input into the outcome pump somehow happens, though not in a way that violates the laws of physics. If you try to input a proposition that's too unlikely, the time machine will suffer a spontaneous mechanical failure before that outcome ever occurs. You can also redirect probability flow in more quantitative ways, using the future function to scale the temporal reset probability for different outcomes. If the temporal reset probability is 99% when the coin comes up heads and 1% when the coin comes up tails, the odds will go from 1 to 1 to 99 to 1 in favor of tails. If you had a mysterious machine that spit out money and you wanted to maximize the amount of money spit out, you would use reset probabilities that diminished as the amount of money increased. For example, Spitting out $10 might have a 99.9999999% reset probability, and spitting out $100 might have a 99.99999% reset probability. This way, you can get an outcome that tends to be as high as possible in the future function, even when you don't know the best attainable maximum. So you desperately yank the outcome pump from your pocket. Your mother is still trapped in the burning building, remember? And try to describe your goal. Get your mother out of the building. 
The user interface doesn't take English inputs. The outcome pump isn't sentient, remember? But it does have 3D scanners for the near vicinity and built-in utilities for pattern matching. So, you hold up a photo of your mother's head and shoulders. Match on the photo. Use object contiguity to select your mother's whole body, not just her head and shoulders, and define the future function using your mother's distance from the building's center. The further she gets from the building's center, the less the time machine's reset probability. You cry, get my mother out of the building, for luck, and press enter. For a moment, it seems like nothing happens. You look around, waiting for the fire truck to pull up and rescuers to arrive, or even just a strong, fast runner to haul your mother out of the building. Boom! With a thundering roar, the gas main under the building explodes. As the structure comes apart in what seems like slow motion, you glimpse your mother's shattered body being hurled high into the air, traveling fast, rapidly increasing its distance from the former center of the building. On the side of the outcome pump is an emergency regret button. All future functions are automatically defined with a huge negative value for the regret button being pressed, a temporal reset probability of nearly one, so that the outcome pump is extremely unlikely to do anything which upsets the user enough to make them press the regret button. You can't ever remember pressing it, but you've barely started to reach for the regret button, and what good will it do now, when a flaming wooden beam drops out of the sky and smashes you flat. Which wasn't really what you wanted, but scores very high in the defined future function. The outcome pump is a genie of the second class. No wish is safe. If someone asked you to get their poor aged mother out of a burning building, you might help, or you might pretend not to hear, but it wouldn't even occur to you to explode the building. Get my mother out of the building sounds like a much safer wish than it really is because you don't even consider the plans that you assign extreme negative values. Consider again the tragedy of group selectionism. Some early biologists asserted that group selection for low subpopulation sizes would produce individual restraint in breeding. And yet actually enforcing group selection in the laboratory produced cannibalism, especially of immature females. It's obvious in hindsight that, given strong selection for small subpopulation sizes, cannibals will outreproduce individuals who voluntarily forego reproductive opportunities. But eating little girls is such an unesthetic solution that Wynne, Edwards, Ali, Brereton, and the other group selectionists simply didn't think of it. They only saw the solutions they would have used themselves. Suppose you try to patch the future function by specifying that the outcome pump should not explode the building. Outcomes in which the building materials are distributed over too much volume will have a weak approximation of one temporal reset probabilities. So your mother falls out of a second-story window and breaks her neck. The outcome pump took a different path through time that still ended up with your mother outside the building, and it still wasn't what you wanted and it still wasn't a solution that would occur to a human rescuer. If only the open-source WISH project had developed a wish to get your mother out of a burning building. I wish to move my mother, defined as the woman who shares half my genes and gave birth to me, to outside the boundaries of the building currently closest to me, which is on fire, but not by exploding the building, nor by causing the walls to crumble so that the building no longer has boundaries, nor by waiting until after the building finishes burning down for a rescue worker to take out the body. All these special cases, the seemingly unlimited number of required patches, should remind you of the parable of artificial addition. Programming and arithmetic expert systems by explicitly adding ever more assertions like 15 plus 15 equals 30, but 15 plus 16 equals 31 instead. How do you exclude the outcome where the building explodes and flings your mother into the sky? You look ahead and you foresee that your mother would end up dead and you don't want that consequence, so you try to forbid the event leading up to it. Your brain isn't hardwired with a specific pre-recorded statement that blowing up a burning building containing my mother is a bad idea. 
And yet, you're trying to pre-record that exact specific statement in the outcome pump's future function. So the wish is exploding, turning into a giant lookup table that records your judgment of every possible path through time. You failed to ask for what you really wanted. You wanted your mother to go on living, but you wished for her to become more distant from the center of the building. Except that's not all you wanted. If your mother was rescued from the building but was horribly burned, the outcome would rank lower in your preference ordering than an outcome where she was rescued safe and sound. So you not only value your mother's life, but also her health. And you value not just her bodily health, but her state of mind. Being rescued in a fashion that traumatizes her, for example, a giant purple monster roaring up out of nowhere and seizing her, is inferior to a fireman showing up and escorting her out through a non-burning route. Yes, we're supposed to stick with physics, but maybe a powerful enough outcome pump has aliens coincidentally showing up in the neighborhood at exactly the same moment. You would certainly prefer her being rescued by the monster to her being roasted alive, however. How about a wormhole spontaneously opening and swallowing her to a desert island? Better than her being dead, but worse than her being alive, well, healthy, untraumatized, and in continual contact with you and the other members of her social network. Would it be okay to save your mother's life at the cost of the family dog's life if it ran to alert a fireman but then got run over by a car? Clearly, yes, but it would be better... Ceteris paribus, to avoid killing the dog. You wouldn't want to swap a human life for hers, but what about the life of a convicted murderer? Does it matter if the murderer dies trying to save her from the goodness of his heart? How about two murderers? If the cost of your mother's life was the destruction of every extant copy, including the memories of Bach's Little Fugue in G minor, would that be worth it? How about if she had a terminal illness and would die anyway in 18 months? If your mother's foot is crushed by a burning beam, is it worthwhile to extract the rest of her? What if her head is crushed, leaving her body? What if her body is crushed, leaving only her head? What if there's a cryonics team waiting outside ready to suspend the head? Is a frozen head a person? Is Terry Shivo a person? How much is a chimpanzee worth? Your brain is not infinitely complicated. There's only a finite Kolmogorov complexity message length, which suffices to describe all the judgments you would make. But just because this complexity is finite does not make it small. We value many things and know they are not reducible to valuing happiness or valuing reproductive fitness. There is no safe wish smaller than an entire human morality. There are too many possible paths through time. You can't visualize all the roads that lead to the destination you give the genie. Maximizing the distance between your mother and the center of the building can be done even more effectively by detonating a nuclear weapon, or at higher levels of genie power flinging her body out of the solar system, or at higher levels of genie intelligence doing something that neither you nor I would think of, just like a chimpanzee wouldn't think of detonating a nuclear weapon. You can't visualize all the paths through time any more than you can program a chess-playing machine by hard-coding a move for every possible board position. And real life is far more complicated than chess. You cannot predict, in advance, which of your values will be needed to judge the path through time that the genie takes, especially if you wish for something longer term or wider range than rescuing your mother from a burning building. I fear the open source wish project is futile, except as an illustration of how not to think about genie problems. The only safe genie is a genie that shares all your judgment criteria, and at that point you can just say, I wish for you to do what I should wish for, which simply runs the genie's should function. Indeed, it shouldn't be necessary to say anything. To be a safe fulfiller of a wish, a genie must share the same values that led you to make the wish. Otherwise, the genie may not choose a path through time that leads to the destination you had in mind, or it may fail to exclude horrible side effects that would lead you to not even consider a plan in the first place. Wishes are leaky generalizations derived from the huge but finite structure that is your entire morality. Only by including this entire structure can you plug all the leaks. With a safe genie, wishing is superfluous. Just run the genie.
Anthropomorphic Optimism The core fallacy of anthropomorphism is expecting something to be predicted by the black box of your brain, when its casual structure is so different from that of a human brain as to give you no license to expect any such thing. The tragedy of group selectionism was a rather extreme error by a group of early, pre-1966, biologists. They believed that predators would voluntarily restrain their breeding to avoid overpopulating their habitat and exhausting the prey population. Later on, when Michael J. Wade actually went out and created in the laboratory the nigh-impossible conditions for group selection, the adults adapted to cannibalize eggs and larvae, especially female larvae. Now, why might the group selectionists have not thought of that possibility? Suppose you were a member of a tribe and you knew that in the near future your tribe would be subjected to a resource squeeze. You might propose, as a solution, that no couple have more than one child. After the first child, the couple goes on birth control, saying, let's all individually have as many children as we can, but then hunt down and cannibalize each other's children, especially the girls, would not even occur to you as a possibility. Think of a preference ordering over solutions relative to your goals. You want a solution as high in this preference ordering as possible. How do you find one? With a brain, of course. Think of your brain as a high-ranking solution generator, a search process that produces solutions that rank high in your innate preference ordering. The solution space on all real-world problems is generally fairly large which is why you need an efficient brain that doesn't even bother to formulate the vast majority of low-ranking solutions. If your tribe is faced with a resource squeeze, you could try hopping everywhere on one leg or chewing off your own toes. These solutions obviously wouldn't work and would incur large costs, as you can see upon examination, but in fact your brain is too efficient to waste time considering such poor solutions. It doesn't generate them in the first place. Your brain, in its search for high-ranking solutions, flies directly to parts of the solution space, like everyone in the tribe gets together and agrees to have no more than one child per couple until the resource squeeze is passed. Such a low-ranking solution as everyone has as many kids as possible, then cannibalize the girls, would not be generated in your search process. But the ranking of an option as low or high is not an inherent property of the option. It is a property of the optimization process that does the preferring, and different optimization processes will search in different orders. So far as evolution is concerned, individuals reproducing to the fullest and then cannibalizing others' daughters is a no-brainer. Whereas individuals voluntarily restraining their own breeding for the good of the group is absolutely ludicrous. Or to say it less anthropomorphically, the first set of alleles would rapidly replace the second in a population, and natural selection has no obvious search order here. These two alternatives seem around equally simple as mutations. Suppose that one of the biologists had said, if a predator population has only finite resources, evolution will craft them to voluntarily restrain their breeding. That's how I'd do it if I were in charge of building predators. This would be anthropomorphism outright, the lines of reasoning naked and exposed. I would do it this way, therefore I infer that evolution will do it this way. One does occasionally encounter the fallacy outright in my line of work, but suppose you say to the one, an AI will not necessarily work like you do. Suppose you say to this hypothetical biologist, Evolution doesn't work like you do. What will the one say in response? I can tell you a reply you will not hear. Oh my, I didn't realize that. One of the steps of my inference was invalid. I will throw away the conclusion and start over from scratch. No. What you'll hear instead is a reason why any AI has to reason the same way as the speaker or a reason why natural selection, following entirely different criteria of optimization and using entirely different methods of optimization, ought to do the same thing that would occur to a human as a good idea. Hence, the elaborate idea that group selection would favor predator groups where the individuals voluntarily forsook reproductive, 
opportunities. The group selectionists went just as far astray in their predictions as someone committing the fallacy outright. Their final conclusions were the same as if they were assuming outright that evolution necessarily thought like themselves, but they erased what had been written above the bottom line of their argument, without erasing the actual bottom line, and wrote in new rationalizations. Now the fallacious reasoning is disguised. The obviously flawed step in the inference has been hidden, even though the conclusion remains exactly the same, and hence in the real world exactly as wrong. But why would any scientist do this? In the end, the data came out against the group selectionists, and they were embarrassed. As I remarked in Fake Optimization Criteria, we humans seem to have evolved an instinct for arguing that our preferred policy arises from practically any criterion of optimization. Politics was a feature of the ancestral environment. We are descended from those who argued most persuasively that the tribe's interest, not just their own interest, required that their hated rival Uglok be executed. We certainly aren't descended from Uglok, who failed to argue that his tribe's moral code, not just his own obvious self-interest, required his survival. And because we can more persuasively argue for what we honestly believe, we have evolved an instinct to honestly believe that other people's goals and our tribe's moral code truly do imply that they should do things our way for their benefit. So the group selectionists, imagining this beautiful picture of predators restraining their breeding, instinctively rationalized why natural selection ought to do things their way, even according to natural selection's own purposes. The foxes will be fitter if they restrain their breeding. No, really. They'll even outbreed other foxes who don't restrain their breeding. Honestly. The problem with trying to argue natural selection into doing things your way is that evolution does not contain that which could be moved by your arguments. Evolution does not work like you do, not even to the extent of having any element that could listen to or care about your painstaking explanation of why evolution ought to do things your way. Human arguments are not even commensurate with the internal structure of natural selection as an optimization process. Human arguments aren't used in promoting alleles, as human arguments would play a causal role in human politics. So instead of successfully persuading natural selection to do things their way, the group selectionists were simply embarrassed when reality came out differently. There's a fairly heavy subtext here about unfriendly AI. But the point generalizes. This is the problem with optimistic reasoning in general. What is optimism? It is ranking the possibilities by your own preference ordering and selecting an outcome high in that preference ordering, and somehow that outcome ends up as your prediction. What kind of elaborate rationalizations were generated along the way is probably not so relevant as one might fondly believe. Look at the cognitive history and its optimism in, optimism out. But nature, or whatever other process is under discussion, is not actually causally choosing between outcomes by ranking them in your preference ordering and picking a high one. So the brain fails to synchronize with the environment, and the prediction fails to match reality. Lost Purposes It was either kindergarten or first grade that I was first asked to pray, given a transliteration of a Hebrew prayer. I asked what the words meant. I was told that so long as I prayed in Hebrew, I didn't need to know what the words meant. It would work anyway. That was the beginning of my break with Judaism. As you read this, some young man or woman is sitting at a desk in a university earnestly studying material they have no intention of ever using and no interest in knowing for its own sake. They want a high-paying job, and the high-paying job requires a piece of paper. And the piece of paper requires a previous master's degree, and the master's degree requires a bachelor's degree, and the university that grants the bachelor's degree requires you to take a class in 12th century knitting patterns to graduate. So they diligently study, intending to forget it all the moment the final exam is administered, but still seriously working away because they want that piece of paper. Maybe you realized it was all madness, but I bet you did it anyway. 
You didn't have a choice, right? A recent study here in the Bay Area showed that 80% of teachers in K-5 reported spending less one hour per week on science, and 16% said they spend no time on science. Why? I'm given to understand the proximate cause is the No Child Left Behind Act and similar legislation. Virtually all classroom time is now spent on preparing for tests mandated at the state or federal level. I seem to recall, though I can't find the source, that just taking mandatory tests was 40% of classroom time in one school. The old Soviet bureaucracy was famous for being more interested in appearances than reality. One shoe factory overfulfilled its quota by producing lots of tiny shoes. Another shoe factory reported cut but unassembled leather as a shoe. The superior bureaucrats weren't interested in looking too hard because they also wanted to report quota overfulfillments. All this was a great help to the comrades freezing their feet off. It is now being suggested in several sources that an actual majority of published findings in medicine, though statistically significant with P is less than 0.05, are untrue. But so long as P is less than 0.05 remains the threshold for publication. Why should anyone hold themselves to higher standards when that requires bigger research grants for larger experimental groups and decreases the likelihood of getting a publication? Everyone knows that the whole point of science is to publish lots of papers, just as the whole point of a university is to print certain pieces of parchment, and the whole point of a school is to pass the mandatory tests that guarantee the annual budget. You don't get to set the rules of the game, and if you try to play by different rules, you'll just lose. Though, for some reason, physics journals require a threshold of P is less than 0.0001, It's as if they conceive of some other purpose to their existence than publishing physics papers. There's chocolate at the supermarket, and you can get to the supermarket by driving, and driving requires that you be in the car, which means opening your car door, which needs keys. If you find there's no chocolate at the supermarket, you won't stand around opening and slamming your car door because the car door still needs opening. I rarely notice people losing track of plans they devised themselves. It's another matter when incentives must flow through large organizations, or worse, many different organizations and interest groups, some of them governmental. Then you see behaviors that would mark literal insanity if they were born from a single mind. Someone gets paid every time they open a car door because that's what's measurable. And this person doesn't care whether the driver ever gets paid for arriving at the supermarket, let alone whether the buyer purchases the chocolate, or whether the eater is happy or starving. From a Bayesian perspective, sub-goals are epiphenomena of conditional probability functions. There is no expected utility without utility. How silly would it be to think that instrumental value could take on mathematical life of its own, leaving terminal value in the dust? It's not sane by decision-theoretical criteria of sanity. But consider the No Child Left Behind Act. The politicians want to look like they're doing something about educational difficulties. The politicians have to look busy to voters this year, not 15 years later when the kids are looking for jobs. The politicians are not the consumers of education. The bureaucrats have to show progress, which means that they're only interested in progress that can be measured this year. They aren't the ones who will end up ignorant of science. The publishers who commission textbooks and the committees that purchase textbooks don't sit in the classrooms bored out of their skulls. The actual consumers of knowledge are the children, who can't pay, can't vote, can't sit on the committees. Their parents care for them, but don't sit in the classes themselves. They can only hold politicians responsible according to surface images of tough-on-education. Politicians are too busy being re-elected to study all the data themselves. They have to rely on surface images of bureaucrats being busy and commissioning studies. It may not work to help any children, but it works to let politicians appear caring. Bureaucrats don't expect to use textbooks themselves, so they don't care if the textbooks are hideous to read, so long as the process by which they are purchased looks good on the surface. The textbook publishers have no motive to produce bad textbooks, but they know that the textbook purchasing committee will be comparing textbooks based on how many different subjects they cover, 
and that the fourth grade purchasing committee isn't coordinated with the third grade purchasing committee, so they cram as many subjects into one textbook as possible. Teachers won't get through a fourth of the textbook before the end of the year, and then the next year's teacher will start over. Teachers might complain, but they aren't the decision makers, and ultimately, it's not their future on the line, which puts sharp bounds on how much effort they'll spend on unpaid altruism. It's amazing when you look at it that way. Consider all the lost information and lost incentives that anything at all remains of the original purpose, gaining knowledge. Though many educational systems seem to be currently in the process of collapsing into a state not much better than nothing. Want to see the problem really solved? Make the politicians go to school. A single human mind can track a probabilistic expectation of utility as it flows through the conditional chances of a dozen intermediate events, including non-local dependencies, places where the expected utility of opening the car door depends on whether there's chocolate in the supermarket. But organizations can only reward today what is measurable today, what can be written into legal contract today, and this means measuring intermediate events rather than their distant consequences, these intermediate measures, in turn, are leaky generalizations, often very leaky. Bureaucrats are untrustworthy genies, for they do not share the values of the wisher. Miyamoto Musashi said, The primary thing when you take a sword in your hands is your intention to cut the enemy, whatever the means. Whenever you parry, hit, spring, strike, or touch the enemy's cutting sword, you must cut the enemy in the same movement. It is essential to attain this. If you think only of hitting, springing, striking, or touching the enemy, you will not be able actually to cut him. More than anything, you must be thinking of carrying your movement through to cutting him. You must thoroughly research this. I wish I lived in an era where I could just tell my readers they have to thoroughly research something, without giving insult. Why would any individual lose track of their purposes in a sword fight? If someone else had taught them to fight, if they had not generated the entire art from within themselves, they might not understand the reason for parrying at one moment, or springing at another moment. They might not realize when the rules had exceptions fail to see the times when the usual method won't cut through. The essential thing in the art of epistemic rationality is to understand how every rule is cutting through to the truth in the same movement. The corresponding essential of pragmatic rationality, decision theory versus probability theory, is to always see how every expected utility cuts through to utility. You must thoroughly research this. C.J. Cherry said, your sword has no blade. It has only your intention. When that goes astray, you have no weapon. I have seen many people go astray when they wish to the genie of an imagined AI, dreaming up wish after wish that seems good to them, sometimes with many patches and sometimes without even that pretense of caution. And they don't jump to the meta level. They don't instinctively look to purpose the instinct that started me down the track to atheism at the age of five. They do not ask, as I reflexively ask, why do I think this wish is a good idea? Will the genie judge likewise? They don't see the source of their judgment, hovering behind the judgment as its generator. They lose track of the ball. They know the ball bounced, but they don't instinctively look back to see where it bounced from, the criterion that generated their judgments. Likewise, with people not automatically noticing when supposedly selfish people give altruistic arguments in favor of selfishness, or when supposedly altruistic people give selfish arguments in favor of altruism. People can handle goal tracking for driving to the supermarket just fine, when it's all inside their own heads, and no genies or bureaucracies or philosophies are involved. The trouble is that real civilization is immensely more complicated than this. Dozens of organizations and dozens of years intervene between the child suffering in the classroom and the new minted college graduate not being very good at their job. But will the interviewer or manager notice if the college graduate is good at looking busy? With every new link that intervenes between the action and its consequence, intention has one more chance to go astray. 
With every intervening link, information is lost. Incentive is lost. And this bothers most people a lot less than it bothers me. Or why were all my classmates willing to say prayers without knowing what they meant? They didn't feel the same instinct to look to the generator. Can people learn to keep their eye on the ball? To keep their intention from going astray? To never spring or strike or touch without knowing the higher goal they will complete in the same movement? People do often want to do their jobs, all else being equal. Can there be such a thing as a sane corporation? A sane civilization, even? That's only a distant dream, but it's what I've been getting at with all of these essays on the flow of intentions, also known as expected utility, also known as instrumental value, without losing purpose, also known as utility, also known as terminal value. Can people learn to feel the flow of parent goals and child goals? To know consciously as well as implicitly the distinction between expected utility and utility. Do you care about threats to your civilization? The worst meta-threat to complex civilization is its own complexity. For that complication leads to the loss of many purposes. I look back and I see that more than anything, my life has been driven by an exceptionally strong abhorrence to lost purposes. I hope it can be transformed to a learnable skill. Part N. A Human's Guide to Words The Parable of the Dagger Once upon a time there was a court jester who dabbled in logic. The jester presented the king with two boxes. Upon the first box was inscribed, Either this box contains an angry frog, or the box with a false inscription contains an angry frog, but not both. On the second box was inscribed, Either this box contains gold, and the box with a false inscription contains an angry frog, or this box contains an angry frog, and the box with a true inscription contains gold. And the jester said to the king, One box contains an angry frog, the other box gold, and one, and only one, of the inscriptions is true. The king opened the wrong box and was savaged by an angry frog. You see, the jester said, let us hypothesize that the first inscription is the true one. Then suppose the first box contains gold. Then the other box would have an angry frog, while the box with a true inscription would contain gold, which would make the second statement true as well. Now hypothesize that the first inscription is false, and that the first box contains gold. Then the second inscription would be, then the king ordered the jester thrown in the dungeons. A day later, the jester was brought before the king in chains and shown two boxes. One box contains a key, said the king, to unlock your chains, and if you find the key, you are free. But the other box contains a dagger for your heart if you fail. And the first box was inscribed, Either both inscriptions are true, or both inscriptions are false. And the second box was inscribed, This box contains the key. The jester reasoned thusly, Suppose the first inscription is true, then the second inscription must also be true. Now suppose the first inscription is false, then again the second inscription must be true. So the second box must contain the key if the first inscription is true, and also if the first inscription is false. Therefore, the second box must logically contain the key. The jester opened the second box and found a dagger, How? cried the jester in horror as he was dragged away. It's logically impossible. It is entirely possible, replied the king. I merely wrote those inscriptions on two boxes, and then I put the dagger in the second one. The Parable of Hemlock All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Aristotle? Socrates raised the glass of hemlock to his lips. Do you suppose, asked one of the onlookers, that even hemlock will not be enough to kill so wise and good a man? No, replied another bystander, a student of philosophy. 
All men are mortal, and Socrates is a man, and if a mortal drink hemlock, surely he dies. Well, said the onlooker, what if it happens that Socrates isn't mortal? Nonsense, replied the student a little sharply. All men are mortal by definition. It is a part of what we mean by the word man. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. It is not merely a guess, but a logical certainty. I suppose that's right, said the onlooker. Oh, look, Socrates already drank the hemlock while we were talking. Yes, he should be keeling over any minute now, said the student. And they waited. And they waited. And they waited. Socrates appears not to be mortal, said the onlooker. Then Socrates must not be a man, replied the student. All men are mortal. Socrates is not mortal, therefore Socrates is not a man. And that is not merely a guess, but a logical certainty. The fundamental problem with arguing that things are true by definition is that you can't make reality go a different way by choosing a different definition. You could reason, perhaps, as follows. All things I have observed which wear clothing speak language, and use tools, have also shared certain other properties as well, such as breathing air and pumping red blood. The last thirty humans belonging to this cluster, whom I observed to drink hemlock, soon fell over and stopped moving. Socrates wears a toga, speaks fluent ancient Greek, and drank hemlock from a cup. So I predict that Socrates will keel over in the next five minutes. But that would be mere guessing. It wouldn't be you know, absolutely and eternally certain. The Greek philosophers, like most pre-scientific philosophers, were rather fond of certainty. Luckily, the Greek philosophers have a crushing rejoinder to your questioning. You have misunderstood the meaning of all humans are mortal, they say. It is not a mere observation. It is part of the definition of the word human. Mortality is one of several properties that are individually necessary and together sufficient to determine membership in the class human. The statement, all humans are mortal, is a logically valid truth, absolutely unquestionable. And if Socrates is human, he must be mortal. It is a logical deduction as certain as certain can be. But then we can never know for certain that Socrates is a human until after Socrates has been observed to be mortal. It does no good to observe that Socrates speaks fluent Greek, or that Socrates has red blood, or even that Socrates has human DNA. None of these characteristics are logically equivalent to mortality. You have to see him die before you can conclude that he was human. And even then it's not infinitely certain what if Socrates rises from the grave a night after you see him die? Or more realistically, what if Socrates is signed up for cryonics? If mortality is defined to mean finite lifespan, then you can never really know if someone was human until you've observed to the end of eternity, just to make sure they don't come back. Or you could think you saw Socrates keel over, but it could be an illusion projected onto your eyes with a retinal scanner. Or maybe you just hallucinated the whole thing. The problem with syllogisms is that they're always valid. All humans are mortal. Socrates is human, therefore Socrates is mortal, is, if you treat it as a logical syllogism, logically valid within our own universe. It's also logically valid within neighboring Everett branches in which, due to a slightly different evolved biochemistry, hemlock is a delicious treat rather than a poison. And it's logically valid even in universes where Socrates never existed, or for that matter, where humans never existed. The Bayesian definition of evidence favoring a hypothesis is evidence which we are more likely to see if the hypothesis is true than if it is false. Observing that a syllogism is logically valid can never be evidence favoring any empirical proposition because the syllogism will be logically valid whether that proposition is true or false. Syllogisms are valid in all possible worlds, and therefore, observing their validity never tells us anything about which possible world we actually live in. This doesn't mean that logic is useless, just that logic can only tell us that which, in some sense, 
we already know. But we do not always believe what we know. Is the number 29,384,209 prime? By virtue of how I define my decimal system and my axioms of arithmetic, I've already determined my answer to this question, but I do not know what my answer is yet, and I must do some logic to find out. Similarly, if I form the uncertain empirical generalization humans are vulnerable to hemlock, and the uncertain empirical guess Socrates is human, logic can tell me that my previous guesses are predicting that Socrates will be vulnerable to hemlock. It's been suggested that we can view logical reasoning as resolving our uncertainty about impossible, possible worlds, eliminating probability mass in logically impossible worlds, which we did not know to be logically impossible. In this sense, logical argument can be treated as observation. But when you talk about an empirical prediction like Socrates is going to keel over and stop breathing, or Socrates is going to do 50 jumping jacks and then compete in the Olympics next year, that is a matter of possible worlds, not impossible possible worlds. Logic can tell us which hypotheses match up to which observations, and it can tell us what these hypotheses predict for the future. It can bring old observations and previous guesses to bear on a new problem. But logic never flatly says, Socrates will stop breathing now. Logic never dictates any empirical question. It never settles any real-world query which could, by any stretch of the imagination, go either way. Just remember the litany against logic. Logic stays true wherever you may go, so logic never tells you where you live. Words as Hidden Inferences Suppose I find a barrel sealed at the top, but with a hole large enough for a hand. I reach in and feel a small, curved object. I pull the object out, and it's blue, a bluish egg. Next, I reach in and feel something hard and flat with edges, which, when I extract it, proves to be a red cube. I pull out eleven eggs and eight cubes, and every egg is blue and every cube is red. Now I reach in and I feel another egg-shaped object. Before I pull it out and look, I have to guess. What will it look like? The evidence doesn't prove that every egg in the barrel is blue and every cube is red. The evidence doesn't even argue this all that strongly. Nineteen is not a large sample size. Nonetheless, I'll guess that this egg-shaped object is blue, or as a runner-up guess, red. If I guess anything else, there's as many possibilities as distinguishable colors. And for that matter, who says the egg has to be a single shade? Maybe it has a picture of a horse painted on. So I say blue with a dutiful patina of humility, for I'm a sophisticated rationalist type person, and I keep track of my assumptions and dependencies, I guess. But I'm aware that I'm guessing, right? But when a large, yellow, striped, feline-shaped object leaps out at me from the shadows, I think, yikes, a tiger! Not, hmm, Objects with the properties of largeness, yellowness, stripedness, and feline shape have previously often possessed the properties hungry and dangerous, and thus, although it is not logically necessary, it may be an empirically good guess that... Ah! <coughs> the human brain, for some odd reason, seems to have adapted to make this inference quickly, automatically, and without keeping explicit track of its assumptions. And if I name the egg-shaped objects blegs, for blue eggs, and the red cubes rubes, then, when I reach in and feel another egg-shaped object, I may think, oh, it's a bleg, rather than considering all that problem of induction stuff. It is a common misconception that you can define a word any way you like. This would be true if the brain treated words as purely logical constructs, Aristotelian classes, and you never took out any more information than you put in. Yet the brain goes on about its work of categorization, whether or not we consciously approve. All humans are mortal, 
Socrates is a human, therefore Socrates is mortal. Thus spake the ancient Greek philosophers. Well, if mortality is part of your logical definition of human, you can't logically classify Socrates as human until you observe him to be mortal. But this is the problem. Aristotle knew perfectly well that Socrates was a human. Aristotle's brain placed Socrates in the human category as efficiently as your own brain categorizes tigers, apples, and everything else in its environment, swiftly, silently, and without conscious approval. Aristotle laid down rules under which no one could conclude Socrates was human until after he died. Nonetheless, Aristotle and his students went on concluding that living people were humans and therefore mortal. They saw distinguishing properties such as human faces and human bodies, and their brains made the leap to inferred properties such as mortality. Misunderstanding the working of your own mind does not, thankfully, prevent the mind from doing its work. Otherwise, Aristotelians would have starved, unable to conclude that an object was edible merely because it looked and felt like a banana. So the Aristotelians went on classifying environmental objects on the basis of partial information, the way people had always done. Students of Aristotelian logic went on thinking exactly the same way, but they had acquired an erroneous picture of what they were doing. If you asked an Aristotelian philosopher whether Carol the grocer was mortal, they would say, yes. If you asked them how they knew, they would say, all humans are mortal, Carol is human, therefore Carol is mortal. Ask them whether it was a guess or a certainty, and they would say it was a certainty. If you ask before the 16th century, at least. Ask them how they knew that humans were mortal, and they would say it was established by definition. The Aristotelians were still the same people. They retained their original natures, but they had acquired incorrect beliefs about their own functioning. They looked into the mirror of self-awareness and saw something unlike their true selves. They reflected incorrectly. Your brain doesn't treat words as logical definitions with no empirical consequences, and so neither should you. The mere act of creating a word can cause your mind to allocate a category and thereby trigger unconscious inferences of similarity, or block inferences of similarity. If I create two labels, I can get your mind to allocate two categories. Notice how I said you and your brain, as if they were different things. Making errors about the inside of your head doesn't change what's there. Otherwise, Aristotle would have died when he concluded that the brain was an organ for cooling the blood. Philosophical mistakes usually don't interfere with blink-of-an-eye perceptual inferences. But philosophical mistakes can severely mess up the deliberate thinking processes that we use to try to correct our first impressions. If you believe that you can define a word any way you like, without realizing that your brain goes on categorizing without your conscious oversight, then you won't take the effort to choose your definitions wisely. Extensions and Intentions What is red? Red is a color. What's a color? A color is a property of a thing. But what is a thing, and what's a property? Soon the two are lost in a maze of words defined in other words, the problem that Stephen Harnad once described as trying to learn Chinese from a Chinese Chinese dictionary. Alternatively, if you asked me, what is red, I could point to a stop sign, then to someone wearing a red shirt, and a traffic light that happens to be red, and blood from where I accidentally cut myself, and a red business card, and then I could call up a color wheel on my computer and move the cursor to the red area. This would probably be sufficient, though if you know what the word no means, the truly strict would insist that I point to the sky and say, no. I think I stole this example from S.I. Hayakawa, though I'm really not sure because I heard this way back in the indistinct blur of my childhood. When I was 12, my father accidentally deleted all my computer files. I have no memory of anything before that. But that's how I remember first learning about the difference between intentional and extensional definition. To give an intentional definition is to define a word or phrase in terms of other words, as a dictionary does. 
to give an extensional definition is to point to examples, as adults do when teaching children. The preceding sentence gives an intentional definition of extensional definition, which makes it an extensional example of intentional definition. In Hollywood rationality, and popular culture generally, rationalists are depicted as word-obsessed, floating in endless verbal space, disconnected from reality. But the actual traditional rationalists have long insisted on maintaining a tight connection to experience. If you look into a textbook of chemistry for a definition of lithium, you may be told that it is that element whose atomic weight is 7 very nearly. But if the author has a more logical mind, he will tell you that if you search among minerals that are vitreous, translucent, gray or white, very hard, brittle, and insoluble, for one which imparts a crimson tinge to an unluminous flame, this mineral being triturated with lime or witherite ratsbane and then fused can be partly dissolved in muriatic acid, and if this solution be evaporated and the residue be extracted with sulfuric acid and duly purified, it can be converted by ordinary methods into a chloride, which being obtained in the solid state, fused, and electrolyzed with half a dozen powerful cells, will yield a globule of a pinkish silvery metal that will float on gasoline, and the material of that is a specimen of lithium. Charles Sanders Pierce That's an example of logical mind, as described by a genuine traditional rationalist, rather than a Hollywood scriptwriter. But note, Pierce isn't actually showing you a piece of lithium. He didn't have pieces of lithium stapled to his book. Rather, he's giving you a treasure map, an intentionally defined procedure, which, when executed, will lead you to an extensional example of lithium. This is not the same as just tossing you a hunk of lithium, but it's not the same as saying atomic weight 7, either though if you had sufficiently sharp eyes saying three protons might let you pick out lithium at a glance. So that is intentional and extensional definition, which is a way of telling someone else what you mean by a concept. When I talked about definitions above, I talked about a way of communicating concepts, telling someone else what you mean by red, tiger, human, or lithium. Now let's talk about the actual concepts themselves. The actual intention of my tiger concept would be the neural pattern in my temporal cortex that inspects an incoming signal from the visual cortex to determine whether or not it is a tiger. The actual extension of my tiger concept is everything I call a tiger. Intentional definitions don't capture entire intentions. Extensional definitions don't capture entire extensions. If I point to just one tiger and say the word tiger, the communication may fail if they think I mean dangerous animal, or male tiger, or yellow thing. Similarly, if I say dangerous yellow black striped animal without pointing to anything, the listener may visualize giant hornets. You can't capture in words all the details of the cognitive concept as it exists in your mind that lets you recognize things as tigers or non-tigers. It's too large, and you can't point to all the tigers you've ever seen, let alone everything you would call a tiger. The strongest definitions use a crossfire of intentional and extensional communication to nail down a concept. Even so, you only communicate maps to concepts or instructions for building concepts. You don't communicate the actual categories as they exist in your mind or in the world. Yes, with enough creativity, you can construct exceptions to this rule, like sentences Eliezer Yudkowsky has published containing the term hieragoloni as of February 4, 2008. I've just shown you this concept's entire extension. But except in mathematics, definitions are usually treasure maps, not treasure. So that's another reason you can't define a word any way you like. You can't directly program concepts into someone else's brain. Even within the Aristotelian paradigm, where we pretend that the definitions are the actual concepts, 
you don't have simultaneous freedom of intention and extension. Suppose I define Mars as a huge red rocky sphere, around a tenth of Earth's mass and 50% further away from the Sun. It's then a separate matter to show that this intentional definition matches some particular extensional thing in my experience, or indeed that it matches any real thing whatsoever. If instead I say, that's Mars, and point to a red light in the night sky, it becomes a separate matter to show that this extensional light matches any particular intentional definition I may propose, or any intentional beliefs I may have, such as, Mars is a god of war. But most of the brain's work of applying intentions happens sub-deliberately. We aren't consciously aware that our identification of a red light as Mars is a separate matter from our verbal definition, Mars is the god of war. No matter what kind of intentional definition I make up to describe Mars, my mind believes that Mars refers to this thingy and that it's the fourth planet in the solar system. When you take into account the way the human mind actually pragmatically works, the notion, I can define a word any way I like, soon becomes, I can believe anything I want about a fixed set of objects, or I can move any object I want in or out of a fixed membership test. Just as you can't usually convey a concept's whole intention in words because it's a big, complicated neural membership test, you can't control the concept's entire intention because it's applied sub-deliberately. This is why arguing that XYZ is true, by definition, is so popular. If definition changes behaved like the empirical nullips they're supposed to be, no one would bother arguing them. But abuse definitions just a little, and they turn into magic wands. In arguments, of course, not in reality. Similarity Clusters once upon a time, the philosophers of Plato's Academy claimed that the best definition of human was a featherless biped. Diogenes of Sinope, also called Diogenes the Cynic, is said to have promptly exhibited a plucked chicken and declared, Here is Plato's man. The Platonists promptly changed their definition to a featherless biped with broad nails. No dictionary, no encyclopedia, has ever listed all the things that humans have in common. We have red blood, five fingers on each of two hands, bony skulls, 23 pairs of chromosomes, but the same might be said of other animal species. We make complex tools to make complex tools. We use syntactical combinatorial language. We harness critical fission reactions as a source of energy. These things may serve out to single out only humans, but not all humans. Many of us have never built a fission reactor. With the right set of necessary and sufficient gene sequences, you could single out all humans, and only humans, at least for now, but it would still be far from all that humans have in common. But so long as you don't happen to be near a plucked chicken, saying look for featherless bipeds may serve to pick out a few dozen of the particular things that are humans, as opposed to houses, vases, sandwiches, cats, colors, or mathematical theorems. Once the definition featherless biped has been bound to some particular featherless bipeds, you can look over the group and begin harvesting some of the other characteristics, beyond mere feather-free two-legginess, that the featherless bipeds seem to share in common. The particular featherless bipeds that you see seem to also use language, build complex tools, speak combinatorial language with syntax, bleed red blood if poked, die when they drink hemlock. Thus the category human grows richer and adds more and more characteristics, and when Diogenes finally presents his plucked chicken, we are not fooled. This plucked chicken is obviously not similar to the other featherless bipeds. If Aristotelian logic were a good model of human psychology, the Platonists would have looked at the plucked chicken and said, Yes, that's a human. What's your point? If the first featherless biped you see is a plucked chicken, then you may end up thinking that the verbal label human denotes a plucked chicken. So I can modify my treasure map to point to featherless bipeds with broad nails, 
And if I am wise, go on to say, see Diogenes over there? That's a human. And I'm a human. And you're a human. And that chimpanzee is not a human, though fairly close. The initial clue only has to lead the user to the similarity cluster, the group of things that have many characteristics in common. After that, the initial clue has served its purpose, and I can go on to convey the new information, humans are currently mortal, or whatever else I want to say about us featherless bipeds. A dictionary is best thought of not as a book of Aristotelian class definitions, but a book of hints for matching verbal labels to similarity clusters, or matching labels to properties that are useful in distinguishing similarity clusters. Typicality and Asymmetrical Similarity Birds fly. Well, except ostriches don't. But which is a more typical bird? A robin or an ostrich? Which is a more typical chair? A desk chair? A rocking chair? Or a beanbag chair? Most people would say that a robin is a more typical bird and a desk chair is a more typical chair. The cognitive psychologists who study this sort of thing experimentally do so under the heading of typicality effects, or prototype effects, Roche and Lloyd, 1978. For example, if you ask subjects to press a button to indicate true or false in response to statements like, a robin is a bird, or a penguin is a bird, reaction times are faster for more central examples. I'm still unpacking my books, but I'm reasonably sure my source on this is Lakoff, 1986. Typicality measures correlate well using different investigative methods. Reaction times are one example. You can also ask people to directly rate on a scale of 1 to 10 how well an example, like a specific robin, fits a category, like bird. So we have a mental measure of typicality which might, perhaps, function as a heuristic, but is there a corresponding bias we can use to pin it down? Well, which of these statements strikes you as more natural? 98 is approximately 100, or 100 is approximately 98. If you're like most people, the first statement seems to make more sense, Sadok, 1977. For similar reasons, people asked to rate how similar Mexico is to the United States gave consistently higher ratings than people asked to rate how similar the United States is to Mexico. Dversky and Gotti, 1978. And if that still seems harmless, a study by Rips, 1975, showed that people were more likely to expect a disease would spread from robins to ducks on an island than from ducks to robins. Now, this is not a logical impossibility, but in a pragmatic sense, whatever difference separates a duck from a robin and would make a disease less likely to spread from a duck to a robin must also be a difference between a robin and a duck and would make a disease less likely to spread from a robin to a duck. Yes, you can come up with rationalizations like, well, there could be more neighboring species of the robins, which would make the disease more likely to spread initially, etc., but be careful not to try too hard to rationalize the probability ratings of subjects who didn't even realize there was a comparison going on. And don't forget that Mexico is more similar to the United States than the United States is to Mexico, and that 98 is closer to 100 than 100 is to 98. A simpler interpretation is that people are using the demonstrated similarity heuristic as a proxy for the probability that a disease spreads and this heuristic is demonstrably asymmetrical. Kansas is unusually close to the center of the United States, and Alaska is unusually far from the center of the United States. So Kansas is probably closer to most places in the U.S., and Alaska is probably farther. It does not follow, however, that Kansas is closer to Alaska than is Alaska to Kansas. But people seem to reason, metaphorically speaking, as if closeness is an inherent property of Kansas and distance is an inherent property of Alaska, so that Kansas is still close, even to Alaska, and Alaska is still distant, even from Kansas. So once again we see that Aristotle's notion of categories, logical classes with membership determined by a collection of properties 
that are individually strictly necessary and together strictly sufficient is not a good model of human cognitive psychology. Science's view has changed somewhat over the last 2,350 years? Who would have thought? We don't even reason as if set membership is a true or false property. Statements of set membership can be more or less true. Note, this is not the same thing as being more or less probable. One more reason not to pretend that you or anyone else is really going to treat words as Aristotelian logical classes. The following article contains three diagram descriptions. If you would like to see them, they may be viewed at lesswrong.com. Neural categories. In disguised queries, I talked about a classification task of blegs and rubes. The typical bleg is blue, egg-shaped, furred, flexible, opaque, glows in the dark, and contains vanadium. The typical rube is red, cube-shaped, smooth, hard, translucent, unglowing, and contains palladium. For the sake of simplicity, let us forget the characteristics of flexibility, hardness, and opaqueness, translucency. This leaves five dimensions in thing space. Color, shape, texture, luminance, and interior. Suppose I want to create an artificial neural network, ANN, to predict unobserved bleg characteristics from observed bleg characteristics. And suppose I'm fairly naive about ANNs. I've read excited popular science books about how neural networks are distributed, emergent, and parallel, just like the human brain. But I can't derive the differential equations for gradient descent in a non-recurrent multi-layer network with sigmoid units, which is actually a lot easier than it sounds. Then I might design a neural network that looks something like this. Network 1 is a hexagon containing a five-pointed star. At the top we have color. Positive is blue, negative red. To the right is luminance. Positive is glow, negative dark. Bottom right is interior. Positive vanadium, negative palladium. Bottom left is texture. Positive is furred, negative is smooth. And to the left is shape. Positive egg, negative cube. Network 1B is also a hexagon with a five-pointed star. To the top is lifespan, positive mortal, negative immortal. To the right, feathers, positive no, negative yes. Bottom right, blood, positive red, negative glows green. Bottom left, legs, positive two, negative 17. And to the left, nails, positive broad, negative talons. Network 1 is for classifying blegs and rubes, but since bleg is an unfamiliar and synthetic concept, I've also included a similar network, 1b, for distinguishing humans from space monsters with input from Aristotle, All Men Are Mortal, and Plato's Academy, a featherless biped with broad nails. A neural network needs a learning rule, the obvious idea is that when two nodes are often active at the same time, we should strengthen the connection between them. This is one of the first rules ever proposed for training a neural network, known as Hebb's rule. Thus, if you often saw things that were both blue and furred, thus simultaneously activating the color node in the positive state and the texture node in the positive state, the connection would strengthen between color and texture so that positive colors activated positive textures and vice versa. If you saw things that were blue and egg-shaped and vanadium-containing, that would strengthen positive mutual connections between color and shape and interior. Let's say you've already seen plenty of blegs and rubes come off the conveyor belt, but now you see something that's furred egg-shaped, and, gasp, reddish-purple, which will model as a color activation level of negative two-thirds. You haven't yet tested the luminance or the interior. What to predict? What to predict? 
What happens then is that the activation levels in Network 1 bounce around a bit. Positive activation flows luminance from shape. Negative activation flows to interior from color. Negative activation flows from interior to luminance. Of course, all these messages are passed in parallel and asynchronously, just like the human brain. Finally, Network 1 settles into a stable state, which has a high positive activation for luminance and interior. The network may be said to expect, though it has not yet seen, that the object will glow in the dark, and that it contains vanadium. And lo, Network 1 exhibits this behavior, even though there's no explicit no that says whether the object is a bleg or not. The judgment is implicit in the whole network, Blegness is an attractor which arises as a result of emergent behavior from the distributed learning rule. Now in real life, this kind of network design, however faddish it may sound, runs into all sorts of problems. Recurrent networks don't always settle right away. They can oscillate or exhibit chaotic behavior or just take a very long time to settle down. This is a bad thing when you see something big and yellow and striped, and you have to wait five minutes for your distributed neural network to settle into the tiger attractor. Asynchronous and parallel it may be, but it's not real time. And there are other problems, like double counting the evidence when messages bounce back and forth. If you suspect that an object glows in the dark, your suspicion will activate belief that the object contains vanadium, which in turn will activate belief that the object glows in the dark. Plus, if you try to scale up Network 1 design, it requires big O of N squared connections, where N is the total number of observables. So what might be a more realistic neural network design? Network 2 is a diagram featuring a center dot surrounded by five dots arranged in star pattern. The center is category, positive bleg, negative rube. Top, color, positive blue, negative red. To the right, luminance, positive glow, negative dark. Bottom right, interior, positive vanadium, negative palladium. Bottom left, texture, positive furred, negative smooth and to the left, shape, positive egg, negative cube. In this network, a wave of activation converges on the central node from any clamped observed nodes and then surges back out again to any unclamped unobserved nodes, which means we can compute the answer in one step rather than waiting for the network to settle an important requirement in biology when the neurons only run at 20 hertz and the network architecture scales as big O to the N rather than big O to the N squared. Admittedly, there are some things you can notice more easily with the first network architecture than the second. Network 1 has a direct connection between every two nodes, so if red objects never glow in the dark, but red furred objects usually have the other bleg characteristics, like egg shape and vanadium, Network 1 can easily represent this. It just takes a very strong direct negative connection from color to luminance, but more powerful positive connections from texture to all other nodes except luminance. Nor is this a special exception to the general rule that blegs glow. Remember, in Network 1, there is no unit that represents blegness. Blegness emerges as an attractor in the distributed network. So yes, those n-squared connections were buying us something, but not very much. Network 1 is not more useful on most real-world problems, where you rarely find an animal stuck halfway between being a cat and a dog. There are also facts that you can't easily represent in Network 1 or Network 2. Let's say sea blue color and spheroid shape, when found together, always indicate the presence of palladium. But when found individually without the other, they are each very strong evidence for vanadium. This is hard to represent in either architecture without extra nodes. 
both Network 1 and Network 2 embody implicit assumptions about what kind of environmental structure is likely to exist. The ability to read this off is what separates the adults from the babes in machine learning. Make no mistake, neither Network 1 nor Network 2 are biologically realistic, but it still seems like a fair guess that however the brain really works, it is in some sense closer to Network 2 than Network 1. Fast, cheap, scalable, works well to distinguish dogs and cats. Natural selection goes for that sort of thing, like water running down a fitness landscape. It seems like an ordinary enough task to classify objects as either blegs or rubes, tossing them into the appropriate bin. But would you notice if sea blue objects never glowed in the dark? Maybe if someone presented you with 20 objects that were alike only in being sea blue and then switched off the light and none of the objects glowed. If you got hit over the head with it, in other words. Perhaps by presenting you with all these sea blue objects in a group, your brain forms a new subcategory and can detect the doesn't glow characteristic within that subcategory, but you probably wouldn't notice if the sea blue objects were scattered among a hundred other blegs and rubes. It wouldn't be easy or intuitive to notice the way that distinguishing cats and dogs is easy and intuitive. Or, Socrates is human, all humans are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. How did Aristotle know that Socrates was human? Well, Socrates had no feathers and broad nails and walked upright and spoke Greek and, well, was generally shaped like a human and acted like one. So the brain decides once and for all that Socrates is human, and from there infers that Socrates is mortal like all other humans, thus yet observed. It doesn't seem easy or intuitive to ask how much wearing clothes, as opposed to using language, is associated with mortality. Just, things that wear clothes and use language are human, and humans are mortal. Are there biases associated with trying to classify things into categories once and for all? Of course there are. See, for example, cultish counter-cultishness. To be continued. The following article contains two descriptions of diagrams. You may view them at lesswrong.com. How an algorithm feels from inside. If a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, does it make a sound? I remember seeing an actual argument get started on this subject, a fully naive argument that went nowhere near Berkeleyan subjectivism. Just, it makes a sound, just like any other falling tree. But how can there be a sound if no one hears? The standard rationalist view would be that the first person is speaking as if sound means acoustic vibrations in the air. The second person is speaking as if sound means an auditory experience in a brain. If you ask, are there acoustic vibrations, or are there auditory experiences, the answer is at once obvious. And so the argument is really about the definition of the word sound. I think the standard analysis is essentially correct. So let's accept that as a premise and ask, why do people get into such an argument? What's the underlying psychology? A key idea of the heuristics and biases program is that mistakes are often more revealing of cognition than correct answers. Getting into a heated dispute about whether if a tree falls in a deserted forest, it makes a sound, is traditionally considered a mistake. So what kind of mind design corresponds to that error? In disguised queries, I introduced the Bleg Rube classification task in which Susan, the senior sorter, explains that your job is to sort objects coming off a conveyor belt, putting the blue eggs, or blegs, into one bin, and the red cubes, or rubes, into the rube bin. This, it turns out, is because blegs contain small nuggets of vanadium ore, and rubes contain small shreds of palladium, both of which are useful industrially. Except that around 2% of blue egg-shaped objects contain palladium instead. So if you find a blue egg-shaped thing that contains palladium, should you call it a rube instead? You're going to put it in the rube bin, 
Why not call it a rube? But when you switch off the light, nearly all blegs glow faintly in the dark. And blue egg-shaped objects that contain palladium are just as likely to glow in the dark as any other blue egg-shaped object. So if you find a blue egg-shaped object that contains palladium and you ask, is it a bleg? The answer depends on what you have to do with the answer. If you ask, which bin does the object go in, then you choose as if the object is a rube. But if you ask, if I turn off the light, will it glow? You predict as if the object is a bleg. In one case, the question, is it a bleg, stands in for the disguised query, which bin does it go in? In the other case, the question, is it a bleg, stands in for the disguised query, will it glow in the dark? Now suppose that you have an object that is blue and egg-shaped and contains palladium, and you have already observed that it is furred, flexible, opaque, and glows in the dark. This answers every query, observes every observable introduced. There's nothing left for a disguised query to stand for. So why might someone feel an impulse to go on arguing whether the object is really a bleg? Network 1 is a hexagon. Enclosed in the hexagon is a five-pointed star. At the top, color, positive blue, negative red. To the right, luminance, positive glow, negative dark. Bottom right, interior, positive vanadium, negative palladium. Bottom left, texture, positive furred, negative smooth. To the left, shape, positive egg, negative cube. Network 2 is a series of points. There is a point in the center, and then there are points arranged around that in a star shape, but there is no hexagon enclosing it. At the center is category, bleg, positive, negative is rube. To the top, color, positive blue, negative red. To the right, luminance, positive glow, negative dark. Bottom right, interior, positive vanadium, negative palladium. Bottom left, texture, positive furred, negative smooth. And left, shape, positive egg, negative cube. This diagram from neural categories shows two different neural networks that might be used to answer questions about blegs and rubes. Network 1 has a number of disadvantages, such as potentially oscillating chaotic behavior or requiring big O to the N squared connections. But Network 1's structure does have one major advantage over Network 2. Every unit in the network corresponds to a testable query. If you observe every observable, clamping every value, there are no units in the network left over. Network 2, however, is a far better candidate for being something vaguely like how the human brain works. It's fast, cheap, scalable, and has an extra dangling unit in the center whose activation can still vary even after we've observed every single one of the surrounding nodes. Which is to say that even after you know whether an object is blue or red, egg or cube, furred or smooth, bright or dark, and whether it contains vanadium or palladium, it feels like there's a leftover, unanswered question. But is it really a bleg? Usually in our daily experience, acoustic vibrations and auditory experience go together. But a tree falling in a deserted forest unbundles this common association. And even after you know that the falling tree creates acoustic vibrations, but not auditory experience, it feels like there's a leftover question. Did it make a sound? We know where Pluto is, and where it's going. We know Pluto's shape, and Pluto's mass. But is it a planet? Now remember, when you look at Network 2, as I've laid it out here, you're seeing the algorithm from the outside. People don't think to themselves, should the central unit fire or not? Any more than you think, should neuron number 12,234,320,242 in my visual cortex fire or not? 
It takes a deliberate effort to visualize your brain from the outside, and then you still don't see your actual brain. You imagine what you think is there, hopefully based on science, but regardless, you don't have any direct access to neural network structures from introspection. That's why the ancient Greeks didn't invent computational neuroscience. When you look at Network 2, you are seeing from the outside, but the way that neural network structure feels from the inside, if you yourself are a brain running that algorithm, is that even after you know every characteristic of the object, you still find yourself wondering, but is it a bleg or not? This is a great gap to cross, and I've seen it stop people in their tracks, because we don't instinctively see our intuitions as intuitions. We just see them as the world. When you look at a green cup, you don't think of yourself as seeing a picture reconstructed in your visual cortex, although that is what you are seeing. You just see a green cup. You think, why look, this cup is green, not the picture in my visual cortex of this cup is green. And in the same way, when people argue over whether the falling tree makes a sound or whether Pluto is a planet, they don't see themselves as arguing over whether a categorization should be active in their neural networks. It seems like either the tree makes a sound or not. We know where Pluto is and where it's going. We know Pluto's shape and Pluto's mass. But is it a planet? And yes, there were people who said this was a fight over definitions. But even that is a Network 2 sort of perspective because you're arguing about how the central unit ought to be wired up. If you were a mind constructed along the lines of Network 1, you wouldn't say, it depends on how you define planet. You would just say, given that we know Pluto's orbit and shape and mass, there is no question left to ask. Or rather, that's how it would feel. It would feel like there was no question left. If you were a mind constructed along the lines of Network 1. Before you can question your intuitions, you have to realize that what your mind's eye is looking at is an intuition. Some cognitive algorithm is seen from the inside, rather than a direct perception of the way things really are. People cling to their intuitions, I think, not so much because they believe their cognitive algorithms are perfectly reliable, but because they can't see their intuitions as the way their cognitive algorithms happen to look from the inside. And so everything you try to say about how the native cognitive algorithm goes astray ends up being contrasted to their direct perception of the way things really are and discarded as obviously wrong. Disputing Definitions I have watched more than one conversation, even conversations supposedly about cognitive science, go the route of disputing over definitions, taking the classic example to be, if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it, does it make a sound? The dispute often follows a course like this. If a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, does it make a sound? Albert. Of course it does. What kind of a silly question is that? Every time I've listened to a tree fall, it made a sound. So I'll guess that other trees falling also make sounds. I don't believe the world changes around when I'm not looking. Barry. Wait a minute. If no one hears it, how can it be a sound? In this example, Barry is arguing with Albert because of a genuinely different intuition about what constitutes a sound. But there's more than one way the standard dispute can start. Barry could have a motive for rejecting Albert's conclusion. Or Barry could be a skeptic who, upon hearing Albert's argument, reflexively scrutinized it for possible logical flaws, and then, on finding a counter-argument, automatically accepted it without applying a second layer of search for a counter-counter-argument, thereby arguing himself into the opposite position. This doesn't require that Barry's prior intuition, the intuition Barry would have had if we'd asked him before Albert spoke, have differed from Albert's. Well, if Barry didn't have a differing intuition before, he sure has one now. Albert, what do you mean there's no sound? The tree's roots snap, the trunk comes crashing down and hits the ground. This generates vibrations that travel through the ground in the air. 
That's where the energy of the fall goes, into heat and sound. Are you saying that if people leave the forest, the tree violates conservation of energy? Barry, but no one hears anything. If there are no humans in the forest, or, for the sake of argument, anything else with a complex nervous system capable of hearing, then no one hears a sound. Albert and Barry recruit arguments that feel like support for their respective positions, describing in more detail the thoughts that cause their sound detectors to fire or stay silent. But so far, the conversation has still focused on the forest rather than definitions. And note that they don't actually disagree on anything that happens in the forest. Albert, this is the dumbest argument I've ever been in. You're a niddle-wicking, fall-humping pickle plumber. Barry, yeah? Well, you look like your face caught on fire and someone put it out with a shovel. Insult has been proffered and accepted. Now, neither party can back down without losing face. Technically, this isn't part of the argument, as rationalists account such things, but it's such an important part of the standard dispute that I'm including it anyway. Albert, the tree produces acoustic vibrations. By definition, that is a sound. Barry, no one hears anything. By definition, that is not a sound. The argument starts shifting to focus on definitions. Whenever you feel tempted to say the words, by definition, in an argument, that is not literally, but pure mathematics. Remember that anything which is true, by definition, is true in all possible worlds, and so observing its truth can never constrain which world you live in. Albert, my computer's microphone can record a sound without anyone being around to hear it, store it as a file, and it's called a sound file. And what's stored in the file is the pattern of vibrations in air, not the pattern of neural firings in anyone's brain. Sound means a pattern of vibrations. Albert deploys an argument that feels like support for the word sound, having a particular meaning. This is a different kind of question from whether acoustic vibrations take place in a forest, but the shift usually passes unnoticed. Barry, oh yeah? Let's just see if the dictionary agrees with you. There's a lot of things I could be curious about in the falling tree scenario. I could go into the forest and look at trees, or learn how to derive the wave equation for changes of air pressure, or examine the anatomy of an ear, or study the neuroanatomy of the auditory cortex. Instead of doing any of these things, I am to consult a dictionary, apparently. Why? Are the editors of the dictionary expert botanists? Expert physicists? Expert neuroscientists? Looking in an encyclopedia might make sense, but why a dictionary? Albert, ha! Definition 2C in Merriam-Webster. Sound, mechanical radiant energy that is transmitted by longitudinal pressure waves in a material medium as air. Barry, ha! Definition 2B in Merriam-Webster. Sound, the sensation perceived by the senses of hearing. Albert and Barry Chorus. Consarn dictionary, this doesn't help at all. Dictionary editors are historians of usage, not legislators of language. Dictionary editors find words in current usage, then write down the words next to a small part of what people seem to mean by them. If there's more than one usage, the editors write down more than one definition. Albert, look. Suppose that I left a microphone in the forest and recorded the pattern of the acoustic vibrations of the tree falling. If I played that back to someone, they'd call it a sound. That's the common usage. Don't go around making up your own wacky definitions. Barry. One, I can define a word any way I like so long as I use it consistently. Two, the meaning I gave was in the dictionary. Three, who gave you the right to decide what is or isn't common usage? There's quite a lot of rationality errors in the standard dispute. Some of them I've already covered, and some of them I've yet to cover, likewise the remedies. But for now, I would just like to point out, in a mournful sort of way, that Albert and Barry seem to agree on virtually every question of what is actually going on inside the forest, and yet it doesn't seem to generate any feeling of agreement. 
Arguing about definitions is a garden path. People wouldn't go down the path if they saw at the outset where it led. If you asked Albert, Barry, why he's still arguing, he'd probably say something like, Barry, Albert, is trying to sneak in his own definition of sound, the scurvy scoundrel, to support his ridiculous point, and I'm here to defend the standard definition. But suppose I went back in time to before the start of the argument. Eliezer appears from nowhere in a peculiar conveyance that looks just like the time machine from the original The Time Machine movie. Barry, gosh, a time traveler. Eliezer, I am a traveler from the future. Hear my words. I have traveled far into the past, around 15 minutes. Albert, 15 minutes? Eliezer, to bring you this message. There is a pause of mixed confusion and expectancy. Eliezer, do you think that sound should be defined to require both acoustic vibrations, pressure waves in air, and also auditory experiences, someone to listen to the sound, or should sound be defined as meaning only acoustic vibrations or only auditory experience? Barry, you went back in time to ask us that? Eliezer, my purposes are my own. Answer. Albert, well, I don't see why it would matter. You can pick any definition so long as you use it consistently. Barry, flip a coin. Uh, flip a coin twice. Eliezer, personally, I'd say that if the issue arises, both sides should switch to describing the event in unambiguous lower-level constituents, like acoustic vibrations or auditory experiences. Or each side could designate a new word, like alberzal and bargulum, to use for what they respectively used to call sound, and then both sides could use the new words consistently. That way, neither side has to back down or lose face, but they can still communicate. And of course, you should try to keep track at all times of some testable proposition that the argument is actually about. Does that sound right to you? Albert, I guess. Barry, why are we talking about this? Eliezer, to preserve your friendship against a contingency you will now never know, for the future has already changed. Eliezer and the machine vanish in a puff of smoke. Barry, where were we again? Albert, oh yeah, if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, does it make a sound? Barry, it makes an alberzal but not a bargulum. What's the next question? This remedy doesn't destroy every dispute over categorizations, but it destroys a substantial fraction. The following article contains the description of a diagram. It may be viewed at lesswrong.com. Feel the meaning. When I hear someone say, oh look, a butterfly, the spoken phonemes butterfly enter my ear and vibrate on my eardrum, being transmitted to the cochlea, tickling auditory nerves that transmit activation spikes to the auditory cortex, where phoneme processing begins, along with recognition of words and reconstruction of syntax, a by no means serial process, and all manner of other complications. But at the end of the day, or rather at the end of the second, I am primed to look where my friend is pointing and see a visual pattern that I will recognize as a butterfly, and I would be quite surprised to see a wolf instead. My friend looks at a butterfly. His throat vibrates and lips move. The pressure waves travel invisibly through the air. My ear hears and my nerves transduce and my brain reconstructs. And lo and behold, I know what my friend is looking at. Isn't that marvelous? If we didn't know about the pressure waves in the air... It would be a tremendous discovery in all the newspapers. Humans are telepathic. Human brains can transfer thoughts to each other. Well, we are telepathic, in fact, but magic isn't exciting when it's merely real and all your friends can do it too. Think telepathy is simple? Try building a computer that will be telepathic with you. Telepathy, or language, or whatever you want to call our partial thought transferability, is more complicated than it looks. 
but it would be quite inconvenient to go around thinking, now I shall partially transduce some features of my thoughts into a linear sequence of phonemes which will invoke similar thoughts in my conversational partner. So the brain hides the complexity, or rather never represents it in the first place, which leads people to think some peculiar thoughts about words. As I remarked earlier, when a large yellow striped object leaps at me, I think, yikes, a tiger, not, hmm, objects with the properties of largeness, yellowness, and stripedness have previously often possessed the properties hungry and dangerous, and therefore, although it is not logically necessary, <laughs> similarly, when someone shouts, yikes, a tiger, Natural selection would not favor an organism that thought, hmm, I have just heard the syllables tie and gur, which my fellow tribe members associate with their internal analogs of my own tiger concept, and which they are more likely to utter if they see an object that categorizes, ah, help, it's got my arm. Considering this as a design constraint on the human cognitive architecture, you wouldn't want any extra steps between when your auditory cortex recognizes the syllables tiger and when the tiger concept gets activated. Going back to the parable of Blegs and Rubes and the centralized network that categorizes quickly and cheaply, you might visualize a direct connection running from the unit that recognizes the syllable Bleg to the unit at the center of the Bleg network, the central unit. The Bleg concept gets activated almost as soon as you hear Susan the Senior Sorter say, Bleg. Description of Network 3. The word Bleg, in quotation marks. We have our five points around a center point. The center being category, positive Bleg, negative Rube. At the top, color, positive blue, negative red. To the right, Luminance, positive glow, negative dark. Bottom right, interior, positive vanadium, negative palladium. Bottom left, texture, positive furred, negative smooth. And to the left, shape, positive egg, negative cube. Again, that is our Network 3 diagram. Or, for purposes of talking, which also shouldn't take eons as soon as you see a blue egg-shaped thing, and the central bleg unit fires, you holler, bleg, to Susan. And what that algorithm feels like from inside is that the label and the concept are very nearly identified. The meaning feels like an intrinsic property of the word itself. The cognoscenti will recognize this as yet another case of E.T. James's mind projection fallacy. It feels like a word has a meaning, as a property of the word itself, just like how redness is a property of a red apple, or mysteriousness is a property of a mysterious phenomenon. Indeed, on most occasions, the brain will not distinguish at all between the word and the meaning, only bothering to separate the two while learning a new language, perhaps. And even then, you'll see Susan pointing to a blue egg-shaped thing and saying, Bleg, and you'll think, I wonder what bleg means, and not I wonder what mental category Susan associates to the auditory label bleg. Consider in this light the part of the standard dispute of definitions where the two parties argue about what the word sound really means, the same way they might argue whether a particular apple is really red or green. Albert, my computer's microphone can record a sound without anyone being around to hear it stored as a file, and it's called a sound file. And what's stored in the file is the pattern of vibrations in air, not the pattern of neural firings in anyone's brain. Sound means a pattern of vibrations. Barry. Oh, yeah? Let's just see if the dictionary agrees with you. Albert feels intuitively that the word sound has a meaning, and that the meaning is acoustic vibrations. Just as Albert feels that a tree falling in the forest makes a sound, rather than causing an event that matches the sound category. Barry, likewise, feels that sound dot meaning double equals auditory experiences. Forest dot sound double equals false.
rather than my brain dot find concept sound double equals concept underline auditory experience concept underline auditory experience dot match forest double equals false which is closer to what's really going on but humans have not evolved to know this any more than humans instinctively know the brain is made of neurons Albert and Barry's conflicting intuitions provide the fuel for continuing the argument in the phase of arguing over what the word sound means, which feels like arguing over a fact like any other fact, like arguing over whether the sky is blue or green. You may not even notice that anything has gone astray until you try to perform the rationalist ritual of stating a testable experiment whose result depends on the facts you're so heatedly disputing. The Argument for Common Usage Part of the standard definitional dispute runs as follows. Albert, look, suppose that I left a microphone in the forest and recorded the pattern of the acoustic vibrations of the tree falling. If I played that back to someone, they'd call it sound. That's the common usage. Don't go around making up your own wacky definitions. Barry. 1. I can define a word any way I like so long as I use it consistently. 2. The meaning I gave was in the dictionary. 3. Who gave you the right to decide what is or isn't common usage? Not all definitional disputes progress as far as recognizing the notion of common usage. More often, I think, someone picks up a dictionary because they believe that words have meanings, and the dictionary faithfully records what this meaning is. Some people even seem to believe that the dictionary determines the meaning, that the dictionary editors are the legislators of language. Maybe because back in elementary school, their authority teacher said that they had to obey the dictionary, that it was a mandatory rule rather than an optional one. Dictionary editors read what other people write and record what the words seem to mean. They are historians. The Oxford English Dictionary may be comprehensive, but never authoritative. But surely there is a social imperative to use words in a commonly understood way? Does not our human telepathy, our valuable power of language, rely on mutual coordination to work? Perhaps we should voluntarily treat dictionary editors as supreme arbiters, even if they prefer to think of themselves as historians, in order to maintain the quiet cooperation on which all speech depends. The phrase authoritative dictionary is almost never used correctly, an example of proper usage being the authoritative dictionary of IEEE standards. The IEEE is a body of voting members who have a professional need for exact agreement on terms and definitions, and so the authoritative dictionary of IEEE standards is actual, negotiated legislation which exerts whatever authority one regards as residing in the IEEE. In everyday life, shared language usually does not arise from a deliberate agreement as of the IEEE. It's more a matter of infection, as words are invented and diffused through the culture. A meme, one might say, following Richard Dawkins 30 years ago, but you already know what I mean, and if not, you can look it up on Google, and then you too will have been infected. Yet, as the example of the IEEE shows, agreement on language can also be a cooperatively established public good. If you and I wish to undergo an exchange of thoughts via language, the human telepathy, then it is in our mutual interest that we use the same word for similar concepts, preferably concepts similar to the limit of resolution in our brain's representation thereof, even though we have no obvious mutual interest in using any particular word for a concept. We have no obvious mutual interest in using the word auto to mean sound or sound to mean auto, but we have a mutual interest in using the same word, whichever word it happens to be. Preferably words we use frequently should be short, but let's not get into information theory just yet. But while we have a mutual interest, it is not strictly necessary that you and I use the similar labels internally. It is only convenient. If I know that to you, auto means sound, 
That is, you associate auto to a concept very similar to the one I associate to sound, then I can say, paper crumpling makes a crackling auto. It requires extra thought, but I can do it if I want. Similarly, if you say, what is the walking stick of a bowling ball dropping on the floor? And I know which concept you associate with the syllables walking stick, then I can figure out what you mean. It may require some thought and give me pause because I ordinarily associate walking stick with a different concept, but I can do it just fine. When humans really want to communicate with each other, we're hard to stop. If we're stuck on a deserted island with no common language, we'll take up sticks and draw pictures in sand. Albert's appeal to the argument from common usage assumes that agreement on language is a cooperatively established public good. Yet Albert assumes this for the sole purpose of rhetorically accusing Barry of breaking the agreement and endangering the public good. Now the falling tree argument has gone all the way from botany to semantics to politics, and so Barry responds by challenging Albert for the authority to define the word. A rationalist, with the discipline of hugging the query active, would notice that the conversation had gone rather far astray. Oh, dear reader, is it all really necessary? Albert knows what Barry means by sound. Barry knows what Albert means by sound. Both Albert and Barry have access to words such as acoustic vibrations or auditory experience, which they already associate to the same concepts, and which can describe events in the forest without ambiguity. If they were stuck on a deserted island trying to communicate with each other, their work would be done. When both sides know what the other side wants to say, and both sides accuse the other side of defecting from common usage, then whatever it is they are about, it is clearly not working out a way to communicate with each other. But this is the whole benefit that common usage provides in the first place. Why would you argue about the meaning of a word, two sides trying to wrest it back and forth, if it's just a namespace conflict that has gotten blown out of proportion and nothing more is at stake, then the two sides need merely generate two new words and use them consistently. Yet often categorizations function as hidden inferences and disguised queries. Is atheism a religion? If someone is arguing that the reasoning methods used in atheism are on a par with the reasoning methods used in Judaism, or that atheism is on a par with Islam in terms of casually engendering violence, then they have a clear argumentative stake in lumping it all together into an indistinct gray blur of faith. Or consider the fight to blend together blacks and whites as people. This would not be a time to generate two words. What's at stake is exactly the idea that you shouldn't draw a moral distinction. But once any empirical proposition is at stake, or any moral proposition, you can no longer appeal to common usage. If the question is how to cluster together similar things for purposes of inference, empirical predictions will depend on the answer, which means that definitions can be wrong. A conflict of predictions cannot be settled by an opinion poll. If you want to know whether atheism should be clustered with supernaturalist religions for purposes of some particular empirical inference, the dictionary can't answer you. If you want to know whether blacks are people, the dictionary can't answer you. If everyone believes that the red light in the sky is Mars, the god of war, the dictionary will define Mars as the god of war. If everyone believes that fire is the release of phlogiston, the dictionary will define fire as the release of phlogiston. There is an art to using words, even when definitions are not literally true or false. They are often wiser or more foolish. Dictionaries are mere histories of past usage. If you treat them as supreme arbiters of meaning, it binds you to the wisdom of the past, forbidding you to do better. Though do take care to ensure, if you must depart from the wisdom of the past, that people can figure out what you're trying to swim. The following article contains mathematical formulas and or diagrams which may be confusing for the listener to follow. To view the article, please go to lesswrong.com and look for empty labels.
empty labels. Consider, yet again, the Aristotelian idea of categories. Let's say that there's some object with properties A, B, C, D, and E. Or at least it looks E-ish. Fred, you mean that thing over there is blue, round, fuzzy, and... Me, in Aristotelian logic, it's not supposed to make a difference what the properties are, or what I call them. That's why I'm just using the letters. Next, I invent the Aristotelian category, Zawa, which describes those objects, all those objects, and only those objects, which have properties A, C, and D. Me. Object 1 is Zawa, B, and E. Fred. And it's blue. I mean, A, too, right? Me. That's implied when I say it's Zawa. Fred. Still, I'd like you to say it explicitly. Me. Okay. Object 1 is A, B, Zawa, and E. Then I add another word, Yoki, which describes all and only objects that are B and E, and the word Zippo, which describes all and only objects which are E, but not D. Me. Object 1 is Zawa and Yoki, but not Zippo. Fred. Wait, is it luminescent? I mean, is it E? Me. Yes, that is the only possibility on the information given. Fred. I'd rather you spelled it out. Me. Fine. Object 1 is A, Zawa, B, Yoki, C, D, E, and not Zippo. Fred. Amazing. You can tell all that just by looking? Impressive, isn't it? Let's invent even more new words. Bolo is A, C, and Yoki. Mun is A, C, and Zippo. And Murlachdonian is Bolo and Mun. Pointlessly confusing? I think so, too. Let's replace the labels with the definitions. Zawa, B, and E becomes the set A, C, D, and independently B and E. Bolo and A becomes the set A, C, also including the set B and E, and the independent A. Merlachdonian becomes the set A, C, including the set B and E, and also the set A, C, which includes the set E, but not D. And the thing to remember about the Aristotelian idea of categories is that set A, C, D is the entire information of Zawa. It's not just that I can vary the label, but that I can get along just fine without any label at all. The rules for Aristotelian classes work purely on structures like set A, C, D. To call one of these structures Zawa, or attach any other label to it, is a human convenience, or inconvenience, which makes not the slightest difference to the Aristotelian rules. Let's say that human is to be defined as a mortal, featherless biped. Then the classic syllogism would have the form all set, mortal, no feathers, bipedal, are mortal. Socrates is a set, mortal, no feathers, bipedal. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. The feat of reasoning looks a lot less impressive now, doesn't it? Here, the illusion of inference comes from the labels, which conceal the premises and pretend to novelty in the conclusion. Replacing labels with definitions reveals the illusion, making visible the tautology's empirical unhelpfulness. You can never say that Socrates is a set, mortal, no feathers, biped, until you have observed him to be mortal. That's an idea which you may have noticed I hate, that you can define a word any way you like. This idea came from the Aristotelian notion of categories, since if you follow the Aristotelian rules exactly and without flaw, which humans never do, Aristotle knew perfectly well that Socrates was human, even though that wasn't justified under his rules. But if some imaginary non-human entity were to follow the rules exactly, they would never arrive at a contradiction. They wouldn't arrive at much of anything. 
They couldn't say that Socrates is a set mortal, no feathers biped, until they observed him to be mortal. But it's not so much that labels are arbitrary in the Aristotelian system, as that the Aristotelian system works fine without any labels at all. It cranks out exactly the same stream of tautologies. They just look a lot less impressive. The labels are only there to create the illusion of inference. So if you're going to have an Aristotelian proverb at all, the proverb should be not, I can define a word any way I like, nor even defining a word never has any consequences, but rather, definitions don't need words. Taboo Your Words In the game Taboo by Hasbro, the objective is for a player to have their partner guess a word written on a card without using that word or five additional words listed on the card. For example, you might have to get your partner to say baseball without using the words sport, bat, hit, pitch, base, or of course, baseball. The existence of this game surprised me when I discovered it. Why wouldn't you just say an artificial group conflict in which you use a long wooden cylinder to whack a thrown spheroid and then run between four safe positions? But then, by the time I discovered the game, I had already been practicing it for years, albeit with a different purpose. Yesterday, we saw how replacing terms with definitions could reveal the empirical, unproductivity of the classical Aristotelian syllogism. All, set, mortal, no feathers, biped, are mortal. Socrates is a, set, mortal, no feathers, biped, therefore Socrates is mortal. But the principle applies much more broadly. Albert, a tree falling in a deserted forest makes a sound. Barry, a tree falling in a deserted forest does not make a sound. Clearly, since one says sound and one says no sound, we must have a contradiction, right? But suppose that they both dereference their pointers before speaking. Albert, a tree falling in a deserted forest matches. Set membership test. This event generates acoustic vibrations. Barry, a tree falling in a deserted forest does not match. Set. Membership test. This event generates auditory experiences. Now there is no longer an apparent collision. All they had to do was prohibit themselves from using the word sound. If acoustic vibrations came into dispute, we would just play taboo again and say pressure waves in a material medium. If necessary, we would play taboo again on the word wave and replace it with the wave equation. Play taboo on auditory experience, and you get that form of sensory processing within the human brain, which takes as input a linear time series of frequency mixes. But suppose, on the other hand, that Albert and Barry were to have the argument, Albert, Socrates matches the concept, set, membership test, this person will die after drinking hemlock. Barry, Socrates matches the concept, set, Membership test. This person will not die after drinking hemlock. Now Albert and Barry have a substantive clash of expectations, a difference in what they anticipate seeing after Socrates drinks hemlock. But they might not notice this if they happen to use the same word human for their different concepts. You get a very different picture of what people agree or disagree about depending on whether you take a label's eye view. Albert says sound. Barry says not sound. So they must disagree. Or taking the test's eye view. Albert's membership test is acoustic vibrations. Barry's is auditory experience. Get together a pack of so decent futurists and ask them if they believe we'll have an artificial intelligence in 30 years, and I would guess that at least half of them will say yes. If you leave it at that, they'll shake hands and congratulate themselves on their consensus. But make the term artificial intelligence taboo, 
and ask them to describe what they expect to see without ever using words like computers or think, and you might find quite a conflict of expectations hiding under that featureless standard word. Likewise, that other term. And see also Shane Legg's compilation of 71 definitions of intelligence. The illusion of unity across religions can be dispelled by making the term God taboo and asking them to say what it is they believe in, or making the word faith taboo and asking them why they believe it, though mostly they won't be able to answer at all because it is mostly profession in the first place and you cannot cognitively zoom in on an audio recording. When you find yourself in philosophical difficulties, the first line of defense is not to define your problematic terms, but to see whether you can think without using those terms at all, or any of their short synonyms, and be careful not to let yourself invent a new word to use instead. Describe outward observables and interior mechanisms. Don't use a single handle, whatever that handle may be. Albert says that people have free will. Barry says that people don't have free will. Well, that will certainly generate an apparent conflict. Most philosophers would advise Albert and Barry to try to define exactly what they mean by free will, on which topic they will certainly be able to discourse at great length. I would advise Albert and Barry to describe what it is they think people do or do not have without using the phrase free will at all. If you want to try this at home, you should also avoid the words choose, act, decide, determined, responsible, or any of their synonyms. This is one of the non-standard tools in my toolbox, and in my humble opinion, it works way, way better than the standard one. It also requires more effort to use. You get what you pay for. Replace the symbol with the substance. What does it take to, as in yesterday's example, see a baseball game as an artificial group conflict in which you use a long wooden cylinder to whack a thrown spheroid and then run between four safe positions? What does it take to play the rationalist version of taboo in which the goal is not to find a synonym that isn't on the card, but to find a way of describing without the standard concept handle? You have to visualize. You have to make your mind's eye see the details as though looking for the first time. You have to perform an original seeing. Is that a bat? No, it's a long, round, tapering wooden rod, narrowing at one end so that a human can grasp and swing it. Is that a ball? No, it's a leather-covered spheroid with a symmetrical stitching pattern, hard but not metal hard, which someone can grasp and throw or strike with a wooden rod or catch. Are those bases? No, they're fixed positions on a game field The players try to run to as quickly as possible because of their safety within the game's artificial rules. The chief obstacle to performing an original seeing is that your mind already has a nice, neat summary, a nice little easy-to-use concept handle, like the word baseball, or bat, or base. It takes an effort to stop your mind from sliding down the familiar path the easy path, the path of least resistance, where the small, featureless word rushes in and obliterates the details you're trying to see. A word itself can have the destructive force of cliché. A word itself can carry the poison of a cached thought. Playing the game of taboo, being able to describe without using the standard pointer label handle, is one of the fundamental rationalist capacities. It occupies the same primordial level as the habit of constantly asking, why? Or, what does this belief make me anticipate? The art is closely related to pragmatism, because seeing in this way often gives you a much closer connection to anticipated experience rather than propositional belief. Reductionism, because seeing in this way often forces you to drop down to a lower level of organization, Look at the parts instead of your eyes skipping over the whole. Hugging the query, because words often distract you from the question you really want to ask. Avoiding cached thoughts, which will rush in using standard words so you can block them by tabooing standard words. The writer's rule of show, don't tell, 
which has power among rationalists, and not losing sight of your original purpose. How could tabooing a word help you keep your purpose? From Lost Purposes As you read this, some young man or woman is sitting at a desk in a university, earnestly studying material they have no intention of ever using and no interest in knowing for its own sake. They want a high-paying job, and the high-paying job requires a piece of paper, and the piece of paper requires a previous master's degree, and the master's degree requires a bachelor's degree, and the university that grants the bachelor's degree requires you to take a class in 12th century knitting patterns to graduate. So they diligently study, intending to forget it all the moment the final exam is administered, but still seriously working away because they want that piece of paper. Why are you going to school? To get an education ending in a degree? Blank out the forbidden words and all their obvious synonyms. Visualize the actual details, and you're much more likely to notice that school currently seems to consist of sitting next to bored teenagers listening to material you already know, that a degree is a piece of paper with some writing on it, and that education is forgetting the material as soon as you're tested on it. Leaky generalizations often manifest through categorizations. People who actually learn in classrooms are categorized as getting an education. So, getting an education must be good. But then anyone who actually shows up at a college will also match against the concept, getting an education, whether or not they learn. Students who understand math will do well on tests. But if you require schools to produce good test scores, they'll spend all their time teaching to the test. A mental category that imperfectly matches your goal can produce the same kind of incentive failure internally. You want to learn, so you need an education. And then as long as you're getting anything that matches against the category education, you may not notice whether you're learning or not. Or you'll notice, but you won't realize you've lost sight of your original purpose because you're getting an education. And that's how you mentally described your goal. To categorize is to throw away information. If you're told that a falling tree makes a sound, you don't know what the actual sound is. You haven't actually heard the tree falling. If a coin lands heads, you don't know its radial orientation. A blue egg-shaped thing may be a bleg, but what if the exact egg shape varies, or the exact shade of blue? You want to use categories to throw away irrelevant information, to sift gold from dust, but often the standard categorization ends up throwing out relevant information too, and when you end up in that sort of mental trouble, the first and most obvious solution is to play taboo. For example, Play taboo is itself a leaky generalization. Hasbro's version is not the rationalist version. They only list five additional banned words on the card, and that's not nearly enough coverage to exclude thinking in familiar old words. What rationalists do would count as playing taboo. It would match against the play taboo concept, but not everything that counts as playing taboo works to force original seeing. If you just think play taboo to force original seeing, you'll start thinking that anything that counts as playing taboo must count as original seeing. The rationalist version isn't a game, which means that you can't win by trying to be clever and stretching the rules. You have to play taboo with a voluntary handicap. Stop yourself from using synonyms that aren't on the card. You also have to stop yourself from inventing a new simple word or phrase that functions as an equivalent mental handle to the old one. You are trying to zoom in on your map, not rename the cities, dereference the pointer, not allocate a new pointer, see the events as they happen, not rewrite the cliché in a different wording. By visualizing the problem in more detail, you can see the lost purpose. Exactly what do you do when you play taboo? What purpose does each and every part serve? If you see your activities and situation originally, you will be able to originally see your goals as well. If you can look with fresh eyes, as though for the first time, you will see yourself doing things that you would never dream of doing if they were not habits. Purpose is lost whenever the substance, learning, knowledge, health, is displaced by the symbol, a degree, a test score, medical care, to heal a lost purpose or a lossy categorization, you must do the reverse. 
replace the symbol with the substance. Replace the signifier with the signified. Replace the property with the membership test. Replace the word with the meaning. Replace the label with the concept. Replace the summary with the details. Replace the proxy question with the real question. Dereference the pointer. Drop into a lower level of organization. Mentally simulate the process instead of naming it. Zoom in on your map. The simple truth was generated by an exercise of this discipline to describe truth on a lower level of organization without invoking terms like accurate, correct, represent, reflect, semantic, believe, knowledge, map, or real. And remember that the goal is not really to play taboo. The word true appears in the text, but not to define truth. It would get a buzzer in Hasbro's game, but we're not actually playing that game. Ask yourself whether the document fulfilled its purpose, not whether it followed the rules. Bayes' rule itself describes evidence in pure math without using words like implies, means, supports, proves, or justifies. Set out to define such philosophical terms, and you'll just go in circles. And then there's the most important word of all to taboo. I've often warned that you should be careful not to overuse it, or even avoid the concept in certain cases. Now you know the real reason why. It's not a bad subject to think about, but your true understanding is measured by your ability to describe what you're doing and why without using that word or any of its synonyms. Fallacies of Compression The map is not the territory, as the saying goes. The only life-size, atomically detailed, 100% accurate map of California is California. But California has important regularities, such as the shape of its highways that can be described using vastly less information, not to mention vastly less physical material than it would take to describe every atom within the state borders. Hence the other saying, the map is not the territory, but you can't fold up the territory and put it in your glove compartment. A paper map of California at a scale of 10 kilometers to 1 centimeter, a million to one, doesn't have room to show the distinct position of two fallen leaves lying a centimeter apart on the sidewalk. Even if the map tried to show the leaves, the leaves would appear as the same point on the map, or rather the map would need a feature size of 10 nanometers, which is a finer resolution than most book printers handle, not to mention human eyes. Reality is very large. Just the part we can see is billions of light years across, but your map of reality is written on a few pounds of neurons folded up to fit inside your skull. I don't mean to be insulting, but your skull is tiny, comparatively speaking. Inevitably, then, certain things that are distinct in reality will be compressed in the same point on your map. But what this feels like from inside is not that you say, oh, look, I'm compressing two things into one point on my map. What it feels like from inside is that there is just one thing and you are seeing it. A sufficiently young child, or a sufficiently ancient Greek philosopher, would not know that there were such things as acoustic vibrations or auditory experiences. There would just be a single thing that happened when a tree fell, a single event called sound. To realize that there are two distinct events underlying one point on your map is an essentially scientific challenge, a big, difficult scientific challenge. Sometimes fallacies of compression result from confusing two known things under the same label. You know about acoustic vibrations, and you know about auditory processing in brains, but you call them both sound, and so confuse yourself. But the more dangerous fallacy of compression arises from having no idea whatsoever that two distinct entities even exist. There is just one mental folder in the filing system labeled sound and everything thought about sound drops into that one folder. It's not that there are two folders with the same label. There's just a single folder. By default, the map is compressed. Why would the brain create two mental buckets when one would serve? Or think of a mystery novel in which the detective's critical insight is that one of the suspects has an identical twin. 
In the course of the detective's ordinary work, his job is just to observe that Carol is wearing red, that she has black hair, that her sandals are leather. But all these are facts about Carol. It's easy enough to question an individual fact like, where's red, Carol, or black hair, Carol. Maybe black hair, Carol, is false. Maybe Carol dyes her hair. Maybe brown hair, Carol. But it takes a subtler detective to wonder if the Carol in Where's Red Carol and Black Hair Carol, the Carol file into which his observations drop, should be split into two files. Maybe there are two Carols, so that the Carol who wore red is not the same woman as the Carol who had black hair. Here it is the very act of creating two different buckets that is the stroke of genius insight. Tis easier to question one's facts than one's ontology. The map of reality contained in a human brain, unlike a paper map of California, can expand dynamically when we write down more detailed descriptions. But what this feels like from inside is not so much zooming in on a map as fissioning an indivisible atom, taking one thing, it felt like one thing, and splitting it into two or more things. Often this manifests in the creation of new words like acoustic vibrations and auditory experiences instead of just sound. Something about creating the new name seems to allocate the new bucket. The detective is liable to start calling one of his suspects Carol Two or the other Carol almost as soon as he realizes that there are two of them. But expanding the map isn't always as simple as generating new city names. It is a stroke of scientific insight to realize that such things as acoustic vibrations or auditory experiences even exist. The obvious modern-day illustration would be words like intelligence or consciousness. Every now and then, one sees a press release claiming that a research has explained consciousness because a team of neurologists investigated a 40 hertz electrical rhythm that might have something to do with cross-modality binding of sensory information, or because they investigated the reticular activating system that keeps humans awake. That's an extreme example, and the usual failures are more subtle, but they are of the same kind. The part of consciousness that people find most interesting is reflectivity, self-awareness, realizing that the person I see in the mirror is me. That and the hard problem of subjective experience is distinguished by Chalmers. We also label conscious as the state of being awake rather than asleep in our daily cycle. But they are all different concepts going under the same name, and the underlying phenomena are different scientific puzzles. You can explain being awake without explaining reflectivity or subjectivity. Fallacies of compression also underlie the bait-and-switch technique in philosophy. You argue about consciousness under one definition, like the ability to think about thinking, and then apply the conclusions to consciousness under a different definition, like subjectivity. Of course, it may be that the two are the same thing, but if so... Genuinely understanding this fact would require first a conceptual split and then a genius stroke of reunification. Expanding your map is, I say again, a scientific challenge, part of the art of science, the skill of inquiring into the world, and of course you cannot solve a scientific challenge by appealing to dictionaries, nor master a complex skill of inquiry by saying, I can define a word any way I like. Where you see a single confusing thing with protean and self-contradictory attributes, it is a good guess that your map is cramming too much into one point. You need to pry it apart and allocate some new buckets. This is not like defining the single thing you see, but it does often follow from figuring out how to talk about the thing without using a single mental handle. So the skill of prying apart the map is linked to the rationalist version of taboo, and to the wise use of words, because words often represent the points on our map, the labels under which we file our propositions, and the buckets into which we drop our information. Avoiding a single word, or allocating new ones, is often part of the skill of expanding the map. Categorizing has consequences. Among the many genetic variations and mutations you carry in your genome, 
there are a very few alleles you probably know, including those determining your blood type, the presence or absence of the A, B, and positive antigens. If you receive a blood transfusion containing an antigen you don't have, it will trigger an allergic reaction. It was Carl Landsteiner's discovery of this fact and how to test for compatible blood types that made it possible to transfuse blood without killing the patient. 1930 Nobel Prize in Medicine. Also, if a mother with blood type A, for example, bears a child with blood type A positive, the mother may acquire an allergic reaction to the positive antigen. If she has another child with blood type A positive, the child will be in danger unless the mother takes an allergic suppressant during pregnancy. Thus, people learn their blood types before they marry. Oh, and also, people with blood type A are earnest and creative, while people with blood type B are wild and cheerful. People with type O are agreeable and sociable, while people with type AB are cool and controlled. You would think that O would be the absence of A and B, while AB would just be A plus B, but no. All this according to the Japanese blood type theory of personality. It would seem that blood type plays the role in Japan that astrological signs play in the West, right down to blood type horoscopes in the daily newspaper. This fad is especially odd because blood types have never been mysterious, not in Japan and not anywhere. We only know blood types even exist thanks to Carl Landsteiner. No mystic witch doctor, no venerable sorcerer ever said a word about blood types. There are no ancient dusty scrolls to shroud the error in the aura of antiquity. If the medical profession claimed tomorrow that it had all been a colossal hoax, we layfolk would not have one scrap of evidence from our unaided senses to contradict them. There's never been a war between blood types. There's never even been a political conflict between blood types. The stereotypes must have arisen strictly from the mere existence of the labels. Now, someone is bound to point out that this is a story of categorizing humans. Does the same thing happen if you categorize plants or rocks or office furniture? I can't recall reading about such an experiment, but of course, that doesn't mean one hasn't been done. I'd expect the chief difficulty of doing such an experiment would be finding a protocol that didn't mislead the subjects into thinking that, since the label was given you, it must be significant somehow. So while I don't mean to update on imaginary evidence, I would predict a positive result for the experiment. I would expect them to find that mere labeling had power over all things, at least in the human imagination. You can see this in terms of similarity clusters. Once you draw a boundary around a group, the mind starts trying to harvest similarities from the group. And unfortunately, the human pattern detectors seem to operate in such overdrive that we see patterns, whether they're there or not. A weakly negative correlation can be mistaken for a strong positive one with a bit of selective memory. You can see this in terms of neural algorithms. Creating a name for a set of things is like allocating a subnetwork to find patterns in them. You can see this in terms of a compression fallacy. Things given the same name end up dumped into the same mental bucket, blurring them together into the same point on the map. Or you can see this in terms of the boundless human ability to make stuff up out of thin air and believe it because no one can prove it's wrong. As soon as you name the category, you can start making up stuff about it. The named thing doesn't have to be perceptible. It doesn't have to exist. It doesn't even have to be coherent. And no, it's not just Japan. Here in the West, a blood type-based diet book called Eat Right for Your Type was a bestseller. Any way you look at it, drawing a boundary in thing space is not a neutral act. Maybe a more cleanly designed, more purely Bayesian AI could ponder an arbitrary class and not be influenced by it. But you, a human, do not have that option. Categories are not static things in the context of a human brain. As soon as you actually think of them, they exert force on your mind. One more reason not to believe you can define a word any way you like. Sneaking in connotations. Yesterday we saw that in Japan, blood types have taken the place of astrology. If your blood type is AB, for example, you're supposed to be cool and controlled. 
So suppose we decided to invent a new word, Wigan, and defined this word to mean people with green eyes and black hair. A green-eyed man with black hair walked into a restaurant. Ha! said Danny, watching from a nearby table. Did you see that? A Wigan just walked into the room. Bloody Wiggins. Commit all sorts of crimes, they do. His sister Erda sighed. You haven't seen him commit any crimes, have you, Danny? Don't need to, Danny said, producing a dictionary. See? It says right here in the Oxford English Dictionary. Wigan. One. A person with green eyes and black hair. He's got green eyes and black hair. He's a Wigan. You're not going to argue with the Oxford English Dictionary, are you? By definition, a green-eyed, black-haired person is a Wigan. But you called him a Wigan, said Erda. That's a nasty thing to say about someone you don't even know. You've got no evidence that he puts too much ketchup on his burgers or that as a kid he used his slingshot to launch baby squirrels. But he is a Wigan, Danny said patiently. He's got green eyes and black hair, right? Just you watch. As soon as his burger arrives, he's reaching for the ketchup. The human mind passes from observed characteristics to inferred characteristics via the medium of words. And all humans are mortal. Socrates is a human. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. The observed characteristics are Socrates, clothes, speech, tool use, and generally human shape. The categorization is human. The inferred characteristic is poisonability by hemlock. Of course, there's no hard distinction between observed characteristics and inferred characteristics. If you hear someone speak, they're probably shaped like a human, all else being equal. If you see a human figure in the shadows, then ceteris paribus, it can probably speak. And yet, some properties do tend to be more inferred than observed you are more likely to decide that someone is human and will therefore burn if exposed to open flame than carry through the inference the other way around. If you look in the dictionary for the definition of human, you're more likely to find characteristics like intelligence and featherless biped, characteristics that are useful for quickly eyeballing what is and isn't a human, rather than the 10,000 connotations from vulnerability to hemlock to overconfidence that we can infer from someone's being human. Why? Perhaps dictionaries are intended to let you match up labels to similarity groups, and so are designed to quickly isolate clusters in thing space. Or perhaps the big, distinguishing characteristics are the most salient, and therefore first to pop into a dictionary editor's mind. I'm not sure how aware dictionary editors are of what they really do. But the upshot is that when Danny pulls out his OED to look up Wigan, he sees listed only the first-glance characteristics that distinguish a Wigan, green eyes and black hair. The OED doesn't list the many minor connotations that have come to attach to this term, such as criminal proclivities, culinary peculiarities, and some unfortunate childhood activities. How did those connotations get there in the first place? Maybe there was once a famous Wigan with those properties. Or maybe someone made stuff up at random and wrote a series of best-selling books about it. The Wigan. Talking to Wiggins. Raising your little Wigan. Wiggins in the bedroom. Maybe even the Wiggins believe it now and act accordingly. As soon as you call some people Wiggins, the word will begin acquiring connotations. But remember the parable of Hemlock. If we go by the logical class definitions, we can never class Socrates as a human until after we observe him to be mortal. Whenever someone pulls a dictionary, they're generally trying to sneak in a connotation, not the actual definition written down in the dictionary. After all, if the only meaning of the word Wigan is green-eyed, black-haired person, then why not just call those people green-eyed, black-haired people? And if you're wondering whether someone is a ketchup reacher, why not ask directly, is he a ketchup reacher? Rather than, is he a Wigan? Note, substitution of substance for symbol. Oh, but arguing the real question would require work. You'd have to actually watch the Wigan to see if he reached for the ketchup. Or maybe see if you can find statistics on how many green-eyed, black-haired people actually like ketchup. At any rate, you wouldn't be able to do it sitting in your living room with your eyes closed. And people are lazy.
They'd rather argue by definition, especially since they think you can define a word any way you like. But of course, the real reason they care whether someone is a Wigan is a connotation, a feeling that comes along with the word that isn't in the definition they claim to use. Imagine Danny saying, look, he's got green eyes and black hair. He's a Wigan. It says so right there in the dictionary. Therefore, he's got black hair. Argue with that if you can. Doesn't have much of a triumphant ring to it, does it? If the real point of the argument actually was contained in the dictionary definition, if the argument genuinely was logically valid, then the argument would feel empty. It would either say nothing new or beg the question. It's only the attempt to smuggle in connotations not explicitly listed in the definition that makes anyone feel they can score a point that way. Where to draw the boundary? The one comes to you and says, Long have I pondered the meaning of the word art, and at last I've found what seems to me a satisfactory definition. Art is that which is designed for the purpose of creating a reaction in an audience. Just because there's a word art doesn't mean that it has a meaning floating out there in the void which you can discover by finding the right definition. It feels that way, but it is not so. Wondering how to define a word means you're looking at the problem the wrong way, searching for the mysterious essence of what is, in fact, a communication signal. Now, there is a real challenge which a rationalist may legitimately attack, but the challenge is not to find a satisfactory definition of a word. The real challenge can be played as a single-player game, without speaking aloud. The challenge is figuring out which things are similar to each other, which things are clustered together, and sometimes which things have a common cause. If you define electromagnetism to include lightning, include compasses, exclude light, and include Mesmer's animal magnetism, what we now call hypnosis, then you will have some trouble asking, how does electromagnetism work? You have lumped together things which do not belong together and excluded others that would be needed to complete a set. This example is historically plausible. Mesmer came before Faraday. We could say that electromagnetism is a wrong word, a boundary in thing space that loops around and swerves through the clusters a cut that fails to carve reality along its natural joints. Figuring where to cut reality in order to carve along the joints, this is the problem worthy of a rationalist. It is what people should be trying to do when they set out in search of the floating essence of a word. And make no mistake, it is a scientific challenge to realize that you need a single word to describe breathing and fire. So do not think to consult the dictionary editors, for that is not their job. What is art? But there is no essence of the word floating in the void. Perhaps you come to me with a long list of things that you call art and not art. The little fugue in G minor, art. A punch in the nose, not art. Escher's relativity, art. A flower, not art. A python programming language, art. A cross floating in urine, not art. Jack Vance's chai novels, art. Modern art, not art. And you say to me, it feels intuitive to me to draw this boundary, but I don't know why. Can you find me an intention that matches this extension? Can you give me a simple description of this boundary? So I reply, I think it has to do with admiration of craftsmanship, work going in and wonder coming out, what the included items have in common is the similar aesthetic emotions that they inspire and the deliberate human effort that went into them with the intent of producing such an emotion. Is this helpful or is it just cheating at taboo? I would argue that the list of which human emotions are or are not aesthetic is far more compact than the list of everything that is or isn't art. 
you might be able to see those emotions lighting up a functional MRI scan. I say this by way of emphasizing that emotions are not ethereal. But of course, my definition of art is not the real point. The real point is that you could well dispute either the intention or the extension of my definition. You could say, aesthetic emotion is not what these things have in common. What they have in common is an intent to inspire any complex emotion for the sake of inspiring it. That would be disputing my intention, my attempt to draw a curve through the data points. You would say, your equation may roughly fit those points, but it is not the true generating distribution. Or you could dispute my extension by saying, some of these things do belong together. I can see what you're getting at, but the Python language shouldn't be on the list, and modern art should be. This would mark you as a gullible Philistine, but you could argue it. Here the presumption is that there is indeed an underlying curve that generates this apparent list of similar and dissimilar things, that there is a rhyme and reason, even though you haven't said yet where it comes from. But I have unwittingly lost the rhythm and included some data points from a different generator. Long before you know what it is that electricity and magnetism have in common, you might still suspect, based on surface appearances, that animal magnetism does not belong on the list. Once upon a time, it was thought that the word fish included dolphins. Now you could play the oh-so-clever arguer and say the list, set salmon, guppies, sharks, dolphins, trout, is just a list. You can't say that a list is wrong. I can prove in set theory that this list exists. So my definition of fish, which is simply this extensional list, cannot possibly be wrong as you claim. Or you could stop playing nitwit games and admit that dolphins don't belong on the fish list. You come up with a list of things that feel similar and take a guess at why this is so. But when you finally discover what they really have in common, it may turn out that your guess was wrong. It may even turn out that your list was wrong. You cannot hide behind a comforting shield of correct by definition. Both extensional definitions and intentional definitions can be wrong, can fail to carve reality at the joints. Categorizing is a guessing endeavor in which you can make mistakes, so it's wise to be able to admit from a theoretical standpoint that your definition guesses can be mistaken. The following article contains a large amount of mathematics which the listener may find confusing. If need be, the article may be viewed at lesswrong.com. Entropy and short codes. Suppose you have a system, X, that's equally likely to be in any of eight possible states. X space 1, X space 2, X space 3, X space 4, X space 5, X space 6, X base 7, X base 8. There's an extraordinarily ubiquitous quantity in physics, mathematics, and even biology called entropy. And the entropy of X is 3 bits. This means that, on average, we'll have to ask three yes or no questions to find out X's value. For example, someone could tell us X's value using this code. X base 1. 0, 0, 001 x base 2 0, 1, 0. x base 3 0, 1, 1. x base 4 1, 0, 0. x base 5 1, 0, 1. x base 6 1, 1, 0. x base 7 1, 1, 1. x base 8 0, 0, 0. so if i asked is the first symbol 1 and heard yes then asked, is the second symbol 1, and heard no. Then asked, is the third symbol 1, and heard no. I would know that X was in state 4. Now suppose that the system Y has four possible states with the following probabilities. Y base 1, 1 half, 50%. Y base 2, 1 fourth, 25%. Y base 3, 1 eighth. 12.5%. Y base 4, 
one eighth, twelve point five per cent. Then the entropy of Y would be one point seven five bits, meaning that we can find out its value by asking one point seven five yes or no questions. What does it mean to talk about asking one and three fourths of a question? Imagine that we designate the states of Y using the following code Y base one, one. Y base 2, 0, 1. Y base 3, 0, 0, 1. Y base 4, 0, 0, 0. First you ask, is the first symbol 1? If the answer is yes, you're done. Y is in state 1. This happens half the time, so 50% of the time. It takes one yes or no question to find out Y's state. Suppose that instead the answer is no. Then you ask, is the second symbol 1? If the answer is yes, you're done. Y is in state 2. Y is in state 2 with probability 1 fourth. And each time Y is in state 2, we discover this fact using two yes or no questions. So 25% of the time, it takes two questions to discover Y's state. If the answer is no, twice in a row, you ask, is the third symbol 1? If yes, you're done, and Y is in state 3. If no, you're done, and Y is in state 4. The one-eighth of the time that Y is in state 3, it takes three questions. And the one-eighth of the time that Y is in state 4, it takes three questions. One-half times 1 plus one-fourth times 2 plus one-eighth times 3 plus one-eighth times three, equals 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.375 plus 0 0.375 equals 1.75. The general formula for the entropy of a system S is the sum overall SI of the negative of the probability of a system state I times the log base 2 of the probability state i. For example, the log base 2 of 1 8 is negative 3. So, negative 1 8 times negative 3 equals 0 0.375 is the contribution of state s base 4 to the total entropy. 1 8 of the time we have to ask three questions. You can't always devise a perfect code for a system. But if you have to tell someone the state of arbitrarily many copies of S in a single message, you can get arbitrarily close to a perfect code. Google arithmetic coding for a simple method. Now you might ask, why not use the code 10 for Y base 4 instead of 000? Wouldn't that let us transmit messages more quickly? But if you use the code 10 for Y base 4, then when someone answers yes to the question, is the first symbol 1, you won't know yet whether the system state is Y base 1, 1, or Y base 4, 10. In fact, if you change the code this way, the whole system falls apart, because if you hear 1, 0, 0, 1, you don't know if it means Y base 4 followed by Y base 2, or Y base 1 followed by Y base 3. The moral is that short words are a conserved resource. The key to creating a good code, a code that transmits messages as compactly as possible, is to reserve short words for things that you'll need to say frequently, and use longer words for things that you won't need to say as often. When you take this art to its limit, the length of the message you need to describe something corresponds exactly, or almost exactly, to its probability. This is the minimum description length or minimum message length formalization of Occam's razor. And so even the labels that we use for words are not quite arbitrary. The sounds that we attach to our concepts can be better or worse, wiser or more foolish, even apart from considerations of common usage. I say all this because the idea that you can X any way you like is a huge obstacle to learning how to X wisely. It's a free country. I have a right to my own opinion. Obstructs the art of finding truth. I can define a word any way I like. Obstructs the art of carving reality at its joints. And even the sensible sounding, the labels we attach to words are arbitrary, 
obstructs awareness of compactness. Prosody, too, for that matter. Tolkien once observed what a beautiful sound the phrase cellar door makes. That is the kind of awareness it takes to use language like Tolkien. The length of words also plays a non-trivial role in the cognitive science of language. Consider the phrases recliner, chair, and furniture. Recliner is a more specific category than chair. Furniture is a more general category than chair. But the vast majority of chairs have a common use. You use the same sort of motor actions to sit down in them. And you sit down in them for the same sort of purpose, to take your weight off your feet while you eat or read or type or rest. Recliners do not depart from this theme. Furniture, on the other hand, includes things like beds and tables which have different uses and call up different motor functions from chairs. In the terminology of cognitive psychology, chair is a basic level category. People have a tendency to talk, and presumably think at the basic level of categorization, to draw the boundary around chairs rather than around the more specific category recliner or the more general category furniture. People are more likely to say, you can sit in that chair than you can sit in that recliner or you can sit in that furniture. And it is no coincidence that the word for chair contains fewer syllables than either recliner or furniture. Basic level categories in general tend to have short names, and nouns with short names tend to refer to basic level categories. Not a perfect rule, of course, but a definite tendency. Frequent use goes along with short words. Short words go along with frequent use. Or as Douglas Hofstadter put it, there's a reason why the English language uses the to mean the, and anti-disestablishmentarianism to mean anti-disestablishmentarianism instead of anti-disestablishmentarianism other way around. The following article contains a large amount of mathematics and may be difficult for the listener to follow. To view the article, please go to lesswrong.com. Mutual Information and Density in Thing Space Suppose you have a system X that can be in any of eight states, which are all equally probable relative to your current state of knowledge, and a system Y that can be in any of four states, all equally probable. The entropy of X, as defined yesterday, is three bits. We'll need to ask three yes or no questions to find out X's exact state. The entropy of Y, as defined yesterday, is two bits. We have to ask two yes or no questions to find out y's exact state. This may seem obvious since 2 cubed equals 8 and 2 squared equals 4, so three questions can distinguish eight possibilities and two questions can distinguish four possibilities. But remember that if the possibilities were not all equally likely, we could use a more clever code to discover y's state using, for example, 1.75 questions on average. In this case, though, X's probability mass is evenly distributed over all its possible states, and likewise Y, so we can't use any clever codes. What is the entropy of the combined system X, Y? You might be tempted to answer, it takes three questions to find out X, and then two questions to find out y, so it takes five questions total to find out the state of x and y. But what if the two variables are entangled so that learning the state of y tells us something about the state of x? In particular, let's suppose that x and y are either both odd or both even. Now if we receive a 3-bit message, ask three questions, and learn that x is in state 5, We know that y is in state 1 or state 3, but not state 2 or state 4. So the single additional question, is y in state 3? Answered no, tells us the entire state of x, y. x equals x base 5, y equals y base 1. And we learn this with a total of four questions. Conversely, if we learn that y is in state 4 using two questions, 
It will take us only an additional two questions to learn whether x is in state 2, 4, 6, or 8. Again, four questions to learn the state of the joint system. The mutual information of two variables is defined as the difference between the entropy of the joint system and the entropy of the independent systems. I, x, semicolon y, equals h times x plus h times y minus h times x, y. Here is one bit of mutual information between the two systems. Learning x tells us one bit of information about y. Cuts down the space of possibilities from 4 to 2, a factor of 2 decrease in the volume. And learning y tells us one bit of information about x. Cuts down the possibility space from 8 to 4. What about when probability mass is not evenly distributed? Yesterday, for example, we discussed the case in which y had the probabilities 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, 1 eighth for its four states. Let us take this to be our probability distribution over y, considered independently. If we saw y without seeing anything else, this is what we'd expect to see. And suppose the variable z has two states, 1 and 2, with probabilities 3 eighths and 5 eighths, respectively. Then, if and only if the joint distribution of y and z is as follows, there is zero mutual information between y and z. z base 1, y base 1, 3 sixteenths. z base 1, y base 2, 3 thirty seconds. z base 1, y base 3, 3 sixty fourths. z base 1, y base 3, 3 sixty fourths. z base 2, y base 1, 5 sixteenths. z base 2, y base 2, 5 thirty seconds. Z base 2, Y base 3, 5 sixty fourths. Z base 2, Y base 3, 5 sixty fourths. This distribution obeys the law probability YZ equals probability Y probability Z. For example, probability Z base 1, Y base 2 equals probability Z base 1, probability Y base 2 equals 3 eighths times one-fourth equals three-thirty seconds. And observe that we can recover the marginal independent probabilities of y and z just by looking at the joint distribution. Probability y base 1 equals total probability of all the different ways y base 1 can happen equals probability z base 1 y base 1 plus probability z base 2 y base 1 equals three-sixteenths plus 5 sixteenths equals 1 half. So just by inspecting the joint distribution, we can determine whether the marginal variables y and z are independent. That is, whether the joint distribution factors into the product of the marginal distributions, whether for all y and z, probability yz equals probability y, probability z. This last is significant because by Bayes' rule, Probability y base i, z base j equals probability y base i, probability z base j. Probability y base i, z base j over probability z base j equals probability y base i. Probability y base i over z base j equals probability y base i. In English, after you learn z base j, your belief about y base i is just what it was before. So when the distribution factorizes, when probability y z equals probability y probability z, this is equivalent to learning about y never tells us anything about z, or vice versa. From which you might suspect correctly that there is no mutual information between y and z. Where there is no mutual information, there is no Bayesian evidence, and vice versa. Suppose that in the distribution yz above, we treated each possible combination of y and z as a separate event, so that the distribution yz would have a total of eight possibilities, with the probabilities shown, and then we calculated the entropy of the distribution yz the same way we would calculate the entropy of any distribution. 3 sixteenths log base 2, 
times 3 sixteenths plus 3 thirty seconds log base 2 times 3 thirty seconds plus 3 sixty fourths log base 2 times 3 sixty fourths plus dot 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 plus 5 sixty fourths log base 2 5 sixty fourths. You would end up with the same total you would get if you separately calculated the entropy of y plus the entropy of z. There is no mutual information between the two variables, so our uncertainty about the joint system is not any less than our uncertainty about the two systems considered separately. I am not showing the calculations, but you are welcome to do them, and I am not showing the proof that this is true in general, but you are welcome to Google on Shannon Entropy and Mutual Information. What if the joint distribution doesn't factorize, for example, Z base 1, Y base 1, 12 64ths, Z base 1, Y base 2, 8 64ths, Z base 1, Y base 3, 1 64th, Z base 1, Y base 4, 3 64ths, Z base 2, Y base 1, 20 64ths, Z base 2, Y base 2, 8 64ths, Z base 2, Y base 3, 7 64ths, Z base 2, Y base 4, 5 64ths. If you add up the joint probabilities to get marginal probabilities, you should find that probability of Y base 1 equals 1 half, probability Z base 1 equals 3 eighths, and so on. The marginal probabilities are the same as before, but the joint probabilities do not always equal the product of the marginal probabilities. For example, the probability, probability Z base 1, Y base 2 equals 8 64ths, where probability Z base 1, probability Y base 2 would equal 3 eighths times 1 fourth equals 6 64ths. That is, the probability of running into Z base 1, Y base 2 together is greater than you'd expect based on the probabilities of running into Z base 1, or Y base 2 separately, which in turn implies probability of Z base 1, Y base 2 is greater than the probability of Z base 1, probability Y base 2. Probability Z base 1, Y base 2 over probability of Y base 2 is greater than probability of Z base 1. Probability Z base 1 over Y base 2 greater than the probability Z base 1. Since there's an unusually high probability for probability Z base 1, Y base 2, defined as a probability higher than the marginal probabilities would indicate by default. It follows that observing Y base 2 is evidence which increases the probability of Z base 1, and by a symmetrical argument, observing Z base 1 must favor Y base 2. As there are at least some values of y that tell us about z, and vice versa, there must be mutual information between the two variables. And so you will find, I am confident, though I haven't actually checked, that calculating the entropy of yz yields less total uncertainty than the sum of the independent entropies of y and z. h times yz equals h times y plus h times z minus i, y semicolon z, with all quantities necessarily non-negative. I digress here to remark that the symmetry of the expression for the mutual information shows that Y must tell us as much about Z on average as Z tells us about Y. I leave it as an exercise to the reader to reconcile this with anything they were taught in logic class about how, if all ravens are black, being allowed to reason raven X black x doesn't mean you're allowed to reason black x is a raven x. How different seem the symmetrical probability flows of the Bayesian from the sharp lurches of logic, even though the latter is just a degenerate case of the former? But, you ask, what has all this to do with the proper use of words? In empty labels and then replace the symbol with the substance, we saw the technique of replacing a word with its definition. The example being given, all, set, mortal, not feathers, bipedal, are mortal. Socrates is a set, mortal, no feathers, bipedal, therefore Socrates is mortal. Why then would you even want to have a word for human? 
why not just say Socrates is a mortal, featherless biped? Because it's helpful to have shorter words for things that you encounter often. If your code for describing single properties is already efficient, then there will not be an advantage to having a special word for a conjunction, like human for mortal, featherless biped, unless things are mortal and featherless and bipedal are found more often than the marginal probabilities would lead you to expect. In efficient codes, word length corresponds to probability, so the code for Z base 1, Y base 2 will be just as long as the code for Z base 1 plus the code for Y base 2, unless probability Z base 1, Y base 2 is greater than the probability of Z base 1, probability Y base 2, in which case the code for the word can be shorter than the codes for its parts. And this, in turn, corresponds exactly to the case where we can infer some of the properties of the thing from seeing its other properties. It must be more likely than the default that featherless bipedal things will also be mortal. Of course, the word human really describes many, many more properties. When you see a human-shaped entity that talks and wears clothes, you can infer whole hosts of biochemical and anatomical and cognitive facts about it. To replace the word human with a description of everything we know about humans would require us to spend an inordinate amount of time talking. But this is true only because a featherless talking biped is far more likely than default to be poisonable by hemlock, or have broad nails, or be overconfident. Having a word for a thing rather than just listing its properties is a more compact code precisely in those cases where we can infer some of those properties from the other properties, with the exception perhaps of very primitive words like red that we would use to send an entirely uncompressed description of our sensory experiences. But by the time you encounter a bug or even a rock, you're dealing with non-simple property collections far above the primitive level. So having a word, Wigan, for green-eyed, black-haired people is more useful than just saying green-eyed, black-haired person, precisely when, one, green-eyed people are more likely than average to be black-haired, and vice versa, meaning that we can probabilistically infer green eyes from black hair, or vice versa, or, two, Wiggins share other properties that can be inferred at greater than default probability. In this case, we have to separately observe the green eyes and black hair. But then, after observing both these properties independently, we can probabilistically infer other properties, like a taste for ketchup. One may even consider the act of defining a word as a promise to this effect. Telling someone, I define the word Wigan to mean a person with green eyes and black hair, by Grishian implication, asserts that the word Wigan will somehow help you make inferences shorten your messages. If green eyes and black hair have no greater than default probability to be found together, nor does any other property occur at greater than default probability along with them, then the word Wigan is a lie. The word claims that certain people are worth distinguishing as a group, but they're not. In this case, the word Wigan does not help describe reality more compactly. It is not defined by someone sending the shortest message. It has no role in the simplest explanation. Equivalently, the word Wigan will be of no help to you in doing any Bayesian inference. Even if you do not call the word a lie, it is surely an error. And the way to carve reality at its joints is to draw your boundaries around concentrations of unusually high probability density in thing space. Super exponential concept space and simple words. Thing space, you might think, is a rather huge space, much larger than reality, for where reality only contains things that actually exist, thing space contains everything that could exist. Actually, the way I defined thing space to have dimensions for every possible attribute, including correlated attributes like density and volume and mass, thing space may be too poorly defined to have anything you could call a size, but it's important to be able to visualize thing space anyway. 
Surely no one can really understand a flock of sparrows if all they see is a cloud of flapping, cawing things rather than a cluster of points in thing space. But as vast as thing space may be, it doesn't hold a candle to the size of concept space. Concept in machine learning means a rule that includes or excludes examples. If you see the data 2 plus 3 minus 14 plus 23 minus 8 plus 9 minus, then you might guess that the concept was even numbers. There is a rather large literature, as one might expect, on how to learn concepts from data, given random examples, given chosen examples, given possible errors in classification, and most importantly, given different spaces of possible rules. Suppose, for example, that we want to learn the concept good days on which to play tennis. The possible attributes of days are sky, sunny, cloudy, rainy, air temp, warm, cold, humidity, normal, high, wind, strong, weak. We're then presented with the following data where plus indicates a positive example of the concept and minus indicates a negative classification. Plus, sky, sunny, air temp, warm, humidity, high, wind, strong. Minus, sky, rainy, air temp, cold, humidity, high, wind, strong. Plus, sky, sunny, air temp, warm, humidity, high, wind, weak. What should an algorithm infer from this? A machine learner might represent one concept that fits this data as follows. Sky, question mark, air temp, warm, humidity, high, wind, question mark. In this format, to determine whether this concept accepts or rejects an example, we compare element by element. Question mark accepts anything but a specific value accepts only that specific value. So the concept above will accept only days with air temp equals warm and humidity equals high, but the sky and the wind can take on any value. That fits both the negative and the positive classifications in the data so far, though it isn't the only concept that does so. We can also simplify the above concept representation to set question mark, warm, high, question mark. Without going into details, the classic algorithm would be maintain the set of the most general hypotheses that fit the data, those that positively classify as many examples as possible while still fitting the facts. Maintain another set of the most specific hypotheses that fit the data, those that negatively classify as many examples as possible while still fitting the facts. Each time we see a new negative example, we strengthen all the most general hypotheses as little as possible, so that the new set is again as general as possible while fitting the facts. Each time we see a new positive example, we relax all the most specific hypotheses as little as possible, so that the new set is again as specific as possible while fitting the facts. We continue until we have only a single hypothesis left. This will be the answer if the target concept was in our hypothesis space at all. In the case above, the set of most general hypotheses would be question mark, warm, question mark, question mark, and sunny, question mark, question mark, question mark, while the set of the most specific hypotheses is the single member sunny, warm, high, question mark. Any other concept you can find that fits the data will be strictly more specific than the one of the most general hypotheses, and strictly more general than the most specific hypothesis. For more on this, I recommend Tom Mitchell's Machine Learning, from which this example was adapted. Now, you may notice that the format above cannot represent all possible concepts. For example, play tennis when the sky is sunny or the air is warm. That fits the data, but in the concept representation defined above, 
There's no quadruplet of values that describes the rule. Clearly, our machine learner is not very general. Why not allow it to represent all possible concepts so that it can learn with the greatest possible flexibility? Days are composed of these four variables. One variable with three values and three variables with two values. So there are 3 times 2 times 2 times 2 equals 24 possible days that we could encounter. The format given for representing concepts allows us to require any of these values for a variable or leave the variable open. So there are 4 times 3 times 3 times 3 equals 108 concepts in that representation. For the most general, most specific algorithm to work, we need to start with the most specific hypothesis. No example is ever positively classified. If we add that, it makes a total of 109 concepts. Is it suspicious that there are more possible concepts than possible days? Surely not. After all, a concept can be viewed as a collection of days. A concept can be viewed as the set of days that it classifies positively or isomorphically, the set of days that it classifies negatively. So the space of all possible concepts that classify days is the set of all possible sets of days whose size is 2 to the 24th, which equals 16,777,216. This complete space includes all the concepts we have discussed so far, but it also includes concepts like positively classify only the examples sunny, warm, high, strong, and sunny, warm, high, weak, and rejects everything else. Or negatively classify only the examples rainy, cold, high, strong, and accept everything else. It includes concepts with no compact representation, just a flat list of what is and isn't allowed. That's the problem with trying to build a fully general inductive learner. They can't learn concepts until they've seen every possible example in the instance space. If we add on more attributes to days, like the water temperature or the forecast for tomorrow, then the number of possible days will grow exponentially in the number of attributes. But this isn't a problem with our restricted concept space, because you can narrow down a large space using a logarithmic number of examples. Let's say we add the water, warm, cold, attribute to days, which will make for 48 possible days and 325 possible concepts. Let's say that each day we see is, usually, classified positive by around half of the currently plausible concepts, and classified negative by the other half. Then, when we learn the actual classification of the example, it will cut the space of compatible concepts in half. So it might only take nine examples, 2 to the ninth equals 512, to narrow 325 possible concepts down to one. Even if days had 40 binary attributes, it should still only take a manageable amount of data to narrow down the possible concepts to one. 64 examples, if each example is classified positive by half the remaining concepts. Assuming, of course, that the actual rule is one we can represent at all. If you want to think of all the possibilities, well, good luck with that. The space of all possible concepts grows super exponentially in the number of attributes. By the time you're talking about data with 40 binary attributes, the number of possible examples is past a trillion. But the number of possible concepts is past 2 to the trillionth power. To narrow down that super exponential concept space, you'd have to see over a trillion examples before you could say what was in and what was out. You'd have to see every possible example, in fact. That's with 40 binary attributes, mind you, 40 bits or 5 bytes to be classified simply yes or no. 
40 bits implies 2 raised to the 40 possible examples and 2 raised to the 40 times 2 raised to the 40 possible concepts that classify those examples as positive or negative. So here in the real world where objects take more than 5 bytes to describe and a trillion examples are not available and there is noise in the training data, we only even think about highly regular concepts. A human mind or the whole observable universe is not nearly large enough to consider all the other hypotheses. From this perspective, learning doesn't just rely on inductive bias. It is nearly all inductive bias. When you compare the number of concepts ruled out a priori to those ruled out by mere evidence. But what has this, you inquire, to do with the proper use of words? It's the whole reason that words have intentions as well as extensions. In yesterday's post, I concluded, the way to carve reality at its joints is to draw boundaries around concentrations of unusually high probability density. I deliberately left out a key qualification in that slightly edited statement because I couldn't explain it until today. A better statement would be, the way to carve reality at its joints is to draw simple boundaries around concentrations of unusually high probability density in thing space. Otherwise, you would just gerrymander thing space. You would create really odd, non-contiguous boundaries that collected the observed examples, examples that couldn't be described in any shorter message than your observations themselves and say, this is what I've seen before and what I expect to see more of in the future. In the real world, nothing above the level of molecules repeats itself exactly. Socrates is shaped a lot like all those other humans who were vulnerable to hemlock, but he isn't shaped exactly like them. So your guess that Socrates is a human relies on drawing simple boundaries around the human cluster and thing space, rather than things shaped exactly like set 5 megabyte shape specification 1 and with set lots of other characteristics, or exactly like set 5 megabyte shape specification 2 and set lots of other characteristics, are human. If you don't draw simple boundaries around your experiences, you can't do inference with them. So you try to describe art with intentional definitions like that which is intended to inspire any complex emotion for the sake of inspiring it rather than just pointing at a long list of things that are, or aren't, art. In fact, the above statement about how to carve reality at its joints is a bit chicken and eggish. You can't assess the density of actual observations until you've already done at least a little carving, and the probability distribution comes from drawing the boundaries, not the other way around. If you already had the probability distribution, you'd have everything necessary for inference. So why would you bother drawing boundaries? And this suggests another, yes, yet another, reason to be suspicious of the claim that you can define a word any way you like. When you consider the super exponential size of concept space, it becomes clear that singling out one particular concept for consideration is an act of no small audacity not just for us, but for any mind of bounded computing power. Presenting us with the word Wigan, defined as a black-haired, green-eyed person, without some reason for raising this particular concept to the level of our deliberate attention, is rather like a detective saying, well, I haven't the slightest shred of support one way or the other for who could have murdered those orphans. Not even an intuition, mind you. But have we considered John Q. Wiffelheim of 1234 Norco Road as a suspect? Conditional Independence and Naive Bays Sorry to break the flow of the audiobook here, but this next chapter is very math-heavy and is much better followed when read instead of listened to. It's chapter 177 and can be found on page 786 of the ebook. To save your ears and listening sanity, we'll skip ahead now to chapter 178.
words as metal paintbrush handles. We should be done with the mathy posts, I think, at least for now. But forgive me if ironically I end up resorting to rationality quotes for a day or two. I'm currently at the AGI 2008 conference, which, as of the first session, is not nearly so bad as I feared. Suppose I tell you, it's the strangest thing. The lamps in this hotel have triangular light bulbs. You may or may not have visualized it. If you haven't done it yet, do so now. What in your mind's eye does a triangular light bulb look like? In your mind's eye, did the glass have sharp edges or smooth? When the phrase triangular light bulb first crossed my mind, no, the hotel doesn't have them, then as best as my introspection could determine, I first saw a pyramidal light bulb with sharp edges. Then, almost immediately, the edges were smoothed, and then my mind generated a loop of fluorescent bulb in the shape of a smooth triangle as an alternative. As far as I can tell, no deliberative verbal thoughts were involved, just wordless reflex flinch away from the imaginary mental vision of sharp glass, which design problem was solved before I could even think in words. Believe it or not, for some decades, there was a serious debate about whether people really had mental images in their mind, an actual picture of a chair somewhere, or if people just naively thought they had mental images, having been misled by introspection a very bad forbidden activity, while actually just having a little chair label like LISP token active in their brain. I'm trying hard not to say anything like, how spectacularly silly, because there is always the hindsight effect to consider. But, how spectacularly silly. This academic paradigm, I think, was mostly a deranged legacy of behaviorism, which denied the existence of thoughts in humans and sought to explain all human phenomena as reflex, including speech. Behaviorism probably deserves its own post at some point, as it was a perversion of rationalism, but this is not that post. You call it silly, you inquire, but how do you know that your brain represents visual images? Is it merely that you can close your eyes and see them? This question used to be harder to answer, back in the day of the controversy. If you wanted to prove the existence of mental imagery scientifically rather than just by introspection, you had to infer the existence of mental imagery from experiments, like, for example, show subjects two objects and ask them if one can be rotated into correspondence with the other. The response time is linearly proportional to the angle of rotation required. This is easy to explain if you are actually visualizing the image and continuously rotating it at a constant speed, but hard to explain if you are just checking propositional features of the image. Today we can actually neuroimage the little pictures in the visual cortex. So, yes, your brain really does represent a detailed image of what it sees or imagines. See Stephen Coslin's Image and Brain, The Resolution of the Imagery Debate. Part of the reason people get in trouble with words is that they do not realize how much complexity lurks behind words. Can you visualize a green dog? Can you visualize a cheese apple? Apple isn't just a sequence of two syllables or five letters. That's a shadow. That's the tip of the tiger's tail. Words, or rather the concepts behind them, are paintbrushes. You can use them to draw images in your own mind. Literally draw if you employ concepts to make a picture in your visual cortex. And by the use of shared labels, you can reach into someone else's mind and grasp their paintbrushes to draw pictures in their minds. Sketch a little green dog in their visual cortex. But don't think that because you send syllables through the air or letters through the internet, it is the syllables or the letters that draw pictures in the visual cortex. That takes some complex instructions that wouldn't fit in the sequence of letters. Apple is five bytes, and drawing a picture of an apple from scratch would take more data than that. Apple is merely the tag attached to the true and wordless apple 
concept, which can paint a picture in your visual cortex, or collide with cheese, or recognize an apple when you see one, or taste its archetype in apple pie, maybe even send out the motor behavior for eating an apple. And it's not as simple as just calling up a picture from memory. Or how would you be able to visualize combinations like a triangular light bulb, imposing triangleness on light bulbs, keeping the essence of both, even if you've never seen such a thing in your life? Don't make the mistake the behaviorists made. There's far more to speech than sound and air. The labels are just pointers. Look in memory area 1,387,540. Sooner or later, when you're handed a pointer, it comes time to dereference it and actually look in memory area 1,387,540. What does a word point to? Variable Question Fallacies Albert, every time I've listened to a tree fall, it made a sound, so I'll guess that other trees falling also make sounds. I don't believe the world changes around when I'm not looking. Barry. Wait a minute. If no one hears it, how can it be a sound? While writing the dialogue of Albert and Barry in their dispute over whether a falling tree in a deserted forest makes a sound, I sometimes found myself losing empathy with my characters. I would start to lose the gut feel of why anyone would ever argue like that, even though I'd seen it happen many times. On these occasions, I would repeat to myself, either the falling tree makes a sound or it does not, to restore my borrowed sense of indignation. P or not P is not always a reliable heuristic if you substitute arbitrary English sentences for P. This sentence is false, cannot be consistently viewed as true or false. And then there's the old classic, have you stopped beating your wife? Now, if you are a mathematician and one who believes in classical rather than intuitionistic logic, there are ways to continue insisting that P or not P is a theorem. For example, saying that this sentence is false is not a sentence. But such resolutions are subtle, which suffices to demonstrate a need for subtlety. You cannot just bowl ahead on every occasion with Either it does or it doesn't. So, does the falling tree make a sound or not? Or, surely 2 plus 2 equals x, or does it not? Well, maybe. If it's really the same x, the same 2, and the same plus, and equals. If x evaluates to 5 on some occasions and 4 on another, your indignation may be misplaced. To even begin claiming that p or not P, ought to be a necessary truth, the symbol P must stand for exactly the same thing in both halves of the dilemma. Either the fall makes a sound or not. But if Albert sound is not the same as Barry sound, there is nothing paradoxical about the tree making an Albert sound, but not a Barry sound. The Idiom is something I picked up in my C++ days for avoiding namespace collisions. If you've got two different packages that define a class sound, you can write package 1. 37 Ways That Words Can Be Wrong Some reader is bound to declare that a better title for this essay would be 37 Ways That You Can Use Words Unwisely or 37 ways that suboptimal use of categories can have negative side effects on your cognition. But one of the primary lessons of this gigantic list is that saying, there's no way my choice of X can be wrong, is nearly always an error in practice, whatever the theory. You can always be wrong. Even when it's theoretically impossible to be wrong, you can still be wrong. There's never a get-out-of-jail-free card for anything you do. That's life. Besides, I can define the word wrong to mean anything I like. It's not like a word can be wrong. Personally, I think it quite justified to use the word wrong when, one, a word fails to connect to reality in the first place. Is Socrates a framster? Yes or no? The parable of the dagger.
too. Your argument, if it worked, could coerce reality to go a different way by choosing a different word definition. Socrates is a human, and humans by definition are mortal. So if you defined humans to not be mortal, would Socrates live forever? The Parable of Hemlock. You try to establish any sort of empirical proposition as being true by definition. Socrates is a human, and humans, by definition, are mortal. So it is a logical truth if we empirically predict that Socrates should keel over if he drinks hemlock? It seems like there are logically possible non-self-contradictory worlds where Socrates doesn't keel over, where he's immune to hemlock by a quirk of biochemistry, say. Logical truths are true in all possible worlds, and so never tell you which possible world you live in. And anything you can establish, by definition, is a logical truth. The Parable of Hemlock. 4. You unconsciously slap the conventional label on something without actually using the verbal definition you just gave. You know perfectly well that Bob is human even though by your definition you can never call Bob human without first observing him to be mortal. The Parable of Hemlock. 5. The act of labeling something with a word disguises a challengeable inductive inference you are making. If the last 11 egg-shaped objects drawn have been blue and the last 8 cubes drawn have been red, it is a matter of induction to say this rule will hold in the future. But if you call the blue eggs blegs and the red cubes rubes, you may reach into the barrel, feel an egg shape, and think, oh, a bleg. Words as hidden inferences. 6. You try to define a word using words, in turn defined with ever more abstract words, without being able to point to an example. What is red? Red is a color. What's a color? It's a property of a thing. What's a thing? What's a property? It never occurs to you to point to a stop sign and an apple. Extensions and intentions. 7. The extension doesn't match the intention. We aren't consciously aware of our identification of a red light in the sky as Mars, which will probably happen regardless of your attempt to define Mars as the god of war. Extensions and intentions. 8. Your verbal definition doesn't capture more than a tiny fraction of the category's shared characteristics, but you try to reason as if it does. When the philosophers of Plato's Academy claimed that the best definition of a human was a featherless biped, Diogenes the Cynic is said to have exhibited a plucked chicken and declared, Here is Plato's man. The Platonists promptly changed their definition to a featherless biped with broad nails. Similarity clusters. 9. You try to treat category membership as all or nothing, ignoring the existence of more and less typical subclusters. Ducks and penguins are less typical birds than robins and pigeons. Interestingly, a between-groups experiment showed that subjects thought a disease was more likely to spread from robins to ducks on an island than from ducks to robins. Typicality and asymmetrical similarity. 10. A verbal definition works well enough in practice to point out the intended cluster of similar things, but you nitpick exceptions. Not every human has 10 fingers, or wears clothes, or uses language. But if you look for an empirical cluster of things which share these characteristics, you'll get enough information that the occasional nine-fingered human won't fool you. The cluster structure of thing space. 11. You ask whether something is or is not a category member, but can't name the question you really want answered. What is a man? Is Barney the baby boy a man? The correct answer may depend considerably on whether the query you really want answered is, would Hemlock be a good thing to feed Barney? Or, will Barney make a good husband? Disguised queries. 12. You treat intuitively perceived hierarchical categories like the only correct way to parse the world, without realizing that other forms of statistical inference are possible even though your brain doesn't use them. It's much easier for a human to notice whether an object is a bleg 
or rube than for a human to notice that red objects never glow in the dark, but red furred objects have all the other characteristics of blegs. Other statistical algorithms work differently. Neural categories. 13. You talk about categories as if they are manna falling from the platonic realm rather than inferences implemented in a real brain. The ancient philosopher said, Socrates is a man, not my brain perceptually classifies Socrates as a match against the human concept. How an algorithm feels from inside. 14. You argue about a category membership even after screening off all questions that could possibly depend on a category-based inference. After you observe that an object is blue, egg-shaped, furred, flexible, opaque, luminescent, and palladium-containing, what's left to ask by arguing, is it a bleg? But if your brain's categorizing neural network contains a metaphorical central unit corresponding to the inference of blegness, it may still feel like there's a leftover question. How an algorithm feels from inside. 15. You allow an argument to slide into being about definitions, even though it isn't what you originally wanted to argue about. If before a dispute started about whether a tree falling in a deserted forest makes a sound, you asked the two soon-to-be arguers whether they thought a sound should be defined as acoustic vibrations or auditory experiences, they'd probably tell you to flip a coin. Only after the argument starts does the definition of a word become politically charged. Disputing Definitions 16. You think a word has a meaning as a property of the word itself, rather than there being a label that your brain associates to a particular concept. When someone shouts, yikes, a tiger, evolution would not favor an organism that thinks, hmm, I have just heard the syllables tie and grr, which my fellow tribe members associate with their internal analogs of my own tiger concept in which, ah, crunch, crunch, go. So the brain takes a shortcut, and it seems that the meaning of tigerness is a property of the label itself. People argue about the correct meaning of a label like sound. Feel the meaning. 17. You argue over the meanings of a word, even after all sides understand perfectly well what the other sides are trying to say. The human ability to associate labels to concepts is a tool for communication. When people want to communicate, we're hard to stop. If we have no common language, we'll draw pictures in sand. When you each understand what is in the other's mind, you are done. The argument from common usage. 18. You pull out a dictionary in the middle of an empirical or moral argument. Dictionary editors are historians of usage, not legislators of language. If the common definition contains a problem, if Mars is defined as the god of war, or a dolphin is defined as a kind of fish, or Negroes are defined as a separate category for humans, the dictionary will reflect the standard mistake. The argument from common usage. 19. You pull out a dictionary in the middle of any argument ever. Seriously, what the heck makes you think that dictionary editors are an authority on whether atheism is a religion or whatever? If you have any substantive issue whatsoever at stake, do you really think dictionary editors have access to ultimate wisdom that settles the argument? The argument from common usage. 20. You defy common usage without a reason, making it gratuitously hard for others to understand you. Fast stand-up plutonium, with bagels, without handle. The argument from common usage. 21. You use complex renamings to create the illusion of inference. Is a human defined as a mortal featherless biped? Then write, all mortal featherless bipeds are mortal. Socrates is a mortal featherless biped, therefore Socrates is mortal. Looks less impressive that way, doesn't it? Empty labels. 22. You get into arguments that you could avoid if you just didn't use the word. 
If Albert and Barry weren't allowed to use the word sound, then Albert would have to say, a tree falling in a deserted forest generates acoustic vibrations. And Barry will say, a tree falling in a deserted forest generates no auditory experiences. When a word poses a problem, the simplest solution is to eliminate the word and its synonyms. Taboo your words. 23. The existence of a neat little word prevents you from seeing the details of the thing you're trying to think about. What actually goes on in schools once you stop calling it education? What's a degree once you stop calling it a degree? If a coin lands heads, what's its radial orientation? What is truth if you can't say accurate or correct or represent or reflect, or semantic, or believe, or knowledge, or map, or real, or any other simple term. Replace the symbol with the substance. 24. You have only one word, but there are two or more different things in reality, so that all the facts about them get dumped into a single, undifferentiated mental bucket. It's part of a detective's ordinary work to observe that Carol wore red last night or that she has black hair, and it's part of a detective's ordinary work to wonder if maybe Carol dyes her hair. But it takes a subtler detective to wonder if there are two Carols, so that the Carol who wore red is not the same as the Carol who had black hair. Fallacies of Compression 25. You see patterns where none exist, harvesting other characteristics from your definitions even when there is no similarity along that dimension. In Japan, it is thought that people of blood type A are earnest and creative. Blood type Bs are wild and cheerful. Blood type Os are agreeable and sociable. And blood type ABs are cool and controlled. Categorizing has consequences. 26. You try to sneak in the connotations of a word by arguing from a definition that doesn't include the connotations. A Wigan is defined in the dictionary as a person with green eyes and black hair. The word Wigan also carries the connotation of someone who commits crimes and launches cute baby squirrels. But that part isn't in the dictionary. So you point to someone and say, green eyes, black hair, see, told you he's a Wigan. Watch, next he's going to steal the silverware. Sneaking in connotations. 27. You claim X by definition is a Y. On such occasions, you're almost certainly trying to sneak in a connotation of why that wasn't in your given definition. You define human as a featherless biped and point to Socrates and say, no feathers, two legs, he must be human. But what you really care about is something else, like mortality. If what was in dispute was Socrates' number of legs, the other fellow would just reply, what do you mean Socrates has got two legs? That's what we're arguing about in the first place. Arguing by definition. 28. You claim P's by definition are Q's. If you see Socrates out in the field with some biologists, gathering herbs that might confer resistance to hemlock, there's no point in arguing men by definition are mortal. The main time you feel the need to tighten the vice by insisting that something is true by definition, is when there's other information that calls the default inference into doubt. Arguing by definition. 29. You try to establish membership in an empirical cluster by definition. You wouldn't feel the need to say Hinduism, by definition, is a religion. Because, well, of course Hinduism is a religion. It's not just a religion by definition. It's like an actual religion. Atheism does not resemble the central members of the religion cluster, so if it wasn't for the fact that atheism is a religion by definition, you might go around thinking that atheism wasn't a religion. That's why you've got to crush all opposition by pointing out that atheism is a religion is true by definition, because it isn't true any other way. Arguing by definition. 30. Your definition draws a boundary around things that don't really belong together. You can claim, if you like, that you are defining the word fish to refer to salmon, guppies, sharks, dolphins, and trout 
but not jellyfish or algae. You can claim, if you like, that this is merely a list, and there is no way a list can be wrong. Or you can stop playing games and admit that you made a mistake and that dolphins don't belong on the fish list. Where to draw the boundary? 31. You use a short word for something that you won't need to describe often, or a long word for something you'll need to describe often. This can result in inefficient thinking or even misapplications of Occam's razor if your mind thinks that short sentences sound simpler. Which sounds more plausible? God did a miracle? Or a supernatural universe-creating entity temporarily suspended the laws of physics? Entropy and short codes. 32. You draw your boundary around a volume of space where there is no greater than usual density, meaning that the associated word does not correspond to any performable Bayesian inferences. Since green-eyed people are not more likely to have black hair, or vice versa, and they don't share any other characteristics in common, why have a word for Wigan? Mutual information and density in thing space. 33. You draw an unsimple boundary without any reason to do so. The act of defining a word to refer to all humans, except black people, seems kind of suspicious. If you don't present reasons to draw that particular boundary, trying to create an arbitrary word in that location is like a detective saying, well, I haven't the slightest shred of support one way or the other for who could have murdered those orphans. But if we consider John Q. Wiffelheim as a suspect? Super exponential concept space and simple words. 34. You use categorization to make inferences about properties that don't have the appropriate empirical structure, namely, conditional independence given knowledge of the class to be well approximated by naive Bayes. No way am I trying to summarize this one. Just read the essay, Conditional Independence and Naive Bayes. 35. You think that words are like tiny little lisp symbols in your mind, rather than words being labels that act as handles to direct complex mental paintbrushes that can paint detailed pictures in your sensory workspace. Visualize a triangular light bulb. What did you see? Words as mental paintbrush handles. 36. You use a word that has different meanings in different places, as though it meant the same thing on each occasion, possibly creating the illusion of something protean and shifting. Martin told Bob the building was on his left. But left is a function word that evaluates with a speaker-dependent variable grabbed from the surrounding context. Whose left is meant? Bob's or Martin's? variable question fallacies. 37. You think that definitions can't be wrong or that I can define a word any way I like. This kind of attitude teaches you to indignantly defend your past actions instead of paying attention to their consequences or fessing up to your mistakes. 37 ways that suboptimal use of categories can have negative side effects on your cognition. Everything you do in the mind has an effect, and your brain races ahead unconsciously without your supervision. Saying, words are arbitrary, I can define a word any way I like, makes around as much sense as driving a car over thin ice with the accelerator floored and saying, looking at this steering wheel, I can't see why one radial angle is special, so I can turn the steering wheel any way I like. If you're trying to go anywhere, or even just trying to survive, you had better start paying attention to the three or six dozen optimality criteria that control how you use words, definitions, categories, classes, boundaries, labels, and concepts.